Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this Parliament, that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants, the advancement of thy glory, and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Mr Clark. Pursuant to Standing Order 164, a letter is tabled from the Leader of the Government of the Senate relating to the Order of the Senate of 10 September 1991 requiring the tabling of a tape recording. The Leader of the Opposition, Senator Hill. Uh, Mr President, uh, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the document just tabled. Is leave granted? There's no objection. Leave is granted. Senator I move that the, that the Senate Chamber 1 notes the refusal of the Government to comply with the direction contained in the Senate's resolution of Tuesday 10 December to lay on the table of the Senate the tape recording of the discussions held on 4 September 1991 between the Minister for the Arts, Sport and the Environment, Tourism and Territories and representatives of conservationist groups. Two further notes that this refusal to lay the tape on the table is not based on any claim of executive privilege. Three, is of the opinion that, subject only to reasonable claims of executive privilege, both Houses of Parliament are fully entitled to scrutinise and demand accountability for all aspects of executive behaviour. Four, notes with great concern the Government's apparent belief that, that it is not accountable to the people of Australia through the Parliament. Five, accordingly censures the Government for its unjustified failure to comply with the Senate resolution of 10 September. And six calls upon the government to comply with the resolution of the Senate this day. Uh, Mr. President, uh, for the benefit of honourable senators who, who wouldn't have notice of the details of the letter uh, of the leader of the government in the Senate, Senator Button, which was given to the clerk yesterday in reply to the order of the Senate, I will read that letter. He writes, dear Mr. Evans, I refer to your letter of the 10th of September regarding the order agreed to by the Senate yesterday relating to the tape recording of discussions held between the Minister for the Arts, Sport and Environment, Tourism and Territories and representatives of the conservationist groups. I have noted the text of the order and advised the Senate that the government will not be tabling the tape according to which it refers. I would point out, however, that the Prime Minister today read to the House of Representatives a transcript of the relevant part of the recording, a copy of which is attached. Mr President, attached to that letter is a quote as follows, which claims to be uh, a transcript extract from Peak Conservation Organisation meeting dated 4 September 1991. In quotes, I've really outlined the sort of structure of the EPA and where that's going. I'll just go into the intergovernmental agreement. The first draft, let me tell you about the intergovernmental agreement, as you know, has, basic, has emerged basically from the Prime Minister's initiative with the states and is really crass politics at the lowest common denominator. It's all about mainly the people who are involved in it. Um, it are not the environmental ministers or their departments, the premiers, and the bottom line for them all is the bucks, the big dollars. They would sell their mothers for a few bucks, and so the bottom line of much of this negotiation is what we, if they get what they want on transport and housing in terms of untied grants and social services security, they would give us anything. If they don't, they're going to make our lives if they don't, they're going to make our lives a misery, and that's not very satisfactory, but that's the harsh reality of it. That, uh, Mr President, is the government's answer to the order of the Senate that it lay before the Senate uh, a certain tape recording. In other words, the government refuses, and it refuses without giving any reason. No claim of Crown privilege, no claim that it's a matter of national security or it's cabinet in confidence or it's commercial in confidence or whatever, just a blatant refusal to comply with the order of the Senate. Mr President, uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised if, uh, if certain ministers of the government with a reasonably long memory pricked their ears when I read uh, uh, the, uh, the motion uh, that I've put before the Senate today. 
and they'd prick their ears because they would realise that it's very much in the same terms as a motion moved by Senator Evans as Shadow Attorney General in 1982. At that time, apparently, Senator Evans believed that the executive was responsible to the parliament and that the Senate was fully entitled to scrutinise and demand accountability for all aspects of executive behaviour. One might wonder, Mr President, what's changed. Of course, what's changed is simply power. The government is now in power, Senator Evans is now in power, and his attitude to the responsibility of the executive to the parliament has changed. It is not politically expedient for the government to provide this tape because it could be politically embarrassing, and so they simply disregard the order of the Senate. That's unsatisfactory, Mr President, and this Senate, in my submission, has no alternative, therefore, but to move this censure motion. It's an important issue, Mr. Mr. President. There's no doubt about that, and I'll get to it in a moment. But it's also important the question about which the tapes relate, the question of new federalism. There is a feeling by some perhaps the issue at stake, other than the issue of the responsibility of the executive of the parliament, is not of the same consequence as some of the previous orders that have been made over the years. Mr. President, that's not so. It's not so because we all know in a situation where there are about one million Australians unemployed that this country requires major structural reform. One area of structural reform, which everyone accepted, is in the area of the relationship between the, the Commonwealth and the state, so that there can be a more efficient administration in both. It's been promoted by the Prime Minister, and we accept that. If, however, a minister, a senior minister of the Crown, says to conservation groups the Prime Minister is not serious, that the Prime Minister is simply engaging in a political game, that he is simply engaging in crass politics, that is a serious matter because it demonstrates to the people of Australia that this government is not serious about restructuring the relationship between the states and the Commonwealth in the way that it has claimed that it desires to do so. Therefore, the, the determination by Minister Kelly, as she put to these conservation leaders, that the Prime Minister is about crass politics is a very serious, very serious matter. We are entitled to be concerned, Mr President, because we have on the record so many examples where this Prime Minister, despite the fact that there are a million people unemployed in this country, still believes that he has some God-given right to rule and that he is beyond reproach and beyond question. And that should never be allowed to occur. We have had demonstration in recent times of how he cynically regards the Australian people, no better demonstrated by the conspiracy between Mr Keating and Mr Hawke to deceive the Australian people at the last election, lied to the Australian people about their intentions as to who would, who would remain Prime Minister after the election. We are entitled to be concerned, therefore, Mr President. The Australian people are entitled to be concerned because they have had it demonstrated time and time again that this Prime Minister will play whatever political tricks are necessary to remain in government. And here it appears that he is playing another one because Minister Kelly advises senior conservation leaders that this new federalism is simply a game of crass politics. That's the way that it was interpreted by a number of the major conservation leaders present at the meeting. And there is one simple way in which the matter can be resolved forever, and that is if the government was prepared to do the right thing, put the tape on the table and let the people of Australia have the opportunity to peruse it. And that's all that's being asked. And one must wonder again and again, Mr President, why the government won't comply with that requirement. What is unreasonable about the people of Australia being entitled to hear the tape and determine who's telling the truth, the leaders of the conservation movement who have been defamed by Minister Kelly or whether it's Minister Kelly. Why is she continuing to refuse to do that and to clarify the matter and to let the people make the judgment? And one can only suspect as to the outcome. But apart from the important question of the merits of the case, Mr President, there is the even more important question of this, uh, this government's decision to blatantly and deliberately undermine the democratic structure by rejecting the request of the Senate uh, to, table this, uh, to table this document. As I said, Mr President, this is an arrogant government which puts itself above the responsibility 
to the people through the parliament. Ministers are not directly elected by the people. It is the parliament that is elected, and the safeguard upon the executive is the right of the parliament uh, to pass orders and for the executive to count to it. Account to it. It's an unquestioned principle of, constitution, of the constitution, Mr Deputy President, which, as I said, Senator Evans was pleased to propound in this place in 1982, but which this government is now going to regard when it suits its political expediency. To this government, it is a nuisance. The parliament itself is a nuisance. It's a distraction. But we will never allow that to be the case. The Senate has passed its order. The order of the Senate must be complied with, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. President. When the executive assumes an authority beyond that of the parliament, that is, those directly elected by the people, a cornerstone of our constitutional democracy is threatened. And that's why the refusal to comply with the order of the Senate is in fact a rarity. You might be interested to know, Mr. Dep Mr. President, that there have been over 20 cases in which such orders have been passed by the Senate. On only two occasions, only two occasions was the order not complied with, and it's something that the government should take into account. Why do governments normally, with only two exceptions since the time of the Constitution, comply with such orders? Because they recognise they owe a responsibility to the Parliament, because they recognise that if they disregard the Parliament, they are undermining a cornerstone of our democracy. Mr. President, there have been a whole range of orders. They've covered all sorts of, uh, all sorts of matters over the years. Uh, they've related to uh, forest products. The first one in 1924, uh, another one in 1931 regarding the Commonwealth Bank, correspondence between the government and the Commonwealth Bank. Another in 1931 regarding the um, correspondence between the Labor Party and the acting Prime Minister. 1931 again correspondence regarding Jarvis Bay. I won't read them all, but the point I want to make is they are a range of different issues covering matters of varying importance. But whether they go to the, to the most vital matter in the national interest or otherwise, the practice of governments has been to accept that the structure of the Constitution will only work if they respect the dignity of the parliament, if they respect the orders of the parliament and duly comply. Only two exceptions, I said, Mr. President. One in 1975 and one in 1982. In 1975, the Senate called before it uh, the departmental officers to answer questions relating to the Kemlani loan affair. Those departmental officers claimed Crown privilege, an impasse developed, and the matter was never, was never resolved. What then followed was the double dissolution and election, and the government was, was defeated. The next, instance, the next instance was in 1982. That was an action brought in the Senate by Senator Evans, as I indicated a moment or two ago. It, related to the, it, it, it was Senator Evans bringing, bringing a case for the production of legal opinions that concerned the bottom of the harbour cases. In the first instance, the government of the day complied with that by tabling a whole series of documents that Senator Evans required. But certain legal opinions it wasn't prepared to do so because it claimed they had Crown privilege. I remind you there's no issue of Crown privilege in what this government has said today, according to Senator Le Button's letter. There's no claim of any justification at all. But in 1982, the government of the day claimed Crown privilege in relation to legal documents, legal opinions, and that's, uh, that's not unusual. Mr President, I thought that you might like to know uh, what Senator Evans said about the responsibility of the, of the uh, government to the parliament in this in in these instance. And I refer to the, the Hansard of 8 September 1982. He said it was important that these documents be tabled to enable the parliament and the community as a whole to form its own view, exactly what we have said today. He went on, the only way that blame can begin to be established and rightly located is by the tabling of all the information, all the relevant documents that will enable an even better judgment to be made of the situation than we have been able to make so far. Again, he continued on the same day in the Senate, he said, 
I believe that access to these documents will enable, if not the whole truth to emerge finally, at least, uh, at least us to get some distance down that particular track. You will be surprised, Mr President, to learn that Senator Evans said, we have chosen the path of moderation and reasonableness. That's in that instance, it was regarded by Senator Evans to be both moderate and reasonable that the Senate should expect those documents in the same way that it's more than moderate and reasonable that the Senate be entitled to this tape in the public interest today. He continued, he repeated it time and time again, occasionally he can be repetitious. He said, in order that we and the public at large can get better, a better Form, can better form a view as to where the blame lies, where the merits lie and where the truth lies in this matter, the documents must be, must be produced. Mr President, exactly the same position exists today. The Senate is entitled to this document in this instance and papers by practice in the, of the Senate have included tapes because it's in the public interest that the public be entitled to learn where the truth lies in this particular, particular instance. And what did Senator Evans do at the end of that process when he was unsuccessful in getting those documents? He moved a censure motion, as I said, in almost the identical terms that the opposition is moving it today. And he was, of course, overtaken in that instance also then by an election and the issue was never, never finally, finally resolved. So, Mr. President, we demand, what we demand today is exactly as Senator Evans demanded in 1982. The Senate made an order two days ago. The government has failed to comply with that order. It's made no claim of executive privilege. Even if it had made a claim of executive privilege, we would, consistent with our long-held view and consistent with the authorities as contained in Hodges, say that it is ultimately for the Senate to decide whether the, whether the, the stand of executive privilege should be upheld or not. But this, as I said, was simply an arrogant refusal of this government to, to comply. The government has tabled part of a transcript which clearly can be read in exactly the way the conservationists have said that it should be read. The letters tabled by Minister Kelly in the House of Representatives yesterday did not contradict that point of view. That was the view of four conservationists that, that Minister Kelly was saying that the Prime Minister was indulging in nothing more than crass politics. We heard it again from the, statesman, the spokesman from Greenpeace this morning, the same interpretation of what Minister Kelly has said. And of course, it wouldn't be surprising if that's what she was saying, because she's supporting Keating, Mr. Keating in the leadership contest. It's in her interest to undermine the position of the Prime Minister. As I said a moment ago, the only way the people of Australia can know for certain is by listening to the tape. If Minister Kelly was innocent, there is one way, one simple way, in which she can demonstrate it. While she refuses, one must suspect one Order. must suspect that she Order. has no faith while she refuses one must suspect that she has no faith in the prime minister's federalism Order. initiative you may have no interest in the prime minister's federalism initiative because senator faulkner i don't know which side you're on in that particular that particular debate the government should cease to put political the government should cease to put political expediency beyond its requirement to comply with an order of the parliament. It should cease to put its political survival beyond that cornerstone of the constitution which is so important. In other words, Mr President, it should comply with the order, stop this nonsense, produce the tape and let the people of Australia make their own decision. Yeah. Senator Calder. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, the uh, Democrats will be supporting uh, this motion and supporting it very strongly. Um, the Mr. President, I, uh, I appreciate I appreciate the interjection from Senator Collins because uh, if he'd been in the chamber the other day, he would know that we rehearsed very adequately the reasons why this was not a private meeting. This indeed was very much a public meeting because it was a meeting between the minister and representatives representatives of peak councils who represent many tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of Australians. 
and it goes also very much to the uh, matter of whether it was a private meeting or not, that here we have the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister negotiating with the, uh, the state governments in relation to uh, the management of the Australian environment, and not the Minister for Environment, a very, very important uh, area of decision-making. And uh, for those reasons, we believe that the public have a right to know that the public interest supervenes over any considerations that this was indeed a private meeting. We are particularly pleased to see that the, uh, the opposition's motion is aimed fairly and squarely at the government, and not in this case at, uh, at uh, Minister Kelly. Um, we accept the, uh, the arguments which uh, uh, Senator Hill has just advanced in relation to, uh, to privilege and uh, the, uh, the clauses in his uh, motion which precede the uh, clause 5, uh, censuring the government for its unjustified failure to comply with the Senate resolution of 10 September. The letter before us, uh, Mr President, uh, from uh, Senator Button is an incredibly, an incredibly arrogant letter. Uh, and I mean, clearly here he's, he's speaking on behalf of the government. He's, he's not just speaking uh, uh, as the leader of the Senate. He's speaking as a, as a very important uh, government representative and saying the government simply refuses an order of the Senate. And I, uh, I uh, repeat the, uh, the um, claim made by Senator Hill a few moments ago that this Senate, this Senate is composed of people directly elected by the people of Australia. We are a representative chamber. We are responsible directly back to the people of Australia. And here we have the, uh, the government, which is not directly elected by the people of Australia, thumbing its nose at the directly elected chamber of the Senate and refusing to release the, uh, the tape recording. Now, if we turn to the, uh, to the words, and uh, Senator Hill has already uh, uh, reflected on these, if we turn to the words of the very partial transcript which has been released by the, um, by the government, the very partial transcript, there are, there are a tiny fragment out of what must have been a much, much longer uh, dialogue between the minister and those peak cons or representatives of those peak conservation bodies. It's quite clear that a, that a partial transcript can't give one a flavour of the, of the whole uh, dialogue which occurred uh, at that meeting. And moreover, it is also quite clear that depending on, upon where the emphasis is put in these words, the words are open to either the interpretation that uh, the state premiers and the state governments were indulging in crass politics, or indeed that the Prime Minister himself was engaging in, in crass politics and that the whole process <clears throat> of new federalism was an exercise in crass politics. As the words say, and as they are uh, punctuated in the partial transcript which we have, um, they are that uh, basically from the Prime Minister is initiative with the state and it is really crass politics, comma. The clear reading of those words, in my view, is that uh, the, uh, the minister there was reflecting on the Prime Minister's moves in this area of new federalism. As uh, senators will know from the uh, debate yesterday, uh, the Democrats are particularly concerned about the substantive issue, the issue of, uh, of the protection of the Australian environment under this pattern of new federalism. And we learnt yesterday, almost certainly from uh, Senator Richardson's remarks, that here we have the government, the government moving into an area of uh, changing the management of the Australian environment and that that movement is being led by the Prime Minister and by the Prime Minister's officers. That Minister Kelly and the Department of Environment have no handle on that process at all. Now, surely, Mr President, that is an issue which is of vital concern to the Australian people. The Australian people have a right to know what is going on, how their environment is to be protected. As I indicated in my speech yesterday, all the recent uh, surveys of, of Australian public opinion indicate a very high level of concern 
by the Australian public uh, for uh, the better protection of the Australian environment. All those surveys indicate that uh, the, uh, the public want the federal government to uh, more comprehensively use its powers, powers which indeed it has used in the past, but it seems uh, from the, uh, the, uh, the draft of the intergovernmental agreement, which we have uh, already, the fourth draft, that the federal government is moving to tie its own hands and to not, uh, not exercise those powers in the ways in which uh, both it and indeed the opposition have in the past. That is a matter of the public interest. That is a matter which should be rightly brought before this, uh, this Senate chamber. That is a matter on which the tape recording of the uh, meeting between Minister Kelly and the peak environment groups uh, is relevant. That is a matter which uh, goes really to the heart of um, the question of whether the, the government has a right to withhold that information from the properly elected Senate. And accordingly, uh, we very strongly support uh, this motion uh, put by the, uh, by the opposition. And uh, as we note in, the, in part six of the resolution calling upon the government to comply with the resolution of the Senate, we would repeat the arrogance, the arrogance of this government in not already complying uh, with the resolution of the Senate, the arrogance of, uh, of Minister Button in, uh, noting, in, in writing that very terse note to the Senate, simply refusing, not providing, as, as the motion before us says, not providing any substantive grounds whatsoever as to why uh, that tape should not be, uh, should not be provided to, to the Senate. And uh, again, as Senator Hill has said, even if those if grounds had been provided, it would be up to the Senate to determine whether those grounds were adequate and, uh, and legal or not, and justifiable or not. But no grounds whatsoever have been provided in this very brief and terse note from, uh, from Minister Button. And uh, accordingly, uh, we have uh, uh, very uh, great pleasure in supporting, supporting this motion from the opposition. Senator Byrne. Mr uh, Deputy President, uh, I support uh, this motion and uh, congratulate Senator Coulter on uh, a most interesting and uh, uh, convincing contribution. I, uh, I must say I have disagreed with Senator Coulter many times in the past and uh, I, uh, I uh, agree totally with what he had to say today. I would like to deal very briefly with some uh, very significant points. Firstly, it must be recognised that what appears to be an inconsequential matter, whether a tape recording uh, uh, says that uh, or reveals that Mrs. Kelly described, I'm sorry, uh, uh, the, the minister, uh, the Honourable Ros Kelly, uh, described uh, Mr. Hawke's cooperative federalism as crass politics or not, uh, that uh, may not be regarded as a terribly serious matter, I suppose, by those people who are accustomed to ministers of this government. Uh, telling deliberate total falsehoods. There's nothing unusual about it. And I suppose some people are saying, well, why are we getting so excited about yet another deliberate lie from a government minister? Uh, I mean, the Prime Minister has admitted to, to lying, so uh, maybe there's not much uh, uh, significance, some people say, in this matter. But there is, because in the government's determination not to allow the truth to emerge, it has determined to confront the Senate to deny the authority of an elected parliament. And this isn't the House of Representatives challenging the Senate. This is the executive government challenging the Senate. The executive government challenging the Senate. And so we have to ask, why is it so significant? Why is Kellygate such, of such massive importance that the government is prepared to challenge the Senate? Now, the, uh, the uh, principle of, of privacy was raised, I think, by Senator Collins in, uh, in a quaint interjection, and it followed the nonsensical speech Senator Richardson made the other day on this topic. There is one vital matter that Senator Richardson and the government have to face up to, and that is the principle of privacy 
which is a very important principle indeed, is totally breached. Is totally breached if a private meeting is held and a party to that private meeting then misrepresents what happened at that meeting to the public. That breaches totally the principle of privacy, and that is what this minister did. She breached the principle of privacy, which she now seeks to hide behind, by telling total, complete untruths about what happened there. And the conservation movement has, uh, the, the conservationists who were there, have, in a united way, revealed the extent order, order, to order, which she order, order, misled order. the public about what happened at that meeting. Now, it wasn't just a question about the crass politics. It was a question about objections. It was on another ground. She breached, and there's been no denial by Mrs Kelly that what they have said now is absolutely right, that she breached the privacy of that meeting by telling untruths about the extent of opposition from the uh, conservation movement to the, to the draft of that uh, proposal. The Prime Minister's proposal. Having breached it, she is now desperately trying to clothe herself with the, with the protection that she herself destroyed. So this nonsense that Senator Richardson has been going on about the sanctity of privacy is absolute and utter bunkum. It's all right, apparently, for the government for one of their ministers to have a meeting in private and then tell lies about the outcome and not, and not be prepared to put up with the other people uh, who were at that meeting saying, no, that is not what happened at all. And so uh, that removes this phony issue of it being a private meeting totally out of the, uh, out of the discussion. What is absolutely central to this particular matter is that when Mr. Hawke, when the Prime Minister uh, agreed to the small section, the 30 seconds out of three hours of transcript to be revealed, it was significant that the other people who were there have not come forward to say, oh, well, my memory must have been wrong. The, the government didn't produce uh, that in the Senate, uh, in the House of Representatives yesterday. People have not resiled, as I understand it, from their position. And uh, if that is so, it underlines the question one must ask about how real, how accurate, how correct that 30 seconds is in conveying what really happened in those three hours of meeting. That extract is capable of being interpreted as total support for what the conservationists are saying. It is capable of being interpreted in lots of ways. It is totally incoherent. If it's an expression of the minister's thinking, then God help the, environmental, uh, uh, the environment in Australia, because it is full of sentences that begin somewhere vague and end somewhere even vaguer. But it is important uh, to note that Robert Ray, Senator Robert Ray, has demonstrated to us very strongly the day before yesterday why there is a huge difference between a transcript and a tape. He was even prepared to accuse me of lying when I inadvertently said someone from the Prime Minister's office had heard a little bit of, uh, of the tape, and, and when, in fact, they had read a bit of the transcript. Now, on our side, we assume those to be uh, uh, the same in terms of substance. There is no difference, theoretically, uh, no difference as far as we are concerned, in a transcript and a tape, because they are matters of substance that are the same. Senator Robert Ray doesn't think so. Accused me of lying by saying a simple thing that he listened to the tape tape instead of the transcript. Oh, now, this clearly oh. indicates, as far as the Labor Party is concerned, there is a huge difference between a tape and a transcript, because transcripts can either be fiddled or a tiny extract, like 30 seconds, can be taken out, which distorts the meaning which would be evident if one uh, listened to the tape as a whole. Now, uh, well, uh, uh, the Senator's interjection, Senator Macdonald's interjection, about something being deleted does raise questions about this Kellygate affair. I mean, to what extent 
are these Nixon type tapes anyway? Why is the government not revealing them? Now, we've already seen that by allowing the transcript to come out, we've seen that there is stuff that is clearly offensive to uh, the state premiers, which clearly undermines, and deliberately so, the Prime Minister's relationships with the states, which is essential if his policy of cooperative federalism is to proceed. Mrs Kelly's uh, uh, discussion uh, uh, about, uh, about the state premiers with the conservationists clearly does nothing to help the Prime Minister's relationship with them on this sensitive issue. It is aimed at undermining the Prime Minister's relationship with the premiers. And you can see that from the response of the state premiers. The Empress strikes back, said Mr Griner. Labor premiers are refusing to uh, give uh, a response to it because they're not going to, uh, to credit it as something worthy of a response. Now, uh, if, uh, if it is not to be revealed, the full tape is not to be revealed, how many other insults, I wonder, are in that tape? I wonder how many expletives have been deleted. I wonder how Nixonian Kellygate really is. And, uh, in the end, I should uh, let uh, the government know that uh, the Nixon tapes eventually did undo Senator Nixon, uh, Mr. Nixon, President Nixon. I wonder uh, how undone Mrs. Kelly will be when this tape eventually emerges. Now, there is no doubt from the tape that uh, Mrs. Kelly's views of Mr Hawke's uh, co uh, cooperative federalism are clearly antagonistic, that uh, no matter how you interpret this comment, uh, and I quote from the, from the transcript, the first draft let me tell you about the intergovernmental agreement, as you know, has emerged basically from the Prime Minister's initiative with the states and it's really crass politics at the lowest common denominator. Full stop. Now, this politics, this situation that has been created, has been created by the Prime Minister. This one which uh, stems, has emerged basically from the Prime Minister's initiative. It's really crass politics. In other words, the system that the Prime Minister has developed, which she now says, oh, I only meant that they would misuse it. This system, even if you take her interpretation of this messy bit of uh, uh, semantics, if you take her uh, interpretation of it, she is saying that the Prime Minister has been foolish enough to create a hopeless situation in which the Premiers can play crass politics at the expense of the environment. And that's if you take her interpretation. And that is undermining the Prime Minister, as uh, Senator Hill says, either way she has set out, and it is now evident, to undermine the Prime Minister uh, the, and the Prime Minister's policy in relation to the environment. And, and by way of conclusion, uh, Mr Deputy President, this impression is reinforced today by the latest Kellygate bit, where a representative of Greenpeace says Mrs Kelly had told meetings he had attended that new federalism contradicted strong environmental policy. She can, I quote, she considers that new federalism and environment protection are contradictory. And he said it is very clear from the meetings he has attended. This has been a consistent pattern of undermining by Mrs Kelly. She has, as Senator Hill says, consistently rejected the Prime Minister. She regards her policies as in conflict with the Prime Minister's. She is part of the campaign to destroy the Prime Minister, and she is using the environment as yet another of the weapons in that campaign to get rid of the Prime Minister and replace him with Mr Keating. Now, quite frankly, she can use in her internal battles what methods she likes. When those methods 
come out into the public arena when they cause concern and, in fact, uh, uh, upset a, a large proportion of the, a large part of the population when they create, date, create doubt in the minds of people what the government's policy really is. Is it the Kelly policy or is it the Hawke policy? Then the parliament has a right to know. The people have a right to know what really happened at that expletive deleted meeting. And uh, it is a disgrace that this government is prepared to protect this minister because of these internal dissensions, because of the, uh, because of the, the need to make certain that the waters remain as unruffled as possible. Because if the Prime Minister did what he should do and sack this minister, there would be repercussions in terms of, uh, of the, uh, uh, the battle for the leadership. There is no basis of principle on which this government is keeping this secret. The government does have something to hide. It must reveal it. The Honourable Minister, Senator Richardson. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Mr Deputy President. I uh, have listened with uh, some interest to the contributions this morning because I've been trying to work out what, uh, what prompts this, uh, this performance. I suspect, having listened to the last couple of, uh, of contributions, that uh, it's not really so difficult to work out. Yesterday there were some significant events. The first, I think, was the House of Representatives refusing a motion of Senator Cheney's to release the tape. So that uh, the uh, House of Representatives took a position directly contrary to, uh, to the Senate. And that's uh, now I simply state a fact. The House of Representatives rejected a resolution to produce the tape. And, uh, that, uh, I'm not trying to kid anybody. That happened. That's on the record. But you don't believe that. Well, I, uh, I feel sorry for you, Senator, but then again, I often have. But if one goes past that, I think there was something. There were two other events, really, that were much more important yesterday than that. Much more important that prompts the opposition into action. The first was question time. And every report of question time suggests that Mr. Hewson, or Dr. Hewson, and Mr. Cheney were uh, very much the losers. They did very poorly. Very poorly. The press gallery sat there and looked at it, but the press gallery did something that the Liberals really couldn't forgive. Really couldn't forgive. What the press gallery did was then ask some questions of Mr Cheney. They asked some questions of Mr Cheney. And the reaction to that suggests that yesterday order. was probably the low point order, of Mr order. Cheney's career. The low point. And all the momentum that the opposition were allegedly building up all disappeared yesterday. They did very badly indeed. So here they are today trying to concoct a crisis. Well, sadly for them, Mr Deputy President, there just isn't one. And uh, no number of speeches can create it. First off, we, uh, we should, uh, I think, deal with legalities. We are not here dealing with a question of constitutional law. Why not? Merely a question. <laughs> you are dumb. Merely, merely a question, Mr. Deputy President, really of constitutional practice, uh, where we have uh, the Senate demanding the release of a tape by uh, a person in another place, and uh, we have the House of Representatives refusing to pass the same resolution. Now, I'd like to quote Mr Deputy President from Erskine and May, and uh, I think the quote, uh, the quote uh, is pretty clear. It says, the leading principle which appears to pervade all the proceedings between the Houses of Parliament is that there shall subsist a perfect equality between them, and that they shall be, in every respect, totally independent one of the other. And here comes the crux of it. Or, or, order. Hence it or, is. Or, or, order. Order. 
the uh, speakers from the opposition were heard in relative silence. Not I, in, in, in order, order in relative silence. Senator Boehm. Senator Boehm, you will come to order, and if you want to be insolent, I will deal with you. The members on my left were heard in relative silence, not in silence, in relative silence. I would ask the same to be the case for the minister. <laughs> Sen Sen President, are you arising on a point of order? Yes, the point of order, Mr Deputy President, relates to the... Uh, the uh, requirement uh, uh, of the chair uh, to deal, as I understood it, impartially with the proceedings of the chamber. Uh, my my uh, point is that you, Mr Deputy President, had to call for order consistently, uh, particularly Senator Faulkner, during my, uh, my speech, uh, that as a result of that, in fact, some order did descend later in the speech, but that for the bulk of the time, I was subjected to, in fact, non-stop interjection, and so I ask you to review uh, uh, the, the comments you just made. I indicated when I spoke that uh, the members on, of the opposition were heard in, uh, with relative silence. I, I, I call the minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. As I was saying. Uh, I was coming to the crux of this quote from Erskine and May. Hence it is that neither House can claim, much less exercise, any authority over a member of the other. And so uh, while uh, the Senate can pass uh, censure motions against the government, can pass demands that Mrs Kelly produce the tape, there is in fact no way that the Senate can enforce that. Um, those resolutions. And so what we are indulging in here is not an issue of constitutional law, not an issue of constitutional practice, but rather, to quote a phrase oft heard in the last few days, an exercise in crass politics, the crassest of politics. Now I'd like to, uh, I'd like to, uh, to quote from the editorial in today's Financial Review. Now, one wouldn't refer to the Financial Review normally as a, as a socialist rag. One, one wouldn't call it a, uh, a, uh, a, a mouthpiece of, uh, of the Labor Party. But it does have, in its editorial, I think uh, some interesting points. And I quote, but by blunting and repelling the opposition's main attack, <coughs> the government has placed itself in a position to turn the attack back and to argue that the opposition has indulged in a trivial and time-wasting pursuit, to concentrate, as the opposition has over the past week, on what has turned out to be a bit of colourful language by one politician is plain silly. Now that, I think, uh, sums up this issue. Uh, Mr. President, I think uh, the uh, citizens of Australia must regard this as one of the great yawns of our time. The great yawns of our time. I am particularly disappointed in, uh, in Senator Coulter's contribution. I'm disappointed in it because uh, Senator Coulter appears to have taken a, uh, a position on whether or not this meeting is private, which runs contrary to almost every person who has attended that meeting or the other meetings of the uh, uh, peak councils during the course of the last four years. As, uh, as the minister who presided over them for, for uh, three years, I can assure Senator Coulter, the Senate, and anyone else who may be listening, if they're unfortunate enough to happen to be doing so, that um, those meetings have always been private. They were structured in that way in the first place. And uh, Mrs Kelly did not make them public. And uh, the difficulty that, uh, that Senator Calder faces, and all opposition senators facing this, is that there is no question, not only that they've been private in the past, but that uh, they remain so. And if we wanted to look for some sources of this, then I think uh, they're not too hard to find. First, I, uh, I quote from Don Henry, the director of the World Wide Fund for Nature. 
where he says that uh, that fund believes that the privacy of peak conservation group meetings should be respected. It has been our understanding in the past that no formal transcript of the meeting has been made, rather that a listing of action points from the meeting is developed. So we have no doubt where the World Wide Fund for Nature stands on the question. Then if one looks at uh, the Australian Council of National Trusts, we have a letter signed by Duncan Marshall of that uh, organisation and of Harry Barber from the Conservation Council of Victoria. The Australian Council of National Trusts and the Conservation Council of Victoria write to support a call for all parties to respect the privacy of peak conservation group meetings. The above groups are participants in peak meetings. These meetings occur regularly and involve discussions with ministers, shadow ministers and other parliamentarians. I'd be, I'd be surprised if even, if even someone like Senator Campbell thought the National Trust were not worthy of support. Then again, uh, he may. And if he has that view, I'm quite happy for him to express it. Quite happy for him to. Oh, he's gone silent. Isn't that a shock and a surprise? Isn't that a shock and a surprise? And of course, a, uh, a, uh, there's further correspondence here from uh, the Australian Conservation Foundation, in which uh, Philip Toyn expresses expresses his strong support for the continuation of those meetings to be conducted on a private and confidential basis. A private and confidential basis. But it doesn't end there. Senator Coulter, you really have placed yourself at odds with the conservation movement on this question. I want to quote from uh, Rosie Crisp, the coordinator of the Queensland Conservation Council, who was, of course, a participant in the order, meeting. Order, Senator who Campbell. Who was, of course, order. a participant in the meeting. Well, obviously, the meeting that was held with the minister and conservationists was a private meeting. Obviously, it was a private meeting. These are regular meetings that are held with the minister, and the discussion is very open and honest and frank, and it is a private discussion. So there isn't simply one or two people saying this. There is a, uh, a whole raft of people saying that it's a private meeting, and as the, the person who convened them for three years, I can assure all honourable senators that was always the case. It was uh, very effectively. I'm glad you said that, uh, Senator Faulkner. But I think that the important thing was that in uh, my time as minister, there was only one leak from them, and uh, the person responsible, who was from the Wilderness Society, got uh, as big a serve off the rest of the conservation movement as he got off me, and uh, and it didn't happen again. So that the, the privacy of those meetings was respected for all of those three years. Now, uh, apparently, uh, in this. Uh, exercise, as I said, Mr Deputy President, of crass politics, there's a suggestion that um, Mrs Kelly has in some way—I can't quite understand the way myself—but has in some way uh, attacked the Prime Minister. Well, if one reads the, uh, the press this morning, there can't be any doubt in, uh, in their minds that uh, the extract from, uh, uh, from the tape uh, does suggest that uh, she didn't attack the Prime Minister but did attack the Premier. In fact, uh, Various newspapers quote the Premier's reaction to uh, Mrs Kelly's words. The Premier's, uh, from uh, Mr Bannon and Mr Griner, weren't, uh, weren't in any doubt about who got criticised and uh, have, uh, have responded uh, as one might expect uh, them to respond if they have been criticised. In fact, uh, if one looks at uh, the words of, uh, of Rodney Faulkner on AM, the 11th of this week, uh, I, <coughs> No, no, no relation, um, and I'm sure not spoken to by uh, by uh, the senator. You're not such a bad fellow. Uh, I want to quote what he had to say. Um, if, if we are talking about the prime minister uh, being attacked by Mrs. Kelly, if this really is some sort of terrible plot, which uh, which the government is uh, is uh, purporting to uh, protect, then uh, I think Rodney Faulkner's uh, words are instructive. I believe that she was quite strongly on that particular issue, which is the whole uh, of the federalism proposals, took an official line, if you like, a prime ministerial line. On some issues, she sympathised with us. On others, she disagreed. In fact, uh, she said 
uh, I should say he said we weren't pleased with the federal line as a whole as represented by Mrs Kelly. The point being that uh, Mrs Kelly's performance at, uh, at the meeting of uh, the Peak uh, Council of the Conservation Groups had been to support. Of course, I haven't heard the tape. <laughs> and, and I have no intention, no intention whatsoever of trying to. Why would I want to hear the tape? Why would I want to hear the tape? The tape is of a private meeting. And if good government is to continue, if there is to be any, any hope for the effectiveness of that, uh, of that uh, government uh, uh, kind of meeting to continue, then there has to be some respecting of the privacy of it. And uh, meetings which have four years. Yeah, come on, Madge. Point of order. I beg your pardon? Come on, Madge. Uh, I beg your pardon? Did you have a did Excellent. you have a point Mr. of order? Mr Deputy President, uh, if uh, the uh, minister thinks he's being amusing by being insulting, I would ask him to withdraw that remark. I have been insulted. Indeed, well, in my view, you have. I'd, uh, order, I didn't, I didn't hear a was, uh, he I was didn't making a remark. disparaging co uh, um, a comment in calling me a name that is not my name. I would ask him to withdraw it. Is that, is that what your point of order was? No. I would ask him to recall that. If you I seek your guidance, Mr. Uh, Mr. President. I, I, Mr. Deputy President, I, uh, if I have uh, in any way uh, made an unparliamentary remark, or uh, then obviously I would uh, I would withdraw. Um, but uh, there is a, uh, a reference, I think, in the Sydney Morning Herald to uh, to a uh, uh, to uh, to uh, Senator Bishop, in which. Um, in which, uh, actually, Senator Collins last night, uh, the man well, described uh, here uh, as well, having well, a waste well, as big well, as well, 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 order, order, Senator Richardson. Yeah. I, th I think it might not be uh, wise to compound anything that's occurred. Um, I heard a remark, and um, I'm not quite sure that I regarded this as unparliamentary. I didn't know where it came from. Uh, it came, certainly came from my right. If um, Senator Bishop finds the word unparliamentary, I would ask, ask for it to be withdrawn. I think that's the easiest. I shall withdraw it then. Now, you had a point of order, Senator Bishop. Yes, I did have a point of order, Mr Deputy President. My point of order related to the fact that we are debating a specific motion relating to the uh, tape which is, uh, the Senate has, request, uh, has ordered be t uh, produced and tabled. The minister has now admitted that he has not heard the tape and he is attempting to defend uh, a tape which he is uh, no longer uh, finding relevant, no longer finding relevant in his address, and I would ask him to address the subject matter of the motion, or else to cease and stop uh, and uh, cease his uh, contribution to the debate. Well, I can't see any point of order. Um, I think that on a matter such as censure of the government, it's uh, quite. Uh, quite in order for the minister to range fairly widely, and as a matter of fact, I don't, I'm not sure that he has been ra ranging too widely. Uh, I, no, I'd like to call the minister. Point of, uh, point of order. I, uh, uh, there's been a recent case of mistaken identity, uh, uh, Mr. President. I also, or I certainly did, uh, interject a moment ago and uh, referred to Senator Bishop as Madge and in the same spirit as Senator, Senator Richardson. I withdraw that. Yeah, I, I, I thought that might have been the case. I think, uh, Senator Richardson. Uh, Mr. Deputy President, the whole point that, uh, that I've sought to make is that it's a private meeting and therefore the tape shouldn't be released. The fact that it's a private meeting means why would I want to listen to the tape? I mean, if it's indeed private, and uh, there can be no question on the basis of all of the comments of the participants, bar one, and I'll get to that in a moment, bar one, that uh, it's a private meeting. If, if all the participants say so, it's quite extraordinary that uh, here in the Senate there seem to be a whole lot of people with a, with a different view. None of them have been ever participants at these meetings, nor ever will be. None of them can therefore comment on Well, not, not in the last four years. Not in the last four years. Not in the last four years. And uh, well, I, I'm quite prepared to say that Senator Calder has attended some. What I am certain of 
is that there is no one in the opposition, no one who could ever go near a conservation group, let alone get elected to opposition where they finish up at a peak council meeting. No one over there would ever get the environment movement to, uh, to go near them, to talk to them or anything else. You, Senator McDonald, you are the one that uh, Queensland conservation groups are concentrating on for your appalling attitudes to the environment. But uh, to get back to the point, because I, uh, I don't. I mean, it is only interjections that gets me to range from the point, Mr. Deputy President. And uh, well, I, uh, I tell you what, I'd love to have a contest. Um, I think uh, it's clear from all of those uh, quotes that I've read out that uh, the two things emerge from uh, th that meeting. A, all of its participants, except for one person, regard the meeting as private. All of them. Secondly, uh, all of them, bar one again, bar one again. Are, uh, are making it very clear uh, that uh, Mrs Kelly took the line which the Prime Minister has been taking on new federalism, and it is the fact that she took that line, the fact that she wouldn't depart from that line, which the conservationists obviously don't like, that uh, caused so much uh, uh, anger and indeed uh, the leaks that uh, finally came from that meeting. But even uh, even all of those people don't wish the uh, the tape to be produced. In fact, the only person who's come out and said that um, this was not a private meeting was Mr Gilding from Greenpeace, and I note with interest that Senator Bone quoted from him this morning. <clears throat> now, I, I hadn't realised that Greenpeace was going to become the, uh, the or, or statements by Greenpeace would become as a, uh, as a gospel for, uh, uh, for the opposition. But I'd have to say that, uh, that uh, Mr Gilding's comments put him at absolute odds with uh, the rest of the participants at that meeting. And so uh, you can take a view, I suppose. Does one out of a dozen equal a majority? I think uh, most people over here would say no. Does not make him and, wrong. Uh, I, uh, well, I, I think that the word of the other 11 doesn't make them wrong either, Senator no, Crane. Does doesn't make him them him wrong either. Wrong. There are just so many who can uh, overrule his view that uh, the weight of evidence is so strongly against him you couldn't go any other way. I hope you're never sitting on a jury. And so I uh, I'd have thought, uh, Mr Deputy President, that given, uh, given the word of all of those, uh, of all of those people who have attended the meeting, given the history of those meetings as always having been private, then uh, one wonders how we get to, to the stage we're at this morning. We get there for only one reason. The opposition had a very bad day yesterday. Very bad day yesterday. They, they, were, they were given a dreadful time by the gallery. And I don't blame Senator Jock Jockey Peterson for yawning. I would too. I said it was one of the great yawns of our time. They got a very bad time yesterday. Did very poorly indeed. And so uh, today we see uh, what's, what Senator Faulkner, to you're not being more. helpful to the chair. What amounts to no more than a, uh, a stunt, a stunt all about crass politics, nothing about constitutions, nothing about law, only about politics. And uh, at the end of the day, I think the Australian people would be entitled to wonder why, why the Senate would waste its time on a motion like this. Why uh, all of us would have to sit here and go through this when the reality is that there's no power to enforce this resolution, none whatsoever. No power to enforce this resolution. And the only thing that can be achieved here is yet another debate about whether the tape of a private meeting should be produced when the participants at the meeting bar one all say it shouldn't. And I wonder why it is that the Democrats would want to lend themselves to the crash politics in this motion. Senator Roche. Mr uh, Deputy President, Senator Richardson has just concluded his speech by saying that this Senate has no power to compel the production of the tapes in question. Senator Richardson began his speech by saying that this was a debate not about constitutional law but about constitutional practice. That may well be the case, Mr Deputy President, but this is a debate about a constitutional practice that is honoured by this government more in the breach than in the observance. And Senator Richardson knows full well that this Senate does have the power to compel the production of these tapes. 
that the resolution of the Senate passed on Tuesday is a binding resolution, and Senator Richardson full well knows that the refusal of this government to comply with the resolution of the Senate amounts to almost a contempt of this chamber and of the institution of representative government. For Senator Richardson's benefit, perhaps we might start with the ludicrous argument that this was a private meeting. Is it appropriate that the tape of a meeting should be brought into the public domain is a question that Senator Richardson asked, not just on Tuesday but also now. Yeah, keep flapping your wings, Senator West. You might fly away as well. Yeah, you might fly away and find yourself sitting next to the tooth fairy, Senator West. Perhaps it might not be ordinarily appropriate for a tape of a private meeting to be brought into the public domain, but let's not forget this one fact that the matter in question is already in the public domain. How can anybody honestly say that this was a private meeting when the contents of the meeting, the matter in question, has been spread throughout the newspapers, over radio and television, and this government has the audacity to come before the Senate and say, but it's still a private meeting? Well, for Senator Richardson's benefit, I'm going to quote from The Australian. Because Senator Richardson obviously didn't get around to reading The Australian today. And this is what Glenn Milne had to say, referring to, to uh, Minister Kelly's refusal to make the tape available on the grounds that it was a private meeting. He said, and I quote, her refusal for not doing so amounted to a legal fiction. Kelly claimed the meeting was private and should remain so. This was a meeting the contents of which had already been published on the front page of The Weekend on Australian, an account that included confirmation by three Green representatives present at the September 4 meeting. It was a meeting that Kelly discussed with the Prime Minister the same morning when he interrupted his racing tips to call her from Sydney's Ramada Renaissance Hotel to check what she'd actually said. So much for the argument that it was a private meeting. The matter is in the public domain and it is therefore important if we are to have any confidence in this minister. It is important if we are to have any confidence in this government. It is important if we are to have any confidence in the honour and integrity of the executive that the whole of the tape be produced, because the questions that now arise go right to the heart of Minister Kelly's ability to discharge her duties as a member of the executive government. Now, of course, yesterday Senator Richardson also tried the line, and it was contradictory to his first argument, that we could get the tapes under the Freedom of Information Act. Of course, this Senate, in passing the Freedom of Information Act, never intended to abrogate its powers under standing orders to an item of legislation. The Freedom of Information Act was always supplementary to the powers of this Senate that have remained and remain to this day. And Senator Richardson, in raising that foolish freedom of information argument on Tuesday, showed what a poor grasp of the actual facts he really does have. As Senator Hill has said, there are some 20, 20, precedents, 20 precedents of motions calling on the government to table documents. And these are, perhaps, instructive for Senator Richardson and his colleagues on the other side of the chamber. For example, on the 19th of March 1931, a resolution that was passed requiring the production of all papers in connection with an increase of duty on Oregon, and in particular letters from the Secretary to the Executive of the South Australian branch of the Labor Party addressed respectively to the Prime, Acting Prime Minister and to the Prime Minister to be laid upon the table of the Library. It clearly shows that this Labor Party that occupies the government benches is trying an old stunt. They're trying to do what they've tried to do before, but at least the Labor Party of 1931 had a sense of integrity, had a sense of decency, and knew that they had to comply with an order of the Senate when it was made. This Labor Party, this pathetic, this pathetic excuse for what once may have been a great party, doesn't have the integrity, doesn't have the honesty, doesn't have the courage to comply with an order of the Senate. And they treat this Senate with contempt, and for that they should be condemned, and that is why we are moving this censure motion against them today. Now, of course, 
Senator Richardson, <laughs> Senator Richardson might also be interested, might also be interested in when the Labor Party, when they occupied the opposition benches, asked for the production of the papers, and that was in 1982. And Senator Richardson perhaps may be enlightened to know that his colleague, now the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade, Senator Evans, had no difficulties with requiring the production of highly confidential documents, documents that are much more confidential than these, because they were documents that related to legal advices on pending court cases. And yet this government refuses to make available a tape of a meeting the contents of which were already public upon the ludicrous argument that the meeting was private. Senator Richardson clearly doesn't know what he's talking about. But Senator Richardson, too, came into this chamber and selectively quoted from Erskine May. And Senator Richardson said that there was an equality between both houses of parliament and neither, yes, and neither house could could exercise authority over a member of the other house. Well, Erskine May may well say that. But did Senator Richardson tell us what Erskine May said on page 433? No, he didn't. For Senator Richardson's uh, information, I'm going to quote to him what it says. Similarly, it has been accepted that a document which has been cited by a minister, and goodness knows how many times this particular document has been cited, ought to be laid on the table of the House if it can be done without injury to the public interest. I submit, Mr Deputy President, that the production of this tape is not only not contrary to the public interest, but is directly in promotion of the public interest so that we can see the disgraceful and shameful way in which this government conducts itself. And of course, Senator Richardson, in trying this spurious argument that the Senate could not order the government to produce a document, overlooks the fact that in 1982 his good friend and colleague Senator Evans in fact moved a motion calling upon Senator Cheney as minister representing the Attorney General to table documents here in the Senate. Senator Richardson can't even go back and get it right compared with his mate Senator Evans in 1982. There's a difference too between a member of the House of Representatives and this government. And what this Senate is doing is calling upon the government to comply with an order of the Senate. Senator Richardson can't get away with his ludicrous argument that there is some sort of executive privilege. The fact is, the only privilege that this government can claim is a privilege of its own arrogance. The privilege of its own arrogance in believing that it's not accountable to the people. The fact is, there is a very clear case on what is and is not executive privilege, which was decided by the High Court of Australia in 1978, which is Sankey and Whitlam, in which it was ruled, in which it, indeed a very famous case, another honourable, an honourable Labor minister, an honourable Labor Prime Minister, in which the High Court ruled, in which the High Court ruled, well, well, Mr. Whitlam did have principles, and if he didn't like them, he found others. <laughs> it was ruled in 1978. The documents or portions thereof were not privileged from production unless, of course, that it would harm the public uh, interest by the disclosure of those documents. What harm can be done to the public interest by finding out whether or not Mrs Kelly is a Minister of Integrity? I would have thought if Mrs Kelly was a Minister of Integrity, it would go to the public interest to table the documents. But this government doesn't think so. I think the final word on the matter, Mr Deputy President, the final word on the matter is a uh, an answer, a statement given by, by the President of the Senate on the, 14th of, uh, on the 22nd of November 1978, in which he said in relation to the production of documents and the question of executive privilege, he said, and I quote, I go no further than to express the view that the Senate would no doubt uh, take uh, the recent decision of the High Court judgment into consideration in, in, uh, in these matters. The President also said, uh, Mr Deputy President, and I quote, replying generally, the questions involve matters which are ultimately for the Senate to decide. 
in the regulations of its own proceedings. It is appropriate for the Senate to decide these matters. It is within the power of the Senate to decide these matters. It is within the power of the Senate to order this disgraceful, dishonest and disgusting government to comply with the principles of representative government, to comply with the principles of parliamentary duty and to table the tapes that this Senate and the people of Australia demand to know. Senator Cooney. Deputy President, uh, this, this motion, this, this motion uh, is a motion that's to be expected. And uh, what it does show, what it, what it does show about the constitutionality of the uh, of the system under which we uh, operate, under the Westminster system, what it does show about it is it's a party system. And uh, the fact that it is a party system will soon be illustrated, because uh, when the vote comes to be taken on this, uh, on this matter, uh, there will be not a single person, I hope, from this side of the uh, chamber who will do anything but vote against it. And I hope that everybody over there is loyal enough to their party to vote with their party. And I would be disappointed if, uh, uh, on an uh, issue of party politics such as this is, that people wouldn't stand by the party uh, on the, uh, under whose banner they have arrived in this chamber. Well now, uh, I, well now, look. All I'm saying is this: that, that I mean, that's to be. So, and there's no doubt that the reason that over in the other place uh, a motion like this uh, would be defeated is because over there the government, the Australian Labor Party, has the numbers, as Senator Walters says, and that's absolutely correct. So I think that it's, it's, it's important, first of all, to understand what this is all about. Now, I don't mean to say by that. Now, I don't mean to say, but well, it is a constitutional point, uh, Senator uh, Alster, because as you know, uh, uh, it's constitutionally the position that whatever party wins the greatest number in the, uh, in the House of Representatives governs. And no doubt that you've got every ambition in the world, and properly so, uh, <coughs> that, uh, that it's proper to have an ambition like that, that you will be a, uh, a minister after the next, uh, uh, on the front bench after the next election, and I would hope and I would expect that, in, that those behind you stay solidly behind you and support you if you get into any, uh, any difficulty. Now, I mean, that's, let, let's, so that's, all I'm saying is that's the reality of this situation. Now, now on the other hand, uh, well, we're all putting party ahead of the, uh, in that certain circumstances, if that's how you put it, everybody puts uh, their... Uh, uh, well, I, I, I look, I, I'd better get on. I'll just to answer Senator Hill, uh, he says you put party ahead of principle. All I'm saying, as a matter of reality, in this chamber and in the other one, that is how this system under which we uh, now live operates. And, uh, order, order, well, all right. Well, look, we'll, we'll talk about that one. But the next thing I want to say is this: I think, in spite of all that, that, that the reality of things been as they are. Nevertheless, it is, uh, it is the situation that uh, this uh, House, this uh, Senate, has passed this motion and made an order which must be, I say, must be treated very seriously indeed. And the fact of the matter is that the tapes have not been uh, uh, laid on the table. Now, <clears throat> there's no uh, doubt in my mind that uh, it's uh, proper for a uh, Senate and for a House of Representatives to make uh, orders for productions of tapes in certain circumstances. But what everybody has agreed upon is that the public interest is a uh, significant point in deciding whether or not uh, uh, a uh, particular tape or a particular piece of uh, evidence should be produced. And that there is no doubt that this chamber makes decisions on the basis of what's in the public interest. And can I, illustrate, can I illustrate where this chamber in very recent times has decided that it would be wrong, it would be wrong for people to reveal what went on in a meeting? And indeed, uh, as a result of a particular meeting, that, uh, the contents of which were revealed in this chamber, we now have in our committee room a, uh, a, a system whereby uh, the word isolated appears. Uh, when uh, the, uh, the recording equipment is, uh, is on or when it's off. And that arose because Senator Schott 
some time ago, revealed the uh, contents of a meeting to deal with people who are interested in preserving life uh, at a, uh, an early stage of its existence and where they were having a meeting, which I would have thought was a public meeting in the sense that people from all parties were there, and uh, where that uh, meeting uh, was in fact uh, broadcast over the broadcasting system. And even though it had been a broadcast, uh, people, and in my view, properly, took exception to the fact that it was revealed in this, um, in this chamber. Now, it seems to me to be uh, 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 an issue as to whether or not matters ought to be revealed, when in one case, this chamber, and on that case it was the other side who was saying it shouldn't have been revealed, and where uh, Chris Schott, a man of some uh, tender emotions, may I say, a person very easily hurt, was subject to some criticism, which I don't think he's ever quite recovered from, that uh, on that occasion, uh, well, Senator Heron, you weren't here then, but people quite properly, and I think Senator Bjelke Peterson was at that meeting, and I thought she was quite right in the, uh, in, in the approach that she took to say that that sort of thing should not have been revealed to the public without people being told about it. Now, that was a very And, you see, can I just go on to a point here? I don't think in a certain sense it matters whether this was a public meeting or a private meeting, because what the significant thing is that that tape that, Senator, uh, that uh, Mrs Kelly took was a tape for her own purpose, and uh, that was a confidential tape. Now, I don't think it matters very much whether there's a, uh, a public meeting or a private meeting in question here. What does matter is whether or not what she did was to take that down on tape in a confidential manner. Well, it was for her purposes. Nobody's, 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 uh, nobody's, uh, uh, nobody's talking about that. Now, <coughs> look, if we take this principle too far, this is what we should do. Look, let's make everything open. So everybody on the uh, last day of sitting of each of our sittings have got to bring in their private diaries about what's happened in this uh, chamber, what's happened in their uh, party meeting. What's... All right. Well, what about so? So the distinction made by Senator Hill is that the members of Parliament have got uh, the members of Parliament have got um, a confidentiality. They've got the right to confidentiality, but ministers haven't got the right to confidentiality. Well, look, Senator uh, Senator Hill, that uh, that concerns me uh, considerably. That you say, as long as there's a, a formality which will be defined by a uh, uh, a group of, uh, by half the Senate or more than half the Senate, uh, then, uh, uh, then whatever goes on in that uh, should be made uh, it should be made public. But, uh, and I, look, there would have been diaries made, no doubt, by the people who were there, and uh, I think it would be wrong. It would be wrong for this Senate or for this Parliament to compel people who had gone to private meetings or public meetings to. Uh, to, uh, to put forward their diaries, any other notes they'd made about a meeting that had taken place. Now that, that gets us to an, uh, to an absurd situation because all of us, all of us keep our uh, uh, the thoughts in our head. Now, uh, that's what you'll be after next, by the way. You'll be saying, look, what we really want to know is your real thoughts. And can I just follow that through and see where we get to on that? Because what I'm saying is this. <laughs> there is a public statement by uh, by Mrs Kelly as to what happened there. There's a public statement by uh, the others as to what happened. But you say, you say, look, that's not sufficient. What we want to do, Mrs Kelly, is to get this information so we can cross-examine you. So we can say that what you say publicly, what you say publicly is not correct. That's almost getting down to uh, being thought police. Because what you're doing, no, you're not saying, look, the important thing, the important thing as far as government is concerned, the important thing as far as government is concerned is what ministers say publicly. <laughs> what they say publicly is what the government's position is. Now, uh, if, if you keep interrupting, certainly, uh, Senator Macdonald. <laughs> and uh, if, if, uh, <laughs> well, right. and um, it's 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 wrong, clearly wrong in principle that uh, people should be able, or Senate, whether it's the Senate or the House of Representatives, should be able to go on a uh, fishing expedition to find out material 
that they may be able to use to embarrass uh, the government or any particular minister uh, when that minister has acted correctly and properly. And let's get this clear. Uh, Mrs Kelly, uh, in her public statements, has acted uh, quite correctly, Absolutely. quite uh, with, with, with complete integrity. There is nothing in her public utterances, nothing in her public utterances, that that, that could uh, that could be uh, that could be condemned. And if I can and, and if I can take that remark, now let's, let's if I can I take that remark from one of the most outstanding intellects on the uh, on the opposition bench, that Senator Kemp. If I can take that remark, it shows you what this is all about. It shows you what this is all about because what Senator Kemp is saying, and he reveals the position of the other side, is they want to use this to embarrass the government over the leadership struggle. Now, this is not. Let's be clear about this. This is not from the remark that's come over the other side. This is not, uh, uh, Madam Acting Deputy uh, President, uh, an attempt to get to the truth of some matter that's of vital public interest. This is an attempt to fish and nut tape to see if they can find something that can be used to embarrass the, uh, uh, the government over the leadership position. Nothing to do with environment, nothing to do with, uh, with any uh, portfolio that the government has to have. The, Senator, the, the comment from Senator Kemp clearly illustrates that what this is all about is the uh, attempt to embarrass this government over the leadership struggle by getting to somebody's private paper. Of course they are, but uh, that's what it's all about. So that when you're looking at public interest, when you say that the public interest is at stake, you haven't been able to produce any evidence as to uh, what public interest you have in mind. And the, uh, the, the next thing is this. I think that if there is material available, whether it's confidential, whether it's taking a private meeting or a public meeting, which is in the public interest to reveal, then it's proper for um, Parliament to do something about it. But you simply can't go fishing. It's unfair by the uh, very nature of the process on witnesses, unfair on the very nature, by the very nature of the process on ministers, simply to go fishing amongst their confidential material in the hope that you'll find something to uh, embarrass a government with. So if you're going to proclaim the public interest, you've got to produce some evidence, some evidence that on this tape there is something that goes to the, uh, to the issue of how this government's governing. And, uh, but you see, Senator Kemp, again you illustrate exactly what I'm saying. What you say, look, give us a transcript and we'll tell you what's in the public interest. What I'm saying is you've got to point to something that suggests it's in the public interest and then ask for it. You simply can't go fishing, because if you go fishing, we might as well get everybody's uh, diary, everybody's uh, tape and simply come in here. And that's what the alarming thing is about this. There's no, there's no evidence at all that you can produce, no evidence that you can produce to show that this tape goes to the public interest. And the, and the best evidence I have to illustrate that is that famous figure, Senator Kemp, as I say, one of the great intellects on that side of the chamber, the best, the best perhaps, the best mind, one of the best minds over there, may I say, and the best, yes, one of the best minds, including you, Senator Stewart, the best he says he can say on behalf of the opposition is, look, give us the tape and then we'll tell you where the public interest is. Now, what I'm saying, and you'll be, you'll be coming up after me, uh, Senator, uh, uh, Senator Olson, I want to hear you on this. Uh, where do you disagree with the uh, position Senator Kemp puts that what this is all about is a fishing expedition to find some material in which to put against uh, uh, Mrs Kelly? If you had some evidence that Mrs Kelly in some way had not done her duty, if you had some evidence that in some way she would uh, departed from her ministerial responsibilities, then we could look at things, but you can't. The uh, other thing I want to say is people have quoted, people, uh, I'll sit down, people have quoted, and I agree, and uh, Hodges in his sixth, the, uh, in the sixth edition of the Australian Senate practice says this, and I, uh, I uh, say it, <coughs> Uh, that he says uh, the sixth edition contends that the executive government enjoys no privilege which puts it above parliament. And I agree. 
having in mind that an overriding principle of the parliamentary system of government is and must be the accountability of the executive to parliament. And I agree. Any recognition of executive privilege is an unchallengeable right to deny information to parliament is inconsistent with that fundamental principle. And it says parliament can do this and parliament can do that. But now, what does parliament mean? Now, what I just can't do and what we can't do is rise above the constitution. And what does the constitution says? The, say? The constitution says this. The Governor General, uh, uh, the legislative power of the Commonwealth should be vested in the federal parliament, which shall consist of the Queen, a Senate, and the House of Representatives, and uh, which is here and after called the Parliament or the Parliament of the Commonwealth. It's not the Parliament that's called for this; it's the Senate. And you cannot, you cannot identify the Senate as the Parliament. And uh, what we need, and whether there's any rights or wrongs, or whether any public interest was in this at all, if Parliament, that is, if both houses called on Mrs Kelly to reveal this tape, then she'd have to do it no matter what the rights or wrongs of it. But the fact of the matter is that, uh, that, that Parliament hasn't done it. Parliament hasn't done it. And uh, you can't go elevating, no matter how august a chamber this is, and I've got a great respect for it, you can't elevate the Senate to the position of the Parliament. Uh, until you uh, can do that. Well, in fact, you can't because uh, the Constitution, which we all which we all obey, now perhaps that's, which we all obey, defines Parliament, and it defines Parliament as the two houses and the Queen. And uh, look, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. Well, look, you're on a different argument. Uh, you're on a different argument, uh, Senator Ochi. Uh, I mean, you've got to stick to the to the point I'm making, which is that uh, that Parliament that Parliament is the uh, point. If that to be right. Now, the, the, uh, so the other, so what's happening here is that you take a, uh, you take, you're taking a person, uh, <coughs> Senator uh, uh, Mrs. Kelly, a minister whose reputation you cannot produce any evidence to impugn, who, who, uh, who has, um, has, uh, <coughs> has, uh, at this point in time, a, uh, a, 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 the ability. To stand tall as a minister, as a person, and as a uh, member of parliament. And what you hope to do is, by going on a fixing expedition, you might find something whereby you can embarrass her in the government. And that's a process that we should uh, can, uh, we should not uh, we should not tolerate. Just <coughs> one matter. It's pointed out to me. That of the people there, everybody agreed it was a private meeting. In my argument, it doesn't matter whether it was or wasn't, but it was a private meeting. The only person who said it wasn't was a Paul Gilding, who wasn't at the uh, who wasn't at the uh, at the meeting. So anyhow, we'll hear what evidence there is to uh, <coughs> impugn uh, Mrs. Uh, Kelly from the speakers that follow me, and. Uh, <coughs> No doubt they'll be able to lay some reasonable basis on which you can say, look, the public interest uh, uh, requires us to produce these documents. Something above and beyond the, uh, the proposition that if we had a look, we'd be able to find something. Well, if you had a look at anybody's private papers, you're probably uh, able to find something about it. But that's not how we should operate in this House, because that leads to a complete injustice. And on that point, uh, it's not in this country that Parliament is supreme. The uh, real proposition is that the rule of law is supreme. And one of the great propositions in the rule of law under the Westminster system and the system under which we come by in the Commonwealth system is that persons are entitled to their reputation, entitled to preserve their reputation of innocence, entitled to preserve uh, their integrity of a person unless some evidence can be produced to show that they should be diminished in some way. And it's only when that evidence is produced that we can then look to, uh, to, uh, uh, to furthering that, uh, that material, not as you're doing here, making an allegation that, she, that there's something on those tapes uh, and then going on a fishing expedition hoping against hope, because it would be against hope, that you'd find something, uh, something on the tape. What we ought to uh, do, of course we won't because of the party politics in this matter, uh, we should uh, reject this motion and uh, leave Mrs Kelly, as she is, with the outstanding reputation she has as a minister, a member of parliament and a person. Senator Alston. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. 
It's uh, been an extraordinary performance this morning, hasn't it? Uh, almost Alice in Wonderland. We've had uh, two speakers on the government side, Rumpole and Robespierre. <laughs> and, if we, and if we look at uh, what Rumpole had to say, uh, it's quite clear that he got a doc brief which was handed back at the last minute, and I trust he'll be marking it fee declined. <laughs> it's, it's, quite, it's quite unfortunate, in a sense, that uh, he feels so bound by his instructions that he had to take riding orders which told him that numbers override principles. Because if there's one thing that Senator Cooney has been noted for in this place, it's his commitment to uh, very important parliamentary principles and the rule of law, ones which I think we all hold in high regard and we hold him in high regard for advocating them. And that's why it's uh, very unfortunate that he should uh, resort to such sophistry as the proposition that somehow the overriding principle in this debate is a rule that says persons' reputations are so sacred that we shouldn't be entitled to inspect any documents. Now, whose reputation is on the line at the moment? What about the people who are called liars by Minister Kelly? Aren't they entitled to a fair hearing? Aren't they entitled to— Well, we'll, co we'll, come, we'll come to that in a moment. You see, you see, I suspect Senator Richardson's the one who really takes this view, not Senator Cooney, that uh, numbers matter before principles, because at the end of the day, Senator Cooney knows what the responsibilities of the executive are. He understands that uh, either House of Parliament is entitled, as this one has done, to resolve that certain matters be put before it, and the obligation of the executive is to account to that House of Parliament, not to treat it with contempt, not to say we will not comply, full stop. If you go back to the uh, 1982 uh, episode, you will find there that Senator Cheney, on behalf of the government in the Senate, uh, put the proposition that uh, these documents should not be released because it was not in the interest of the administration of justice. It might well prejudice the uh, private uh, affairs of those whose taxation details might have been disclosed, and that there was a good and proper reason in the public interest. Now, we've not heard one skerrick of a defence along those lines. No, not not uh, executive privilege, not commercial in confidence, and if you look at Senator Richardson the other day, not even a decent FOI defence. So I would have thought that uh, the moment you put in your request, you'd be insulted if they said then it was a need for an internal review. They ought to simply look at the, uh, the minister, take his word at face value and hand it over. So hopefully we won't have uh, too much longer to wait before we do get uh, the true details of this sordid affair. So there is a public interest here. The interest in many respects lies in knowing whether uh, the Greens have been defamed by the minister and indeed in knowing what the real agenda is all about. And I think in that regard uh, it's perfectly plain what the real agenda item ought to be. It's whether Mrs Kelly is speaking with a forked tongue, whether on the one hand she's publicly uh, accepting her responsibilities of cabinet solidarity and therefore uh, supporting new federalism on the other hand, privately bagging it, telling the Greens that uh, this is all the fault of these uh, sordid premiers or, indeed, a prime minister who's forcing her into it. That's the issue, whether you've got a government and a minister who are singing the same song. Now, if you think that the public aren't interested in knowing whether these sort of uh, matters are real or false, then you don't have much of a concept of the public interest. So let's just look at uh, what our other friend had to contribute uh, earlier on, because I found it quite extraordinary that uh, the world's greatest self-proclaimed political fixer should somehow, somehow come into this chamber and purport to give us a lecture on parliamentary practice. Now, who, 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 who did he quote? Who did he quote? This is, the, this is the failed law student, mind you, who's suddenly become an expert on constitutional law. You know who he quoted? He quoted. He, he quoted. He quoted. He quoted. I won't even bother with you. He quoted Erskine and May. Erskine and May. There's no such. There's no such publication. All of us know it's Erskine May. First name Erskine, last name May. But no, even a, even a brief stint at law school before they gave him the chop wasn't sufficient for him to understand how important that book on parliamentary pr practice is. So of course that's about the best we can get from the government in terms of an analysis of the issues. And, uh, of course, it's perfectly clear that uh, Senator Richardson's uh, self-serving justification 
ought not to be taken at face value. Indeed, uh, it's extraordinary to ask when this document was first claimed to be private. I mean, is it really private to uh, call together a meeting of all those groups around the country who have a vital interest in an issue, not say anything to them beforehand, don't say, right, oh, chaps off the record, without prejudice, not to say a word to your friends and relatives. You don't say any of that. You just call them in, away you go, and then at the end of the meeting, or maybe seven days later, you say, by the way, not to say a word to anyone. That's how it works. So suddenly we're having this uh, defence trotted out that this was all off the record. Now, was it? I mean, the Greens were all over the front page of the Weekend Australian, telling us chapter and verse, backing it up with the minutes of the meeting, demonstrating what they say was a very important contradiction between Minister Kelly's public position and uh, her private stance. So then we have all this other self-serving nonsense about this is private. This is somehow something that no one should breathe a word about. Now, if we took that at face value, what's the logical consequence? That you wouldn't release a word of it. But what did we have yesterday? They come along and give us self-serving selected extract from the very document they claim is private. In other words, because it suits their political advantage, because they got such a thrashing in the media over the last few days, they everywhere. And they decided then to selectively release a portion. Now what's What's privacy? Is privacy partial? Is privacy defined as releasing those parts that help me, irrespective of whether they damage someone else? Is privacy a question of deciding that there are some words here that might somehow get me off the hook politically, that we might be able to turn the tide for a day or two, so we'll breach our self-proclaimed notion of privacy and we'll trot out a few garbled and equivocal words which I would have thought, if anything, dig, dig Minister Kelly in even deeper, because they make it perfectly clear that she is fundamentally opposed to new federalism. Whatever she chooses now to say about crass politics, she is bucketing those who adhere to it. If you want to pretend she's bucketing the premiers, pretend it. But who did the deal with the premiers? The prime minister. So, so you've got, you've got. Well, you've uh, that point escaped me. You've uh, what you've. What you've got here, <laughs> what you've got here is uh, a criticism that goes to the very heart of the government's commitment to new federalism. I mean, you can't have one party to an agreement. If the premiers are to be criticised by the minister for espousing new federalism for all those base reasons, like uh, they're interested in selling their grandmothers for a quid and all these other disgraceful uh, notions, then what's to be said about the other party to the agreement? Why did he go along with it? Do, should he still adhere to it? You can't have it both ways. Clearly, Minister Kelly is publicly undermining the, the stance of the Prime Minister on this issue. Now, she's probably taking her riding orders from uh, those who were trotting out notes to her in the House the other day. I mean, what a demeaning spectacle. You're in the Cabinet, you're up there making a speech, and here you've got Mr Keating passing you little bits of paper telling you how to, how to run your argument. I don't know. I, 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 well, you're, enti you're entitled to have a bit of a chat, but I would have thought a minister's able to defend herself. I mean, really and truly, to, to have to rely on a piece of paper from a failed leadership pretender. And of course, you're going down with him, so I can understand your concern. And uh, clearly, if that's the, the, the sort of position that Minister Kelly gets herself into, it's quite understandable that uh, she should be squirming in the way that she has been. And, uh, don't for a moment pretend this isn't linked to the leadership. You'll remember the way in which Senator Richardson managed to beat this whole thing up to the point where Mr Keating actually had a run. Do you know the great tactic? You go around the countryside denying that there's any such thing on the agenda, hosing it all down, supposedly, telling people that there isn't an issue, that you've heard all these rumours, but it's nonsense. And, of course, all the time you're upping the ante. You're getting people more and more excited. You're creating an environment in which you can actually have a go. Well, they had a go and they're still going out the back door. But clearly what Mrs Kelly's on about is uh, taking this sort of advice to new heights, to, to simply get out there and allow something to swing for some days, to create all the fuss and bother. Because if, if they were fair income, why wouldn't they have released even that selected piece of the transcript on day one? I mean, why choose to do it now? 
It's being done purely to try and deflect all the, the odium that's uh, attaching to this indefensible position. Now, I would have thought that uh, the very least we're entitled to in this chamber is a proper explanation of why the government takes the line that it does. And even taking Senator Cooney's position at its uh, highest, the very least that Senator Button could have done was to say, dear sir, you can't have the document because it's not in the public interest. Now, I would have thought that's a pretty poor defence, and you certainly wouldn't charge for drafting it. But the fact is, at least you would have offered some sort of explanation. But we didn't even get that. We got no justification at all. A studied contempt, a, a degree of arrogance that I would have thought was uh, breathtaking and quite indicative of this government's determination to tough it out, to uh, provide what information it wants to to the parliament or to either house on its terms. Now, if that's not the very antithesis of parliamentary democracy, if that's not flying in the face of all those principles that uh, failed law students and others think are important, then I would have thought that uh, this government doesn't even understand the basis on which uh, it occupies those benches. So, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, I would have thought if ever there was a clear-cut case of uh, a government being in an indefensible position, of uh, choosing on its own terms to uh, simply be selective and ignore all the uh, precedents and practice of this chamber, then it is this government that uh, the, the motion that we are considering today and for which I commend the Democrats for supporting is one that simply makes it clear that uh, there are rights and responsibilities, that there are obligations on the executive and individual ministers to be accountable, uh, at the very least, to come into this chamber via ministers of the Crown and provide a decent explanation for the conduct that uh, they adopt. But we've had none of it. We've simply had a thumbing of their collective noses at this chamber and this parliament, and that is what we are condemning today. Senator Faulkner. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, we've um, so far had nearly two hours' debate on this matter, and we've had it because, of course, the opposition got a comprehensive drubbing yesterday in the House of Representatives. And the opposition, I was there, and the opposition, uh, I was in the gallery with your uh, mate, Senator Kemp, who I, I think privately agrees with me. Uh, and not only, not only point do of, I know point, it. Point of order. Point of order. It's clear that I don't privately agree with him. I don't publicly agree with him. I've never agreed with him. There's no point of, there's no point of order, Senator Kemp. <laughs> Senator Faulkner. You've kept my integrity intact, uh, Senator Kemp. The, uh, and not only, of course, Madam Acting Deputy President, do I know you got a comprehensive drubbing. But you know you got a comprehensive drubbing, as so does every journalist in this country. And if you don't believe me, go and read, go and read the morning newspapers today. But of course, we, uh, we had a, a, another lily-livered attack from Senator Alston on those on this, from this side of the House who have made outstanding contributions to today's debate, Senator Richardson and Senator Cooney. But what about the performance put up by the opposition? I mean, a few lightweights have come. A few lightweights have uh, come into the uh, attack for the opposition. We've had uh, we've had we've had Senator Ochi. We've had Senator Ochi in his usual fourth place youth world debating championship style, who comes in here all the time and says uh, and. And tells the Senate how he how he represents the young people of this nation, and has never once has never once put the truth before the Senate. That is that he represents the most corrupt branch of the most corrupt political party in the Western world. Point of order. Deputy President, uh, Senator Faulkner is either saying I'm corrupt or that my representation is corrupt, and of course. Both comments, and either comment, is totally unparliamentary and highly, uh, highly unsatisfactory. And I'd ask you to direct him to withdraw that, uh, those offensive and objectionable words. Senator Faulkner, Senator Chi has taken offence at the remarks you've made. Uh, 
I ask you withdraw them. Well, I was attacking the Queensland National Party, but if, but if, 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 if it is unparliamentary, I will withdraw it, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Faulkner. And then, of course, we had, uh, then of course we had uh, Senator Alston, and uh, he doesn't know what these references to uh, about casino are. Well, let me tell you, Senator Alston, one of your recent achievements in the last few weeks. Senator Alston went on a trip to casino. I don't know what this has got to do with the debate. This is a censure motion against the government for the government failing to comply with an order of the Senate. What has that got to do with Senator Alston? Well, well, Senator Hill, I, I suggest to Senator Faulkner be allowed to continue, and he can show us what the relevance is. And if he doesn't, well, he'll be stopped. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm commenting on the contributions of other senators to the debate, and uh, I must say you've got a bigger crowd in here uh, in your contribution to this morning's debate, Senator Alston. You managed in your well-publicised. Uh, public meeting in casino when absolutely no one fronted to listen to you. And What's the relevance of that to whether or not the government should be censured? Is, is that your best point? Well, well Senator, Senator Hill, Senator Faulkner is not, not far into his speech and he, he is entitled to make some reference to other participants who have participated in the debate. He's not entitled to give his entire speech on that matter, but he isn't far into his speech, and he is, as I, as I understand it thus far, uh, trying to make some reference to other participants in the debate, and no doubt will go on to make some reference to what they have said. And I might say, President, he's gone for five minutes and hasn't presented one argument. Well, Sen Senator Hill, Senator Faul Faulkner is entitled to speak for 30 minutes. It, he, he has not gone for five minutes. The clock has gone for nearly five, but a good deal of that time has take, been taken up with interjections and points of order. If Senator Faulkner is allowed to continue, I will do my best to ensure that he keeps relevant. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As I said, uh, as I said that we, we, have, uh, we, have, we are. We are having this debate in the Senate today because of the pathetic performance of the opposition in the House of Representatives yesterday, when Senator Cheney blew himself, when, when ex-Senator Cheney, when ex-Senator Cheney blew himself comprehensively out of the water, and uh, and this was of course going to be Senator uh, ex-Senator Cheney's comeback performance. It was going to be his comeback performance after his uh, disastrous effort with the, uh, the uh, Peacock-Howard uh, coup, which, of course, you are one person, Senator Bishop, who suffered very much as a result of that. And I know, I know, Madam Acting Deputy President, that Senator Hill, of course, is an unreconstructed Cheneyite. I know that, and I know that he was always going to defend ex-Senator Cheney. Point of, po point of order, Senator Brownhill. I, I just uh, ask you to rule on the point of relevance to the debate, which was uh, moved here this morning by. <laughs> Senator Hill, I don't think there's any relevance to any of the matters that uh, Senator Faulkner is talking about. Yes, uh, Senator Brownhill, um, there's no point of order, but Senator Faulkner, ma matters might proceed more smoothly if you could uh, give, give an immediate indication uh, a, as you speak as to, as to the relevance of your remarks to the debate. I'd also uh, point out, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, that in the House of Representatives there was a motion of lack of confidence in Mrs Kelly, and that motion was defeated. There was also, Madam Acting Deputy President, a motion, a motion that the tapes that seemed to obsess senators on the other side of this chamber be tabled, and that motion was defeated. The House of Representatives has expressed its view on both those matters. But the main, I was going to make a very brief contribution, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, but I have been, of course, uh, interrupted, uh, 
continually by members of the uh, by members of the opposition. But the main point I wanted to make, Madam Acting Deputy President, is the absolute hypocrisy of these people. The absolute hypocrisy of these people because of what happened in late 1982 over documents, of course, that related to bottom of the harbour tax schemes. And it was these hypocrites, these hypocrites who at that time, who at that time as members of the Fraser government, as members of the Fraser government, order, who order, would order, not order, Senator, Senator Faulkner. It is not appropriate to refer to other members of this chamber as hypocrites, and I ask you withdraw. I will withdraw that. Uh, that Thank you. <laughs> well, I'd always be guilty if you were the judge and jury. Let's face it. But, uh, but, um, Madam Acting Deputy President, it is utterly hypocritical utterly hypocritical for opposition senators and the opposition to argue in this case that a tape should be tabled. It is utterly hypocritical for them to do that. And they know it. They know that they did not conform with an order of the Senate in 1982. And for them to come into this chamber today for about the fifth bite of the cherry after the House of Representatives has made a decision on both these matters is a complete waste of time. They, they tried to attack a minister of this government. Well, they fluffed it. They fluffed it. They have tried to have the tapes tabled. They have fluffed it. They've lost, they've lost it. Game, set and match. And I think, Madam Acting Deputy President, it's time to get on to the next item of business. Senator Kemp. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I rise to support the motion before the Chamber to um, censure the government for its uh, refusal to table the uh, tape. Madam Chair, there is no question. Madam Chair, there is no question that this tape or its transcript will finally be produced. It will be produced under an FOI order or by an order of the court or ultimately by this chamber. But this, this tape, but the facts that this tape will reveal will certainly become public in, not, in the not too distant future. And I thought it was sad today, to sad today to listen to this debate and to listen to the performance uh, by the minister and his uh, supporters on uh, why this particular document should not be produced today. And I think it was very telling, very telling that in the letter to the clerk of the House from Senator Button that no reason was given for refusing to produce the tape. No reason was tendered by the leader of the government in this uh, place for not producing the uh, tape. None whatsoever. And so we listen carefully. We listen carefully to the, the, the minister. We listen carefully to Senator Cooney. Uh, we listen uh, caref carefully to Senator Faulkner to see what the reasons were. Because I suggest to you, uh, Madam Chair, this is a matter of uh, high constitutional interest and of high constitutional practice. It is not a trivial issue. And the reason that uh, the minister gave us was that the House had decided, the other place had decided not to produce, not to produce the tapes. And this, by some uh, peculiar misquote from Erskine May, was deemed to be— No, I think, as you pointed out, it, uh, Erskine May— Erskine May— as, uh, You didn't dispute the quote. The, uh, the, the, mis, the misquote and highly selective quote failed to, tra to uh, tackle, uh, Madam Chair, the uh, substantive point. And the substantive point is this: that this chamber, this Senate, has the right to uh, determine its own rules 
and has the right to manage its own business. And if we accepted the argument of the minister, there would be no reason for this particular chamber to exist, because once the, once the other place had determined its view on a bill, on a particular matter of public importance, that, as far as the minister is concerned, is sufficient and therefore binds this chamber. I don't believe in the history of Federation there would be any other minister who would come in and make such a stupid, silly oh. argument. Because, the, because on 20 previous occasions, on 20 previous occasions, 20 previous governments, Senator Cooney, 20 previous governments have obeyed the order of the Senate and produced documents. So how can you, how can you come in here? How can you come in here and, and argue that the Senate does not have these particular powers? Were 20 other governments quite wrong, were they? 20 other governments wrong. 20, 20 other governments wrong. And so the point I'm making, it is an extraordinary thing about this, this uh, particular debate that this document uh, and the tapes and the transcripts uh, which are now available, available to certain selected people, but not apparently but not apparently to the Prime Minister, not apparently to the ministers who are standing up in the other place and in this chamber and defending Senator uh, Ros Kelly. All of them have been very careful to avoid making any claim uh, that they have actually read the t heard the tapes or read the transcripts. They are prepared to come in here and come into the other place and uh, Defend Mrs. Kelly, defend her without having taken the trouble, without having taken the trouble to actually listen to or read what those transcripts contain. Somewhat extraordinary, I would have thought. Somewhat extraordinary. And we are therefore entitled, I think, to, to speculate, to speculate on what is on these tapes. We now have before us. We have exactly three minutes. Uh, uh, sorry, three sentences from a transcript which went on for three hours. So we are quite entitled to speculate what is precisely on these tapes. What is the government afraid of? What, what is the government afraid of? What, uh, what particular item of information? What particular item of information is contained on these tapes? Is the government and is Mrs Kelly worried about, for example, the robust language that she used, uh, reportedly used during the three hours meeting. Very robust indeed, and, and we have a slight and we have a slight hint of the sort of language that Mrs. Kelly uses when we read those three sentences. I suggest where she accused uh, uh, many of her Labor colleagues, Labor premiers, as being willing to sell their mothers for order, the big dollar. Order. That, that's the sort of language. That's the Order. sort of language that we have a hint of, Should've and we have reports that. that Mrs. Kelly apparently used uh, during this three-hour meeting. Maybe, maybe this uh, tape revealed the nature of uh, the grubby deals which this government has done with uh, various green groups uh, prior to the last election. Maybe, maybe there was a fairly vigorous exchange on that particular issue. Maybe, maybe there were some comments about the money which the government had paid out to some of these groups and the trade-offs which, which were required. Maybe there was a fairly vigorous exchange on that particular issue. How interesting it would be for the public, Senator Cooney, how interesting for the public at talking about public interest to explore those particular issues, because we know that the man in charge of that was none other than the minister at the table, uh, uh, Senator Richardson. So we're, we're, in, I, we're entitled to, to think and speculate about uh, what, what was on that tape. Uh, I was intrigued by um, Senator Faulkner's comments that, uh, about uh, the, the, uh, the nature of the debate uh, yesterday, yesterday and the other uh, place and, and uh, what was the final results of it. And he urged us to look at the press. Well, Senator Faulkner, I looked at the press and here we are in the Australian Kelly Keating out on a limb. Now, I'd have to suggest, in view of your interest in this particular matter, in view of your strong support for Mr Hawke, there's one thing that you wouldn't be worried about, let me tell you, is Kelly and Keating being out on a limb. And can I suggest to you that uh, it is maybe in the fullness of time, can we possibly speculate that uh, the Prime Minister himself, if he takes the trouble to read the full text of that, uh, of that transcript? 
Well, I'm not too sure, sure, sure that he's not. I think that it would be quite clear with the factional plays in the Labor Party, and we all know on this side of the chamber how hard those factional plays are becoming, and all of us have experienced and had chats with uh, members over the other side. But unlike Senator Faulkner, unlike Senator Faulkner, I'm not going to uh, comment on anything which may be private or that may be not private. <laughs> But I, can I say that all of us have experienced on this side of the chamber some pretty robust comments from members on the other side about the nature of the factional fighting. And so I suggest to you it is possible that uh, Mr Hawke, in the fullness of time, as this issue heats up, and let me tell you it is going to heat up, it is not over by any stretch of the imagination, Mr Hawke himself may be uh, prepared to insist that the documents be tabled. Uh, and I was noted in the front page of the Canberra Times, which we've all read. Uh, we all read uh, in the morning. Uh, Mr. Hawke is quoted as saying this: "I would not be unhappy if she, meaning Mrs. Kelly, tabled the relevant transcript." He declared, "I, I entirely agree with it." Well, there's a there's a little chink. There's a, a, the door being put slightly ajar. And uh, I suggest to Mr. Hawke that uh, uh, the public would at least want to know. Uh, why he uh, has not, not uh, bothered to read the transcript, why the minister, the leader of the government in this House has not bothered to, to read the transcript. And remember, colleagues, he was asked twice by Senator Reid yesterday in question time uh, whether he has bothered to read the transcript, and uh, Senator Button was very careful to make it very clear that no minister has, has yet bothered to read the full transcript. So, so, Senator Cooney, where does that leave the public interest? Who, who can judge? Your own people, your own people, are too scared to read this transcript. And I tell you, I bet they've got jolly good reason to be. Can I, can I say that? So, uh, I think we are entitled. This, this is a vital issue of constitutional practice. The Senate is entitled to pursue this matter with, uh, with great vigour, and the Senate will. Senator Faulkner raised, raised some, some issues with us uh, concerning what happened in uh, uh, 1992. He said very boldly, waved, waved a bit of paper around, and said what happened in, uh, in 1982. I stand corrected, and uh, I can draw him to some interesting quotes by his colleague Senator Evans, the Minister for Foreign Affairs. And uh, if, uh, as you've drawn that particular debate to our attention, uh, uh, may, I, uh, may I read into the transcript of this debate? what your Minister for Foreign Affairs now said on that particular occasion. And, and this is what he said. Uh, it is only by access to these documents that it will be possible now, given the attitude of the government has taken, for an, an objective view to be reached as to where the merits and the truth lie. Ring, ring, ring a somewhat uh, familiar uh, bell, does it? Uh, if the government is, has anything to hide. Senator Cooney, this is, this is what, uh, what your uh, shadow attorney general said then. I can understand its continued reluctance to make the documents available. If the government believes, however, that its ministers and senior officials have acted throughout reasonably and with a proper sense of responsibility to the public at large, the government should not hesitate uh, for one second to put these documents in the public domain to enable the truth of that perception to be established once and for all. Not a, not a bad quote I wouldn't have thought from Senator Evans uh, at, in uh, 1982. And thank you, Senator Faulkner, for drawing our attention to it. And he concluded, and he concluded if there is any uh, constitutional issue involved here, it is the right of this parliament to demand accountability from the executive. I would have thought, I would have thought that was a, a fairly devastating quote from another man who holds himself out to be uh, an eminent uh, legal expert. Not as eminent, I regret to say, as I've often thought Senator Cooney, and I, uh, I certainly, sort of, uh, having served uh, with him on, on a number of committees, that I was felt that he, he was a man of, of great principle and a, a man of great learning. And I'd have to say that I'd have to say, Senator Cooney, uh, that uh, I thought I thought the, 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 the contribution that you made today, order, the contribution order, order, you made order, today, order. will not stand up well. When, when, the, when the particular history of this period is written, and I'm, I'm sorry for that, because the, the contributions you often make are, are, are of, of great worth and of great merit. So, can I say that, I, uh, uh, that uh, Mr. Mr. Acting uh, Deputy President, Mr. Deputy President, that I strongly support the motion before the chair, 
whether this motion is won or lost, Senator Cooney, let me tell you, it will not end the issue. Senator uh, Walters. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. The seriousness of the censure motion before the Senate can't be emphasised too much. On Tuesday, the Senate directed that the government release the, the uh, tape recordings taken, according to the minister, by her department at a meeting that took place between the major conservation movement uh, representatives and the minister. The refusal of the government to comply with the direction of the Senate has put it in contempt. We know that there have been 19 previous occasions when that request in the history of Australia has been complied with. We know that when one request, similar request occurred in 1975 and the Whitlam government refused, they went to the people and were defeated. Senator Faulkner today has spoken about 1982. On that occasion, the request was made by the Labor Party for the bottom of the Harbour Papers to be um, brought before the Senate. At that time, the executive opposed that on the grounds that the disclosure of the documents would have been harmful to the administration of justice because many of those cases were before the court. So it was against public interest. It was for the saving of public interest that that was opposed on that occasion. On this occasion, what has the government put forward as their excuse for not bringing forward the tapes of the uh, direction of the Senate. And I have to read from Senator Button's letter in response to our, uh, our direction from the Senate to say, and he says, I have noted the text of the order and advised the Senate that the government will not be tabling the tape recording to which it refers. No excuse at all, just blatant arrogance by the minister that they have no intention of complying with the order. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, Senator Cooney disappointed me considerably in his contribution because what he did was to express the philosophy of the Labor Party very clearly. What he said was, the only thing that concerns us in this place are the numbers. Yesterday, in the House of Representatives, the motion of censure against the, uh, the minister was lost because of the numbers, nothing else, because of the numbers. And we're not going to give you those documents because we won't do it. You can request it, but it comes down to numbers and numbers only. And because they've got the numbers, in the House of Representatives, they don't intend to comply with the direction of the Senate. There was nothing in his contribution about the executive's accountability to the parliament. Nothing at all about that. What he said was, we on this side do what we are told. Nothing more, nothing less. We don't express our personal opinion whether it's on principle or otherwise, we vote according to how we are told. Well, yes, we are different on this side of the chamber, because that is not the case. On this side of the chamber, if it comes to a matter of principle, then we vote the way our principle and our conscience tells us. Senator, Senator Cooney, acknowledged today that numbers, the philosophy of the Labor Party were, that numbers were more important than philosophy, that, than principle. And that is exactly what he said. Numbers are more important than principle. Mr Acting uh, Deputy President, 
as you know only too well because it happened very recently, we had some legislation in this place on tobacco advertising. And several of our, uh, our senators crossed the floor and voted against their party on that particular issue because for them it was a matter of principle and they were permitted to do so. I have crossed the floor on several occasions, one on the matter of the referendum, because for me it was a matter of principle, not numbers, but a matter of principle. And I have crossed the floor on occasions in this parliament. I am still here. My colleagues who crossed the floor are still here. And unfortunately, the only member of the Labor Party who had the courage to cross the floor on any issue, Senator Georges, was expelled from the Labor Party as a result of him crossing the floor. That's the sort of democracy we know and we have learnt that the Labor Party indulges in. Vote for a principle against your numbers and you'll be expelled. Now, the Democrats, they don't do that. They often divide on issues. At least they know what democracy, true democracy on principle is about. We on this side have that opportunity. The Democrats have that opportunity. But in the Labor Party, there is no such thing as principle. Well, let's have a look at the history of this uh, situation. Order. Senator Faulkner. The number of points of order were taken on me during this debate for relevance. Well, I take the same point uh, on Senator Walters. A very interesting excursion around the who did and did not cross the floor of Parliament. Yeah, well, I, I'm just I, making the point. Senator Faulkner, I, I was in the chamber when those comments were made, and I, I take note of what the uh, Acting Deputy President at the time said uh, that I don't believe there's any point of order, but I would ask uh, Senator Walters to um, to move to move to uh, to the subject at hand. Well, I thought that uh, I was, Mr. Acting uh, President, because I was commenting indeed so very clearly on Senator Kearney's contribution. The only excuse that has been put up by the government or by the minister in defence of not supplying the tapes, and that isn't officially with a letter to the Senate, but in debate in the other place, was that the uh, tapes were private. We had Senator Richardson today say that the conservation movement don't want the tapes revealed. That is not true. That is just frankly not true. Indeed, the conservationists present have released their minutes have released their minutes, which confirm their opinion of what occurred at that meeting. They have asked for the tapes to be released and have said that until they are released, then a cloud hangs over their head because the minister has accused them of lying. The minister was the first to bring the uh, meeting into the public arena. The conservationists objected to her, uh, to her calling them liars, and so the, uh, the fight has gone on. The fact that the Prime Minister has released only one very small section of a transcript, not of the tape, but of a transcript of the tape, leaves the situation where today in the Australian Len Milne says, the part of the transcript released by, by Hawke confirms that Kelly criticised the new federalism process, but with the weight of that criticism directed against the premiers rather than the prime minister. The fact that the rest of the tape remains under wraps only keeps suspicion and the issue alive. If Kelly has nothing to hide, which she says is the case, she'd be better off complying with the directive of the Senate and giving up the tape. And Mr Acting President, until that is done, 
until the executive decide that they are responsible to the people of Australia, to the parliament of Australia, they have not got the luxury of saying, as Senator Button has said, that they just don't intend to release the tapes with no excuse at all. The Senate will pursue the issue and on behalf of the people of Australia. Senator Macdonald. Deputy President, uh, in this uh, debate, which uh, from this side has been uh, a very careful uh, analysis of the uh, questions before us, my colleagues have made the very telling points about what this particular uh, motion is all about. And it's uh, summed up, I suppose, in one word, and that is the absolute arrogance and contempt which the Labor Party and the government hold uh, for the people of Australia as represented by the pe people uh, in this parliament. And that's what this is all about. The absolute contempt that uh, the Labor Party hold the people of Australia in, the absolute arrogance that they show to the people of Australia. Now, if the ACTU says to this government, jump, this government says, how high? They are not at all interested in doing what's right, but they are beholden to their masters in the ACTU. It's very clearly to understand why in this chamber, when you just have a look at the background of the senators on the government side here, and a good majority of them are only here because they owe their allegiance to the ACTU and the union movement. And those that aren't are only here because they've been party hacks who've come up through the paid offices of the ALP and got a sinecure in this joint here. And that's what the ALP is all about. They are beholden to the Labor Party and the union movement. That's all they're interested in. When they, when they want to do things for, in government, do they do what's right? or that they do what's told of them by the union movement. And who elects the union movement? Who elects the union movement? A few people vote sometimes, but you've only got to look at the Cook Inquiry in Queensland to see that many of the union uh, elections are full of rorts and uh, shady dealings. Nobody elects them except a few little people with very narrow interests, with their own power bases in mind, who have no idea, no interest in the real interests of what's good Order. for Australia. Uh, Senator Faulkner. I'm not uh, at all concerned about the unkind comments Senator Macdonald's making, but I make the same uh, point about relevance that was, has been made a number of occasions during this uh, debate. Um, look, there's no point of order, Senator, Senator Faulkner, but uh, I've noticed during this debate that uh, speakers from both sides of the House have ranged far and wide on the subject, and I would ask Senator Macdonald that uh, you try to keep your remarks to the to the matter at hand. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. What I was pointing out, and that Senator Faulkner knows but doesn't want it repeated and doesn't want it enunciated, is that the Labor Party and the government are beholden not to the people of Australia but to the union movement and the few people, the few people of Australia who control that union movement. This, this country should be run by the people of Australia as, as they are represented in this parliament. Now, this parliament, a good majority of oh, Australians, too many interjections from both sides. A good majority of Australians have elected by a good majority senators to this chamber from the Liberal Party, the Democrat Party, and the National Party. Those people represent the views of well over 50 per cent of Australians, and those people have said to this government, "We want you to do something." We want you to do something that is not protected by privilege. It's not something of uh, grave commercial or, or, or national uh, uh, secrecy. We want you to do something. And what does this government say to the people of Australia, as represented by the senators here asking for that? Go and shove it. That's what the Labor Party have said. They are not interested. They are not interested in what the people of Australia want. They only are interested in what they're told to do by their union mates and the little coterie of people who control them, who have them put into this place. When the parliament, when the people of Australia say do something, this government ignores it completely. And Mr Deputy President, that is my concern that this government, and that's a concern that is well brought out in this motion, supported by the Democrats and identified by them as well, that this parliament, the people of Australia, have asked the government to do something. The government 
has ignored it completely, and the motion, amongst other things, notes with great concern the government's belief that it's not accountable to the people of Australia through uh, Parliament. And so, Mr. Deputy President, it's appropriate that this Senate again flexes its uh, muscles, shows its relevance by censuring the government, as is called upon by this motion, for its unjustified failure to comply with the Senate resolution. And it also, uh, Mr Deputy President, this Senate calls upon the government to comply with the resolution and table that tape. And Mr Deputy President, that's why it's important, again, that the majority of this parliament, the majority of people of Australia, do demand that the government take notice of the people of Australia and tape, uh, table the tape. Um, Senator Hill. Um, I don't wish to further speak on the debate. Um, the case has been put most ably by those on this side of the chamber. Mr. Thank, Thank you. President. Well, the question is that the uh, motion moved by Senator Hill be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Again, say no. no. I think the ayes have it. No, Noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. Order the question is that the motion moved by Senator Hill be agreed to. The ayes pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Knowles, teller for the ayes, and Senator Faulkner, teller for the noes. Order. Result of the division there being 28 ayes and 20 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Calder. And, uh, continuing with that matter, I seek, uh, seek leave to move a further motion. Order. Order. Senate, it would take Senator Calder, just resume your seat just for one second. Senator Niles. May I seek leave just to make a very short statement on that division? It's leave granted. Leave's granted. Senator Niles. Thank you, Mr President. I just uh, wish to draw to the attention of the Senate that uh, there were an extraordinarily large number of pairs for that particular division, and uh, that was purely and simply to facilitate uh, many of the government ministers uh, to be able to go to a funeral today, and that, in fact, opposition senators were present, and uh, it was just a courtesy extended to the government. Thank you. Senator Calder. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> I seek leave to move a motion and assure the Senate that uh, the disposal of this motion won't take very long. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Calder. Uh, I move, uh, Mr. Chairman, that there be laid on the table before the next day of sitting the latest draft of the Intergovernmental Agreement on the Environment. Question, Senator Hill. And I move that that, uh, that debate be adjourned, Mr. President. I do so because. Uh, uh, it's something that should be carefully considered, whilst on the one hand we're concerned by this select process the government has in which uh, privileged groups are given special information that's not given to the public. We nevertheless think it's better that the government have the opportunity to voluntarily put this document on the table. During the week, up weeks, it will have the occasion to do so. If it fails to do so, we will address it upon our return. The question is... Yeah, the question is the debate be now adjourned. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Petitions. Mr Clark. Petitions have been lodged for presentation by honourable senators as follows. By Senator Newman from 286 petitioners requesting that the Senate take action to call on telecom to regulate the conditions under which 0055 telephone networks are made available. By Senator Panizza from 85 petitioners requesting that the Senate take action to cease the funding of abortions. By Senator Sawada from 78 petitioners requesting that the Senate take action to call on the International Civil Aviation Organisation to set a standard for smoke-free international flights. By Senator Spindler from 8 petitioners requesting that the Senate establish a committee of inquiry into the export of Australian military hardware and services and the implications of the international arms trade. By Senator Spindler from 616 petitioners requesting that the Senate urge the government to withdraw all official support and participation from ADEX. By Senator Spindler from 83 petitioners requesting that the Senate take action to establish an inquiry into the distribution of wealth in Australia. The terms of the petitions will be incorporated in Hansard. 
Um, no further petitions. Are there any notices of motion? Senator Panizza. Thank you, Mr. President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting, I shall move that the Senate notes one welcomes the decision by the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, Mr. Tickner, not to interfere in the protracted dispute regarding the development of the West Australian Yakabindi nickel project, and two notes that this decision is a step forward in returning to rational thinking, contrary to Coronation Hill episode in allowing mining projects to proceed for the economic welfare of all Australians, and three urges the government to provide a framework that guarantees access to resource development by the mining sector if Australia is to retain such an important economic industry. Yeah. Uh, Senator Tierney. Thank you, Mr President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move one that the, that the Senate one condemns the government for initiating policies which have led to a national crisis of overcrowding in our universities. Two, note that the government's projected student numbers for the year 2001 have already been exceeded in 1991 without the provision of appropriate resources. Three, notes the increased provision in funds to higher education contained in the 1991-92 budget, but condemns this as providing too little too late. Four, deplores the government-imposed increase in workloads on academics with consequent reduction in time available for preparation and research. Five, calls on the government to provide additional budget funding as a matter of urgency to deal with the immediate over-enrolment effects. There are no further notices of motion. Um, Senator Tate, have you got a notice of motion? No. Well, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Tate. Mr President, I seek leave to move a motion to discharge various government business orders of the day. It's leave granted. There's no objection. Leave granted. Senator Tate. Mr President, I move that government business orders of the day numbers 11, 12, 14 to 16, 19, 20, 22, 24 and 43 be discharged from the notice packet. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Are there any documents to be tabled by ministers? Senator Tate. Mr President, documents are tabled in accordance with the list circulated to honourable senators. With the concurrence of the senator, I ask that the list be incorporated in the hand. Is leave granted? There is no objection. Leave is granted. Order is the Senate will be adjourning early today to enable estimates committees to meet. There will not be an opportunity to consider the government documents just tabled. The documents will be listed on the notice paper and senators will have the opportunity to consider them during general business on Thursday the 10th of October 1991. Order. I present the second report of 1991 of the Procedure Committee relating to various matters referred to the committee. Minister, Senator Tate. Mr President, I move that the report be printed. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Tate. Mr President, in recent times the Senate has adopted the practice of considering reports of the Procedure Committee under business of the Senate. I therefore seek leave to move a motion to provide for this procedure for this report. Is leave granted? There's no objection. Leave is granted. Mr. President, I move that consideration of the report be in order of the day under business of the Senate for the next day of sitting. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order. I present the presiding officer's response to the 308th report of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts on the Parliamentary Information System, unofficial account, and I seek leave to incorporate the document in hand side. It's leave granted. There's no objection. Leave is granted. Order in accordance with the provisions of the Audit Act 1901, I present the following report of the Auditor General. Report number eight of 1991-92, Efficiency Audit of the Generation Application of External Funds by the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation. Are there any reports from committees? Senator Faulkner. Uh, Mr President, on behalf of the Joint Select Committee on Certain Aspects of the Operation and Interpretation of the Family Law Act, I present the report of the Committee on the Retiring Age of Judges of the Family Court of Australia, together with the transcript of evidence and minutes of proceedings, and seek leave to move a motion in relation to the report. Is leave granted? There is no objection. Leave is granted. Mr President, I move that the Senate take note of the report and seek leave to incorporate in a tabling uh, statement in Hansard. The question is, is leave granted? 
Leave is granted. And the question, do you wish, does, yeah, wish to adjourn the debate, Senator Faulkner, on this? Or? Uh, I'll well, seek leave to continue I'll your seek remarks. Leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? It's no objection. Leave is granted. Senator McGibbon. Mr. President, I present the report of the Defence Subcommittee of the Joint Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade on a visit by the Defence Subcommittee to North Queensland and the Torres Strait and move that the report be printed. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator McGibbon. I leave to move a motion in relation to the report. Is leave granted? No objection. Leave is granted. Mr President, I move that the Senate take note of the report and seek leave to incorporate my tabling statement and hands up. Is leave granted? No objection. Leave is granted. You're going to the Defence Committee visited the uh, Cape York and Torres Strait region for the first time, and uh, we uh, visited uh, Townsville, where we met with 11 Brigade, 3 Brigade, 5 Aviation Regiment, the RAAF, in Cairns. We visited the patrol boat base of HMAS Cairns, headquarters 51 Far North Queensland Regiment, and the Australian Customs Service. We were on Horn Island, Thursday Island, Boigu, Saibai and York, where we met with the Torres Strait Island community leaders, and then we returned through Bamaga and Weeper. Mr President, Cape York and the Torres Strait area is a very important area for Australia, and it hasn't had the attention it warrants. This government places greater emphasis on Darwin and the Northern Territory on the advice that's tendered to it by its advisers, but uh, the Cape York area really... Um, is this a point of order? Senate gave Senator McGibbon leave to table his statement, and now he's reading it. Yeah. We've, got to, we've got four minutes to transact a lot of business. I thought that's why we gave you sought leave, and that's why we gave it. Well, I don't know of what unofficial arrangements there were, but Senator McGibbon is correct in speaking to the motion at the moment. Well, Mr. President, it's the wish of uh, the minister to uh, curtail the vote. I'm quite happy to yield, uh, provided that comes back on the notice tape, but my understanding and my instructions from my work were that I had uh, four to five minutes to speak to the report. And the report was presented this morning in the House of Representatives where 20 minutes was available for members of the committee to speak to the report, but I'm in the hands of the Senate on this. Question time. But I'll move the debate be adjourned. If, I'm not trying to... It's not... No, no. You, you, order. Senator McGibbon, you'll have to seek leave to continue your, your remarks if, if that's what you wish to do. Well, I'll seek leave uh, to continue my remarks, uh, Mr President, but my instructions were that I had the time and that we were going into the lunch period uh, to deal with the business that had been delayed by what's occurred earlier this morning. After the adjournment of quarter to one, if Senator McGibbon made his statement under matters of public interest, could we do that? I think it would be better if Senator McGibbon sought leave to continue his remarks than he has yet. <laughs> is leave granted? Leave is granted. Um, Senator Watson. The Joint Committee of Public Accounts, I present the 311th report of the Committee entitled Activities 1990-91. Seek leave to move a motion in relation to the report. Is leave granted? Leave I is granted. Senator Watson. Take note of the report and I seek leave of the Senate to incorporate my remarks in hand, sir. Is leave granted? There's no objection. Leave is granted. Senator Watson. Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts, I present Supplementary Finance Minute Report Number 305 and seek leave to move a motion in relation to the document. Is leave granted? I move the Senate take note of the document. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Is uh, Senate, Senator Niles? Mr President, on behalf of Senator Reid and the Joint Committee on the Australian Capital Territory, I present the report of the Committee on, the, on a Proposal to Amend the National Capital Plan, Amendment No. 1, and seek leave to move a motion in relation to the report. Is leave granted? There's no objection. Leave is granted. Senator Niles. President, I move that the Senate take note of the report. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Um, has anybody got the Publications yep. Committee report? Uh, Senator Niles. Uh, Mr President, uh, on behalf of Senator Archer, I present the 15th report on the Standing Committee on the Publications and seek leave to move a motion in relation to the report. Is leave granted? 
It's no objection. Leave is granted. It's in denials. Mr. President, I move that the report be adopted. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Are there any? To make a short statement concerning the uh, chambers dealing with reports from committees. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Mr. President, uh, I made my uh, request of Senator McGibbon on the clear understanding that I had till one minute ago that the Senate was adjourning at a quarter to one, and then perhaps matters of public interest would be dealt with if some senators wish to speak on non-controversial topics. After making my request of, or, or bringing the matter to the attention of Senator McGibbon, I was handed by the clerk uh, a motion for me to read. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of matters of public interest this day, that matters of public interest not be preceded with this day. The parliamentary liaison officer told my whip at or about the same time as I was handed this, this motion to read. Now, I find that absolutely intolerable that I have been led to a situation where I have offended a senator on the other side who wanted to talk about a particular uh, report, and, uh, and we have created uh, some confusion in the chamber as a result, whereas there was plenty of time, as it turns out, for Senator McGibbon to make his uh, contribution on the report to which he wished to speak. So I find it very unsatisfactory, Mr uh, President, and I, uh, I apologise to Senator McGibbon for, uh, for the situation that has developed. Senator Niles. Can I just, uh, may I seek leave just to make a short statement? Yes, is leave granted. Senator Niles, leave granted. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I understand Senator Tate's embarrassment about it. I fully appreciate the, the comments that he's made because the negotiations were just going on at that crucial time where the uh, liaison uh, um, officer had, in fact, sought my approval to go on into the lunch break. And that was what I was trying to mouth across the chamber, but unfortunately we just didn't have the time. So I appreciate the, the comments that you've made, as does Senator McGibbon, and uh, there is certainly no ill feeling about the issue. It was just a case of bad timing. Thank you. Um, well, because of the time, is leave granted for Senator Tate to move his motion? Leave is granted, Senator Tate. Mr. President, I move that matters of public interest not be proceeded with this day. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Um, are there any documents to be presented by the clerk? Mr Clark. Documents are tabled in accordance with the list circulated by the honourable senators. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Are there any formal motions? No formal motions. Um, Senator Tate. Well, Mr President, uh, I ask the government business notice of motion numbers one and two standing in the names of Senators Bolkus and Tate be taken as formal business. Is there any objection to these motions being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call Senator Tate. Mr President, I move that the following bill be introduced, a bill for an act to amend the Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918 and the Referendum Machinery Provisions Act 1984 and for related purposes. Um, the, question, the question is that this motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. Mr President, I move that the following bill be introduced, a bill for an act to amend the Federal Court of Australia Act 1976. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Mr President, I present the bills and move that these bills may proceed without formalities may be taken together and be now read a first time. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Mr Clark. Federal Court of Australia Amendment Bill 1991. Electoral and Referendum Amendment Bill 1991. Minister Senator Tate. Mr. President, I table the expanded memorandum relating to the bills and move that these bills be now read a second time. The que um, Senator, Senator Niles, will you take the adjournment? Move the debate now adjourned. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Mr. Contrary, Mr. no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Tate. Mr. President, I wonder whether I should have sought leave to incorporate the second reading speeches in Hansard before that. I thought adjournment. you did. If not. No, I didn't because it was. Once again, it wasn't. Yeah. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Tate. Mr. President, I move that the bills be listed on the notice paper as separate orders of the day. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order. A message has been received from the House of Representatives acquainting the Senate that the House of Representatives 
has made the amendments requested by the Senate in the Social Security Disability and Sickness Support Amendment Bill 1991. Minister, Senator Tate. Mr President, I move that the bill be now read a third time. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. A bill for an act to amend the Social Security Act 1991 in relation to disability and sickness support and for related purposes. Order. Messages have been received from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. OSAT Repeal Bill 1991, Overseas Students Charge Amendment Bill 1991, Aboriginal Education Supplementary Assistance Amendment Bill 1991. Minister. Mr President, I indicate to the Senate that those bills which have just been announced by the President are being introduced together. After debate on the motion for the second reading has been adjourned, I will be moving a motion to have the bills listed separately on the notice paper. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be considered together and be now read a first time. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Mr Clark. OSAT Repeal Bill 1991, Overseas Student Charge Bill, Amendment Bill 1991, Aboriginal Education Supplementary Assistance Amendment Bill 1991. Uh, Minister. Mr President, Senator I move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There is no objection. Leave is granted. Senator Knowles. I move the debate be now adjourned. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Tate. I move that the bills be listed on the notice paper as separate orders of the day. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order. A message has been received from the House of Representatives acquainting the Senate that the House of Representatives has agreed to the Senate Quorum Bill 1989-1990 without amendment. Uh, Minister, Senator Tate. President, I move that the sitting of the Senate be suspended. The question is... I'm, I'm sorry. Senator Zakharov. Mr President, I present the report of the Standing Committee on Community Affairs and the examination of annual reports. I move the report be printed. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Zakharov. Mr President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the report. Is leave granted? There is no objection. Leave is granted. Senator Zakharov. Mr President, I move that the Senate take note of the report. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Do you wish to adjourn the debate? Uh, or not? Um, or seek leave to continue? Oh, if it's convenient, I'll seek leave to continue my remarks. <laughs> is leave granted? There's no objection. Leave is granted. Now, I think Senator Tate. Mr uh, President, I, I, uh, I move that the uh, Senate, uh, that the sitting of the Senate be now suspended. Till 2 p.m. The question is, that this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order. Sitting of the Senate is suspended until 2 p.m. With two amendments. <laughs>
The Leader of the Government, Senator Button. I seek leave to make a statement about ministerial arrangements. Is leave granted? There's no objection. Leave is granted. Mr President, I inform the Senate that the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade, Senator Evans, will be absent from the Chamber today. Senator Evans is overseas on government business. Any questions which would normally be directed to Senator Evans in relation to his portfolio should be directed to Senator Ray. I also inform the Senate that the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cook, will be absent from the Chamber today. Senator Cook is attending the ACTU Congress in Melbourne. Any, que any, questions, any questions which would normally be directed to Senator Cook in relation to his portfolio should be directed to me. And questions in relation to those portfolios he represents should be directed to Senator Collins. Senator Button. With that announcement, was any questions uh, to Senator Cook, normally directed to Senator Cook in relation to the portfolios he represents, should be directed to Senator Collins. Questions without notice. Senator Boehm. Mr President, my question without notice is addressed to Senator Button. I refer the Minister to today's labour force figures for August, which show that a further 8,600 Australians joined the unemployed, lifting the massively understated total jobless in Australia to a seasonally adjusted post-depression record of 840,500. And I ask the Minister, why have 152,000 full-time young Australians' jobs been wiped out? over the last two years, of which 23,200 were lost last month alone, how much worse does the government, in its deliberately engineered recession, plan for youth unemployment to get on top of August's worst ever recorded seasonally adjusted figure of 29 per cent of young Australians unable to find full-time work? The Leader of the Government, Senator Button. Well, Mr President, let me uh, say first of all that uh, uh, the unemployment figures are high, but um, they are within uh, the budget forecast, which... Uh, uh, well, uh, no, uh, I mean, uh, you sought to make... You, you sought to make... Uh, you sought to make capital at this uh, visit the time of the budget, and uh, that's a legitimate function for an opposition. But let, let me just say that the 9.8 uh, per cent figure, accompanied by a higher participation rate, is, uh, is something which the government both expected and uh, predicted in the course of the uh, budget papers. Uh, <coughs> the uh, components of that 9.8 per cent figure are as, simply as follows, that the number of employed persons rose strongly by 106,000 reflecting rises in both full-time and part-time employment in all states. The participation rate rose markedly by 0.8 per cent to 63.4 per cent after peaking at an historic high level of 64.2 per cent in July 1990, leading to a slight fall in 8,600 in the number of unemployed persons to 840,500. I should uh, uh, agree, in the light of uh, earlier comments I made, that the trend unemployment rate continued to rise from 9.7 to 9.8 per cent. Now, Senator Boehm uh, uh, refers also to the uh, 29 per cent rate uh, <coughs> in, in the ABS statistics. Uh, <coughs> I just want to make a couple of points about that. Uh, Senator Boehm always focuses on that figure as if uh, it is an equivalent estimate to the overall unemployment rate. That is to say the overall unemployment rate is 9.8 per cent, but the rate for uh, teenagers is uh, 29 per cent. That totally overstates the unemployment situation in relation to teenagers. The 29 per cent rate in the ABS release relates to the number of 15 to 19 year olds not at school but looking for work. Therefore it is the total unemployment in that age category as a proportion of a relatively small number of people. The 8.8 per cent figure uh, referred to today by Minister Dawkins 
in his press release is the number of unemployed teenagers looking for full-time work as a proportion of the total teenage population. And that figure is more comparable to the 29 per cent figure which Senator Boehm uh, selected in the course of his question. Supplementary. Supplementary. Senator Boehm. Mr uh, President, uh, I thank the minister for that misleading answer and I draw his attention to the fact that the budget budgeted for total unemployment to reach 10 and 3 quarter per cent. What does this mean youth unemployment will rise to? And I repeat, to what level does your government expect in your engineered recession youth unemployment to reach on top of the official level of 29 per cent? Uh, Minister, send a button. Well, Senator, the, uh, the budget Fair prediction uh, or forecast was, uh, as Senator Boehm uh, indicated in his uh, supplementary question. I thought uh, Senator Boehm, uh, uh, full of synthetic outrage as he always is in this place, would have been happier that that uh, figure is not uh, attained in the uh, monthly figures that just published. But uh, far from that, he wants to uh, refer again to the budget figure. Now, it's, that is a forecast. It is not necessarily uh, uh, a precise forecast, and uh, <clears throat> I can only say that monthly figures are, uh, have to be looked at for what they are, monthly figures. You can't uh, draw any uh, strong conclusions. Now, well, look, <coughs> Senator... <coughs> Order. Uh, <coughs> Senator, I, I uh, explained at some length to you, Senator, that uh, in terms of youth unemployment, you use a misleading uh, figure in your questions. I thought you might have got that point and not, <coughs> not, not, uh, not, uh, not, uh, not bounced back like an India rubber ball uh, <coughs> on, in, the knowledge, in the knowledge that the figures that you use are misleading in, in terms of the total youth unemployment situation. So uh, your supplementary question in relation to that is, is uh, how shall I put it, redundant or irrelevant until we agree on what the appropriate measure of youth unemployment is and not a small sample as chosen by you for your own purposes. Order. I draw the attention of honourable senators to the presence in the chamber of Professor Andrzej Stelmachowski, the marshal or president of the Polish Senate. I might say a good personal friend of mine. On behalf of honourable senators, I take great pleasure in welcoming you to the Senate. I trust your time in Australia will be both informative and enjoyable. And with the concurrence of honourable senators, I propose to invite Professor Stelmachowski to take a seat on the floor of the Senate. Um, Senator Maguire. Thank you, Mr. President. My question without notice is directed to the Minister for Industry, Technology and Commerce, Senator Button. I refer to a new uh, product that's been developed by the South Australian Department of Agriculture, uh, known as the Agri Dry, which uh, dries fruits, timber and paper products. Does the minister believe that the product could have other applications in Australian industry and uh, earn export dollars for Australia? The Minister for Industry, Technology and Commerce, Senator Button. Mr President, I don't always have time to read the Adelaide News in detail, but the uh, article about this matter has been drawn to my attention. And uh, uh, in answer to the honourable members, honourable senator's question, uh, AgriDry is apparently a product of considerable commercial potential developed by the South Australian Agricultural Department for the drying of fruit. Uh, I don't uh, want to go into any detailed description uh, of the technology, but uh, it uses a pump system which uh, achieves a high degree of efficiency, offers great savings in energy, and uh, the project has been partially funded by the Electricity Trust of South Australia. I understand that there are several of these machines in use, not just for drying fruit, but also for uh, other food processing uh, production. 
Not only is the agri-dry an alternative to conventional dryers used by rural cooperatives, but it can also be a substitute for conventional sun drying used by farmers, because the problems of sun drying uh, are substantially reduced by this technology. I don't believe that the idea has been fully commercialised at this time. Development is continuing with the aim of improving the efficiency even further, and these machines in operation have been custom made for specific requirements. Other applications may well be identified as development proceeds. Initial production has been for the domestic Australian market, although uh, in terms of the question which Senator Maguire asked me, it uh, can be said with confidence that there are uh, good export prospects down the track for this technology. Senator Perra. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question without notice is directed to Senator Button, representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cook. And I ask the Minister, is the ACTU annual conference at which Senator Cook is currently attending and receiving his marching orders for the year <laughs> serious in demanding serious in demanding that future wage increases be based on overseas inflation rates if those rates are higher than Australia. Will the government reject this stupid and destructive proposal out of hand? The Minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Button. Well, I, you know, I just take up the first part of the question that Senator Cook, as uh, Minister for Industrial Relations, is at the ACTU Congress uh, receiving his marching orders. Uh, in the better days of the Liberal Party, Senator, when you were in government uh, <clears throat> and uh, when you had a wages policy and an industrial policy, a uh, very long time ago, uh, very long, very, very long time, very long time. Well, Senator Kemp interjects about a health policy sitting behind. Senator Kemp, you know, been here a fortnight, interjects about a. About health policy, but I thought you were a student of politics, Senator. I thought you would have known. Uh, well, ask Senator Boehm. Ask Senator Boehm about health policy. Uh, I would. I would have thought that was a very uh, sensitive issue for you to interject about, Senator Kemp. But still, you learn. You learn as you go on, and given a few more years in opposition, you might get to the front bench. Now, in terms of uh, <coughs> the first part of Senator Parra's question, let, just let me say this that in those halcyon days when that once great party, as Sir Robert Menzies referred to it, Liberal, Liberal Ministers for Industrial Relations would meet with the ACTU and attend the ACTU Congress as appropriate. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, all, uh, all you uh, one-eyed rednecks over there are psyching yourselves up. No, not you, Senator. Not you. I didn't, wouldn't, wouldn't apply that to Lord, somebody like you. So I was looking here. I, I'm looking here. That's, that'd be the last thing I'd call you, Senator Boswell. Let, let me say, uh, psyching yourselves up into tough positions, knowing that you were weak on all these issues in eight years in government, uh, you can uh, interject about these uh, questions. Let me say that uh, any proposition which the uh, a, which emerges from the ACTU Congress will, at the appropriate time, if the ACTU so decides, be communicated to the government. And uh, <coughs> let, 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 let me say, one always gets questions uh, from this opposition about likely wage outcomes, about how the wage system is uh, to be in the next year. I've had these questions as long as I've been leader in the government of the Senate. What's going to happen? What's the government going to do about wages next year? Well, the brutal fact which you people have to face up with is that this government has delivered throughout its history as a government on, on wage outcomes. On wage outcomes. On wage outcomes. And uh, <coughs> Senator. Order, order, order. There are too many interjections. In all that hubbub, uh, in all that hubbub of noise, Mr. President, I pay a tribute to Senator Parra, who, who really was interested in the answer to the question, which is about wage outcomes. And Senator, all, all the time we're asked these questions about wage outcomes, and on wage outcomes, this government has delivered, as distinct from previous governments. Now, uh, the, the, let me say that. The, uh, the, government position, the government position on wage outcomes is uh, 
uh, is uh, in, uh, contained in its submission to the current review of the wage fixing principles. It talks about a generally accessible wage increase. Claims for a general wage increase to protect living standards would need to be assessed against uh, the question of how the new wage system is working. And, uh, <coughs> the quality of the agreements reached and the commitment to low inflation will be key ingredients of, this, uh, of these wage outcomes. Uh, Senator, Senator, I, uh, I, can't, uh, I, can't speak, I can't speak for any speeches that were made at the ACTU Congress. The ACTU will put a position to the government in due course, and we will, and we will consider it. Supplementary. Senator Mr. President, as Senator Button was quite obviously not prepared to reject out of hand this absolutely stupid and destructive proposal to pay wages based on overseas inflation rates when they are greater than what is the position in Australia, I ask him, why is the government determined, in conjunction with its unelected masters, the ACTU, to consign Australia to third world status? Minister, Senator Button. Well, Senator, first, first of all, let me say I, I thought I might have even made it clear to you that I'm not prepared to comment about press reports about press reports of speeches made at the ACTU Congress. Not prepared to comment about that. And, uh, <coughs> Senator, insofar as you want to uh, uh, tar the ACTU with a particular brush, well, you can, you can do that. But uh, one day. One day, when you're a pretty old man, you might have to confront some of the issues instead of making noises in here. Senator Zakharov. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is addressed to Senator Ray, in his capacity representing the Minister for Defence, Science and Personnel. What family support measures are currently provided for members of the Australian Defence Force? And how will the results of the first census of ADF families, which was conducted on March the 12th this year, be used in the development of future Australian Defence Force family policy. The Minister for Defence, Senator Rowe. Well, Mr President, the uh, 1985 Hamilton Report and the 1988 Cross Report identified the need for the Australian Defence Force to provide additional family support measures to improve the quality of service life. Since then, a wide range of measures have been taken to improve family support. The creation of ADFILs, that's the Australian Defence Family Information and Liaison uh, Staff, it was a major step in this. Through ADFIL's service, families have access to a toll-free telephone information service, which has dealt with more than 10,000 calls, inquiries on a wide range of matters to do with service conditions since its establishment in 1989. The establishment of the Family Support uh, Funding Program with a budget for 1991-92 of $1 million is distributed nationally in grants of up to $20,000 for playgroups, childcare centres, spouse organisations and neighbourhood centres. A further million has been allocated under the facilities program to provide for the establishment and capital improvement of childcare centres. Already a number of the centres have been set up at facilities around the country. The normal posting cycle has been extended from two to three years to provide greater geographic stability and, where possible, members with school-aged children are given back-to-back -back postings in the same locality. The standard of housing is being upgraded significantly. The Defence Housing Authority, set up in 1987, is halfway through a decade-long billion-dollar program of construction and acquiring, and acquiring better quality housing. Well, uh, Senator, this is not a Dorothy Dix. This is a question that Senator Zakharov, uh, Senator Zakharov has asked. And, uh, as I've Order. only had one, as, the, as you on that side in the last... Fourteen question times. I've only asked one question on defence. Senator Zakharov probably felt impelled to have a question in the defence area. Mr. President, uh, as senators will appreciate from these remarks, much has been done on the family front in recent years. However, refining family policy is a continuing process. That is why we commissioned the Australian Institute of Family Studies to conduct a census of members and their families uh, in March of this year. The data provided by the census gives us a very powerful tool to identify whether the needs of service families are being met. Its value lies in its ability to provide quantitative answers to highly specific questions. For example, it can tell us the number of school-aged children in a particular area or the average age of the serving members at a particular facility and so on. 
Assessing and utilising the data is a complex job. The census will be of the most value over the longer term as the results are matched against the national census and subsequently ADF family censuses. The uh, data will provide the ADF with firm evidence to back up its submissions to federal, state and local authorities for access to community facilities. It will allow greater targeting of ADF family needs. Mr. President, the Defence Housing Authority is already using the data to ensure that its married quarters purchasing and construction program matches family requirements. In conclusion, the Australian Institute of Family Studies will prepare a detailed technical report later this year, which will allow us to focus on areas of greatest need, ensuring that the service and community gains the maximum benefits and family from these family support measures. Senator Calder. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is directed to Senator Button, representing the Prime Minister. Is the new federalism policy on the care of the Australian environment being negotiated by the Federal Minister for the Environment or by the Prime Minister? Is the Federal Minister for the Environment involved in the negotiations with the states on this important matter, and if not, why not? Fourthly, does Senator Button agree that the Environment Minister's view on new federalism as published in the Four Corners program on last Monday evening, does not accord with that of the Prime Minister. And finally, will the Minister release the fifth draft of the Intergovernmental Agreement on New Federalism so that the people of Australia can judge for themselves what pattern of environmental management is being negotiated between the States and the Commonwealth? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Button. Mr President, as uh, Senator Calder ought to know, but I'm not surprised he doesn't. Uh, the, uh, these issues are being discussed at the Premier's conference between the Prime Minister representing the federal government and the state premiers representing the various state governments. And uh, insofar as uh, the negotiations are concerned, they are conducted at that level. But of course, in establishing a Commonwealth position, the Environment Minister as an input into what that position will be. The same thing applies at the state level, I would imagine. Insofar as the uh, uh, publication of any draft agreement relating to uh, new federalism, uh, I don't know whether there's much point in publishing draft uh, uh, agreements except for the titillation of uh, people like Senator Coulter. Uh, they, these, uh, these, uh, these, these uh, agreements uh, uh, form the basis for discussion, and uh, until you get until you get a firmer position identified by all the governments concerned, I don't think uh, there would be any point in that. So uh, the answer to that part of the question is no, unless uh, uh, after consultation with the Prime Minister it is decided otherwise. Supplementary, Supplementary. Senator Calder. I'm disappointed with the, uh, the minister's reply, uh, Mr. President, uh, trivialising such an important issue as, uh, as indicating uh, that he thinks uh, my seeking this information is simply to uh, achieve some titillation, to use his word. Could the, uh, could the minister inform the Senate who in the Minister for Environment's office is involved in these negotiations, if anybody at all? Minister, send a button. No, I can't inform you of that, Senator, and if I knew, I wouldn't. Uh, uh, the uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, appropriate position in respect of... Well, order. Well, Sen Senator, Senator Walters, I mean, Senator Coulter, your pardon, you've been here for, what, for four or five years. Senator Walters has been here about 400 years, and she's still making the same mistake as you make. That is to say <coughs> uh, that ministers at question time should say what members of the minister's staff is responsible for what. That's not, uh, that's not a relevant question and you ought to know that. This is a disgraceful opposition that, uh, that an interjection like that should be allowed. Uh, an interjection of that degree of ignorance, ignorance and, to use the contemporary term, that degree of crassness, that, that, that this opposition is so crass as to interject with questions like that. Now, Senator, of course, even if I knew the answer to that question, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell you because it's none of my business and, uh, quite frankly, it's none of yours either. Senator Reynolds. Thank you, Mr President. I address my question to Senator Collins as Minister representing the Prime Minister on Northern Australia. 
Can the minister please advise what impact a proposed goods and services tax would have on the economy of Northern Australia in general, and the vital cheap afraid? Well, go for it, Senator Watson. And the vital oh, tourist. Chief he did. And the vital tourism industry in particular. Is the minister aware of media reports that the proposed tax will be struck at a rate of 12.5 per cent? Could the minister comment? Where did that leak come from? No, where did that leak come from? The Minister assisting the Prime Minister for Northern Australia, Senator Collins. Mr. President, if I were members of the opposition in here, I'd be laughing on the other side of uh, their face because my source for this is the coalition candidate for the House of Representatives seat in the Northern Territory, Mr Arthur Palmer. And he's all over today's newspapers uh, with it. The headline is, and I quote, 12.5 per cent tax tip in today's Herald Sun. Hewson Fisher gave me the GST details. In response to, I am fascinated, fascinated in these interjections opposite about it'll give us, what'll GST give us? It'll give us cheap freight. Because I quote Mr Palmer, I quote Mr Palmer, Order. while opposition backbenchers have been given few details of the tax, Mr Palmer said he had been well briefed. Order. Oi, oi. Order. Senator. Hey, Senator Fogg, how about you jump Order. in when I start to Senator fall Collins, back? resume your seat. Resume your seat. There are too many interjections from both sides. Senator Collins. Mr President, the opposition call out GST will give us cheap freight. I quote Mr Palmer. While opposition backbenchers had been given few details of the tax, Mr Palmer said he had been well briefed because the tax will have its biggest impact in the Northern Territory where all freight costs will be lifted by the tax. Mr President, that is absolutely true, of course, as Senator Tambling knows. Mr Palmer said, I haven't got a crystal ball. I've been told I had good briefings, particularly by, and I quote, Fisher and Hewson. Now, Mr President, I've known for 10 years that Arthur Palmer is a complete dropkick, but now, but now Fisher, Mr Fisher and Dr Hewson know it as well. I did try and tell uh, the Chief Minister of the Northern Territory what a total dropkick he'd pre-selected for the seat, because Arthur Palmer was a Labor Party supporter uh, until, I think, last year, for 10 years. Well, well, I was always terrified he was going to pre-select for a seat, and as president of the party, in fact, I told him that it'd be over my dead body if he ever did. Mr. President, Mr. Palmer has claimed publicly that Dr. Hewson and Mr. Fisher have told him that this tax will be 12.5%. Well, as all honourable senators know, and the ones from Northern Australia should know, one of the most vital industries for Northern Australia, and certainly for the Northern Territory, is tourism. And the Tourism Association has recently expressed grave concern about the impact of a goods and service tax. In a recent paper on the impact of such a tax, and I commend it to senators uh, from uh, North Queensland, it's entitled The Impact of a Goods and Services Tax on the Australian Tourism Industry. Mr Peter O'Cleary said that his association is concerned on the possibility that GST might be struck at a rate of 12.5 per cent to 15 per cent. Mr Cleary's paper says that if this happens, and I quote, we would have a disaster on our hands in the Australian tourist industry. ATIA has recently had first-hand discussions with the tourism industry in New Zealand and Canada, which have both suffered greatly as, an, as a result of an imposition of a GST. ATIA believes that a GST would have a more severe impact on overall tourism in Australia than it had in New Zealand, and it will, weakening the fragile edge in the domestic market which has been won from the Hawke government's deregulation of domestic aviation. It is ITA's assessment that this disastrous impact will be evident on any consumption tax above 7 per cent. Mr President, I say again this would be a disaster for Northern Australia because tourism alone is worth $400 million to the Northern Territory, which is 8 per cent of the gross domestic product of the Northern Territory. Now, in a separate study to the ITIA, the Australian Tourist Commission has estimated that there would be a 15 per cent price increase, if there was, that applied under a consumption tax. The proposed annual loss to Australia would be 125,000 visitors from Japan, Germany, Britain, New Zealand and the United States of America. 
the loss of in, the loss of export income from these desti destinations is estimated at 250 million dollars a year now that is the tourist industry mr speaker uh, that's their quotes it's hardly surprising hardly surprising that they would make such claims and i understand mr speaker and i've had a look at the list and maybe i'm wrong that there is no representative there is no well, it's just 10 years of practice, I suppose. I still get into the habit. Mr President, Lord, uh, I understand there is no representative from Northern Australia in the coalition on the coalition's committee on consumption tax. It's hardly surprising that there isn't. Senator Brownhill. Thank you. Order. Order. Senator Brownhill, I don't think that adds a lot of dignity to the chamber either. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, but I... I was waiting till the uh, the music stopped. On yeah, the well, I'll run the chamber, Senator my, Brownhill. My 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 question, uh, Mr. President, is directed to the minister representing the minister for primary industry, Senator Collins. The minister ought to be aware that 60% of New South Wales is presently drought affected. He may also may be aware that the New South Wales Minister for Agriculture, a colleague of mine, the Honourable Ian Armstrong, offered some four months ago. $5 million for drought funding under Part B of the Rural Adjustment Scheme on the basis it be matched dollar for dollar by the Commonwealth Government. Despite letters to the former current primary industries ministers and verbal assurances from both those ministers, to date there has been no response. When can the New South Wales minister, indeed drought affected farmers in New South Wales who are financially strapped, expect a reply? The Minister representing the Minister for Primary Industries, uh, Mr. President, Collins. Mr President, the answer to the question is in October. Uh, the Minister for Primary Industries provided me with the following response. The Government is, con is uh, conscious of the problems being experienced by the many farmers who have been affected by the current dry conditions. Many of these farmers have also been affected by the downturn in commodity prices. <coughs> Excuse me, Mr. President. The Rural Adjustment Scheme is the Commonwealth's main instrument for providing support to farmers in financial difficulty. Under Part B of the scheme, assistance is in the form of interest rate subsidies provided to farmers to enable them to obtain carry-on finance. Farmers affected by drought may be eligible for assistance under this provision. The farmers seeking assistance should approach the relevant state authorities responsible for the administration of RAS. Commonwealth funding for the Rural Adjustment Scheme has been increased to $160 million in 1991-92. 13.6 million will be provided for carry-on assistance which requires matching funding from state governments. Funding of the scheme will be reviewed in October, including an assessment of the need for additional funding for drought relief assistance. The Commonwealth and the states have agreed to set up a working party to consider outstanding issues in relation to drought where the matter raised by Senator Brown will be considered. Senator West. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Employment, Education and Training. Is the minister aware that 103 additional schools have been placed on the list of schools designated for assistance under the Country Areas Program in New South Wales this year? Is the minister also aware that the parliamentary secretary of the New South Wales Minister for School Education and Youth Affairs, Mr Richard Ball, in a letter to a Mrs Best of Gilargambone, New South Wales, in regard to the CAP, stated that the additional 103 schools added throughout the state is in response to the Federal Department of Education insisting that these schools be incorporated so that the level of funding, that is, on a per capita basis, be somewhat equal to the level of funding in other states. Would the Minister advise the Chamber as to the truth of these statements? The Minister representing the Minister of Employment, Education and Training, Senator Balkas. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, in response to the first part of uh, Senator West's uh, question, the answer is yes. I am aware that 103 additional schools have been so placed on the list. Am I aware of the letter of, uh, from Mr Richard Bull? I am. And uh, are these statements true? Well, uh, Mr. Pre Mr President, unfortunately, uh, and for the following reasons, they're not. The uh, real situation is that under the State's Grants Schools Assistance Act of 1988, the Federal Minister for Employment, Education and Training does in fact have responsibility for determining variations to existing prescribed country areas eligible to receive uh, available funding under the Country Areas Program. That uh, is a matter of law. However, this declaration is made on the basis of recommendations received from the State Minister of Education and in New South Wales that is uh, the Honourable Virginia Chadwick. This uh, situation recognises that uh, as State and Territory Governments have the primary responsibility for education 
State education ministries are responsible for the detailed administration of the Commonwealth Country Areas Programme, including, of course, that most basic aspect, the definition of prescribed country areas. I understand that uh, the 1991 variation to the prescribed country areas uh, programme in New South Wales were made following a review of the operation of the programme carried out by the New South Wales Department of School Education in 1990. As a result of this particular review, the boundaries of the prescribed country areas were altered to include the extra 103 additional schools. On Mrs Chadwick's advice, the Federal Minister for Employment, Education and Training declared the prescribed country areas for New South Wales on 9 April 1991, which included those 103 additional schools. And Mr President, Mr Bull's statement uh, that the addition of those schools to the list was at the insistence of the Federal Government is therefore entirely untrue. It is part of a dishonest and divisive campaign which seems to be run by, the, uh, by Mr Bull in New South Wales, dishonest in that the basic element of it is untrue, dishonest also in that uh, he claims that some larger schools have been included and some smaller isolated schools have not because of the action of uh, the federal government. The other aspect of this particular campaign that is, uh, I think, totally objectionable, totally offensive, is that uh, Mr Bull and his correspondence, which, as I say, seems to be part of an orchestrated uh, campaign, is running a very divisive agenda. In the last, uh, second to last paragraph of his correspondence, he says uh, to the local, uh, to this particular person, that uh, the, uh, each region has a committee that allocates CAP funds to the schools depending on submissions put to those committees. He goes on to say in that second to last paragraph, there is no reason why some of the isolated schools on the program cannot still retain all or most of their funding regardless of larger schools coming onto the program. This will be a decision for the local committee. What he is essentially doing is dividing one school in uh, the country against another. And it is totally irresponsible, totally uh, divisive, and totally dishonest. It shouldn't be tolerated. Mr. President, uh, uh, the federal government has uh, provided $3.3 million to New South Wales under this country areas program in 1991. And as we do not run schools, we're happy to leave the detailed administration of the program, including the definition of the prescribed areas, to the state government. However, this sort of dishonesty has to be exposed. This sort of divisiveness has to be rejected. It's unfortunate, uh, may I say, Mr. President, that while the opportunity for uh, greater flexibility in Commonwealth state relations is in fact being fostered by the Special Premier's Conference, these relations are in no way helped by false claims about the Commonwealth's requirements as to our programs. Supplementary. Minister, could he table the uh, papers that he's been quoting from? Well, it's a matter for the Minister. I think it's just the, uh, the one document which is public and is not part of my notes is the letter from uh, Mr. Bull to uh, Mrs. Best, and I'm happy to table that. Senator Boswell. My question is directed to Senator Button as the senior minister responsible for small business. I refer Senator Button to the bankruptcy figures for the year ended 1991, which show bankruptcies have increased from 8,552 last year to 12,991 this year, an increase of 51 per cent. And the corporate insolvencies figures, which show insolvencies increasing from 7,394 in 1990 to 8,567 in 1991, an increase of 15.8 per cent, making a total business insolvencies and bankruptcies 22,267 an increase of 38.9 per cent on last year. Can the minister offer any explanation of why his government, and he in particular, allowed this horrendous situation to happen to the small business and business sec sector? And does he believe his government policies are on track? Order. Well, I'm glad it amuses Order. The, uh, the government, but certainly doesn't amuse the small business people. The Minister representing the Minister for Small Business, Senator Button. Mr President, uh, I uh, acknowledge the fact of the publication of the uh, statistics uh, referred to by Senator Boswell by the Australian Securities Commission. I might say that the practice of publishing these uh, statistics 
has not been a long-standing one. The uh, ASC's initial release of corporate insolvency statistics and its intention to release these figures in the, in the future on an ongoing basis, uh, and both monthly and aggregate quarterly statistics. A regular release of corporate insolvency statistics by the ASC will supplement the release of quarterly personal bankruptcy statistics by my colleague Senator Tate, the Minister for Justice uh, and Consumer Affairs. Senator, of course, uh, I don't take any comfort in the uh, release of these figures which uh, you've referred to. And uh, uh, let me say that I suppose uh, the point of your question is that uh, you seek to uh, uh, implicate the government in terms of all these figures. <laughs> yes, yes, Senator. Um. Order. Anything else? It is a Order. very serious question, Order. On a serious subject, and to have the other side rolling in the aisles during question time. Order, order. Look, I've asked for order three times. This is a fault that occurs on both sides of the chamber, depending on who's listening to the broadcast on different days. And if it continues, well, it is not rubbish. If it continues, I'll take the broadcasting facilities away. Senator Spindler, sorry. Uh, I, I got to the point of, uh, I'd made two points, Senator. This is the first time these statistics have been published by the uh, ASC. Uh, that the other figures on bankruptcies are released by Senator Tate. Uh, the figures are not encouraging in terms of the uh, uh, increase in insolvencies, which are uh, an increase of 20 per cent. Let me make the point that we always have a high level of small business failure of one kind or another in Australia, and uh, that, is undoubtedly, that has undoubtedly increased as a result of the circumstances of the recession. Uh, as the recession recedes, um, I believe that there will be an improvement in those figures, and I certainly hope so. Supplementary, Senator Boswell. I uh, thank the Minister for his understatement, and uh, I'm well aware this is the first time that the uh, Australian Securities Commission has put these figures out, but that wasn't the thrust of my question. My question is, Senator, there's, uh, there's over 22,000 businesses gone broke this year, or last year, and the thrust of my question is, what are you going to do about it? Is there any hope for the future? What message can you give to small business out there, whether they should surrender? Or whether they should keep going and trying to fight out of it. Minister, send a button. Well, Senator, I, uh, I referred in the latter part of my question to my hope and uh, belief that as the uh, recession receded, these figures would improve. And uh, I uh, see that in your supplementary question you seek to make the same point again that you made in the uh, in the. Uh, introductory question. Uh, you asked me whether I should uh, invite a small business to surrender. I never invite anybody to surrender, Senator. I uh, invite people to look to the future uh, with hope, and I did that in the earlier part of my question. Senator Spindler. Thank you, Mr. President. My question without notice is directed to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Button. I refer to the rise in the number of unemployed Australians by another 8,600 to the new high of 840,500 announced today and mentioned earlier in this chamber, and to the statement by the Minister for Employment, Education and Training, Mr Dawkins, that the government was working on measures to create a supportive environment for traded goods and services so that we can encourage an increase in job opportunities in that sector and ask the minister, what are the measures the government is considering, how many jobs will they create, and when will the government introduce them? The minister representing the treasurer, Senator Button. Mr President, those uh, remarks were made by my colleague Mr Dawkins, I think, at 12.30 today, and uh, I've had not, not having uh, foresight about Senator Spindler's question. I try. Uh, I, uh, I haven't uh, discussed with him what he particularly had in mind. But uh, let me say, Senator, that the, uh, uh, the unemployment difficulties and problems which we have at the present time will largely be 
resolved and only ultimately be resolved by uh, wealth creation in the private sector and uh, growth opportunities and employment in the private sector. Um, and, uh, well, I, I'm sorry, Senator, I nearly perked up several times last night, but that had nothing to do with it. Well, that was. Well, I mean, if you're going to have interjections like this in the Senate, I mean, you ought to be ashamed of yourself in opposition coming in here and condoning injections of that, condoning interjections of that kind. I mean, what do you think you are? <coughs> what do you think you are? A sort of disorganised rabble over there, <coughs> the President? It's the, it's, uh, it's disgraceful, uh, Senator. The encouragement of growth and activity in the private sector. Uh, as we come out of the recession is a prime aim of the government. There are a number of uh, methods which uh, can be used to assist with that process and a number of inhibitions, I think, to investment in this country which have to be tackled by governments. And I think Mr Dawkins was probably referring to those. If the government uh, has any uh, methods of removing some of those inhibitions, whether they be in the tax system, in, uh, in the foreign investment uh, arena or in relation to a range of bureaucratic inhibitions which exist in, uh, in relation to investment, then uh, we'll make an announcement about those at the appropriate time, which I hope is as soon as possible, Senator. Supplementary, Senator Spindler. Uh, Mr President, I find the answer of uh, Senator Buttons extremely disappointing. He is representing the Treasurer. The question was, what are the measures that government will take? Mr Dawkins did refer to measures the government will take. Uh, and the question certainly is, what will the government do to encourage private industry and to encourage investment, productive investment uh, and exports? And I believe, uh, uh, Mr. President, the Treasurer uh, and his representative in this well, House- ask, ask the supplementary, Senator yes, Owes it to one million unemployed to indicate when some information on these measures will be available at least. Minister, send about well, Senator, uh, uh, the question did not in fact refer to private industry and one of the sad things about questions from the Democrats is they never do refer to private industry. Uh, and that, no, they don't. Well, what are you interjecting about, Senator Coulter? All you're, you're interested in life is imposing inhibitions on private investment in a whole range of areas. <coughs> and so, uh, right or wrong, Senator Benitza, what are you talking about? Uh, <coughs> And uh, <coughs> the, uh, let, let me say, Senator, that uh, macroeconomic conditions will be uh, prime in terms of determining the investment behaviour of the private sector. And we've been through that discussion in the course of the budget debates and so on. And uh, <coughs> if you're disappointed with my answer, uh, well, all I was saying to you in my answer was watch this space and wait for the next one when the government has uh, appropriate uh, responses to give you. Senator Newman. Thank you, Mr President. My question is also to Senator Button as the minister representing the Prime Minister, Mr Hawke. Can the minister explain why it is that in the 18 months since Mr Hawke told the women of Australia that he was committed to reducing the tragic loss of life of more than 2,300 women each year and the personal anguish associated with breast cancer, only $1 million has been spent on the national program for the early detection of breast cancer instead of the $64 million over three years promised by Mr Hawke at the last election. Is this negligent, tragic lack of urgency over such a life-saving program simply an indication of the Prime Minister's cynical disregard of Australian women until he wants to engage in crass politics to woo their votes at election time? Minister, representing the Prime Minister, Senator Barton. I don't have a, a precise answer to that question, because, uh, uh, but what I anticipate is that uh, uh, some of these uh, programs, Senator, which uh, uh, involve uh, large amounts of expenditure, take some time to gear up. I don't think you can uh, measure the effects and uh, the responses uh, to particular expenditures and say uh, if, we, uh, if we spent uh, $64 million we would achieve this result and if we spend less we will achieve... Yeah, okay, okay. Well, I'm, just, 
I'm, I'm, just, I'm just making the point that my anticipation is uh, that this is a program which, like many others, which has to, has to be geared up. But let me obtain a detailed answer from the Prime Minister's office and uh, provide it to you as soon as possible. Senator Schott. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to uh, Minister, Senator Collins, the Minister for Shipping and Aviation, representing the Minister for Primary Industries and Energy. Can the Minister provide uh, detail about the activities of the Rural Industries Research and Development Corporation and, in particular, its role in providing opportunities for farmers to diversify into alternate enterprises? The Minister representing the Minister for Primary Industries, Senator Collins. Mr. President, uh, the Minister for Primary Industries has provided me with the following response. The Rural Industries Research and Development Corporation commenced operations on 1 July 1990 to support new industries, small industries and the rural industry in general through a broad-based multi-industry program. It also supports the operations of the semi-independent research and development councils associated with well-established but smaller rural industries such as honey, chicken meat, eggs and tobacco. The role of RIRDC is to take a long-term view of the research it funds from the sustainable use and management of Australia's natural resources through to end markets and value adding to Australian products. The release of the five-year research and development plan on 6 August was the culmination of 10 months' work during which some 90 industry and research groups, including the National Farmers Federation, were consulted. Implementation of the plan will see the, com will see the Commission take on an innovative role to stimulate a change in Australia's rural sector. It will be investing in research projects and programs that have the potential to provide a high payoff to small, emerging or new rural industries, which will provide over time the opportunity for existing farmers to diversify their operations. Mr. President, examples of such industries of particular relevance to South Australia are goat fibres, open fodder crops, pasture seeds, wildflowers and native plants. Commonwealth funding stands at $8.36 million for the current year 1991-92, increasing to $15 million in $91 by 1995-96. These funds will be spent in the following areas. Specific industry research and development programs for established industries, for example, pasture seed, oats and fodder crops, rice and sorghum. There will be designed and implemented, these will be designed and implemented to enhance the viability and profitability of these industries, and particular attention will be focused on the creation and expansion of markets, technical skills, ecological sustainability and the development of entrepreneurial capacity. Research and development programs for new and emergent, emergent industries, for example, cashews, coffee, deer, essential oils, goat fibres, spices, herbs and teas, tea tree oil, wildflowers and native plants, new grade and legumes, new tropical fruits, new plant products and new animal products. Mr President, there, there is in fact quite a, uh, a deal uh, of this answer remaining. I think it's far too long to read out. I seek the leave of the Senate to incorporate the remainder of this answer in hand. So His leave granted. There's no objection. Leave is granted. Thank Senator Panizza. The President. My question without notice is to the Minister representing the Treasurer. I ask the Minister why the government, through the Tax Department, discriminates against personnel who work on oil platforms or on fishing trawlers in Australian waters in tax zones A and B and who work there for the appropriate time in contrast with personnel who work on offshore islands belonging to Australia who are allowed their zone rebates. The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Barton. Senator, I, I trust you would understand that uh, though I uh, do read the Adelaide news from time to time, I don't have my fingertips on this issue. Uh, and uh, and uh, I will certainly try and get myself in that position uh, as soon as possible and provide you with an answer. But uh, it, it seems to point to an anomaly, your question, and I will uh, seek an answer from the Treasurer as to whether such an anomaly exists and, if so, whether steps can be taken to rectify it. It might be then regarded as a potential amendment. Senator Foreman. Mr President, uh, my question is directed to Senator Button. Minister for Industry, Technology and Commerce, can the Minister advise what is being done to provide greater protection for small businesses against unfair trading practices? The Minister for Industry, Technology and Commerce, Senator Button. Mr President, the problems of small business are always with us, as Senator Boswell pointed out in an earlier question. Uh, but the issue uh, raised by <coughs> Senator Foreman has been raised repeatedly by the small business sector and a number of inquiries, including the recent parliamentary inquiry into small business in Australia, have recommended action to provide greater access for small business to effective protection 
against unconscionable and unfair trading practices. Mr. President, the government has now decided to extend the principles embodied in Section 52A of the Trade Practices Act, which currently relate to consumers, to all trading and commercial transactions. Thank you, Senator. I can't always say the same about that. But the Senate Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs has been asked by the Attorney General to comment on this proposal and draft legislation which is being prepared to put it into effect. The proposed extension of Section 52A will provide small business with access to the same remedies against unconscionable conduct as are currently available to consumers. The government recognises that this reform will not provide universal protection against unfair trading practices. Complementary measures, including industry-specific measures and self-regulatory codes, may also be necessary to provide protection against potential unfair treatment of small business in particular markets. For example, I have initiated discussions through the Oil Industry Forum of ways in dealing with a range of concerns of this uh, type in the petroleum marketing industry. We've had a series of meetings with the industry and representatives of uh, service station owners and so on to discuss those issues. My colleague Mr Bedell, the Minister for Small Business and Customs, has established a franchising task force which will report in November on a self-regulatory code for the franchising industry. Mr President, uh, of course state governments in, are involved in this and state and Commonwealth ministers responsible for small business have also agreed to examine options for developing common approaches to the regulation of retail and commercial tenancies and improving the protection afforded to small business tenants against unfair dealings. Mr President, these initiatives uh, provide a clear indication of a willingness to address some of these problems, which are generic problems largely for small businesses, and uh, I think it's important that the initiatives be proceeded with as quickly as possible. Senator Watson. Thank you, Mr. President, my question is directed to Senator Tate, representing the Attorney General. I refer to another apparent budget mistake, establishing a new fee structure to be introduced into the Administrative Appeals Tribunal from September 1991, establishing for the first time a setting down fee of $500, in addition to the $300 application fee, with the aim, I quote, extraordinary aim of establishing a more equitable fee structure. Now, can the minister clarify? the conflicting statements between what is in the budget, the Senate estimates information and internal bureaucratic memos. Were the bu budget papers in error, or was it just that the government is now having second thoughts about applying a prohibitive second-tier cost of justice to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal process? Minister for President, Justice, Senator uh, This matter has been dealt with at the Estimates Committee, where, as I recall, it was made clear that the uh, uh, the paragraph in the budget papers where it referred to a $500 setting down fee was referring to courts within the federal system, namely the federal court and the family court, and uh, a, a different uh, setting down fee applied in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Mr uh, President, I believe that that matter was clarified to the satisfaction of senators uh, on the Estimates Committee evening, and uh, there is no uh, difficulty in reconciling the two. Could you then, therefore, supplementary? supplementary. Could you therefore please advise the, the new application fee, together with the setting down fee, that is going to be applicable in cases for AAP, AAT appeals, for example, in taxation cases, uh, appeals, uh, the HEX schemes, customs matters, uh, Australian citizenship applications? Could you give us that information now? Minister, send it to Chairman, I'll uh, provide all that information uh, and set it down in a clear format for Senator Watson uh, as soon as I can. Senator Sherry. Thank you, Mr President. My question uh, is to the Minister for Justice and Consumer Affairs, Senator Tate. What action is the government taking to alleviate growing concern about the accuracy of claims regarding the environmental benefits of a wide range of consumer products? Minister for Justice and Consumer Affairs, Senator Tate. Mr uh, Chairman, I think that uh, most senators would agree that uh, persons these days in an environmentally conscious uh, Australia will be attempting, when they go to the supermarket, for example, if the price of goods is more or less equal, to make a purchase which does the least possible damage to the environment and therefore attracted to those goods which bear some sort of logo which indicates uh, that the, uh, the product if purchased will result in an environmentally friendly uh, purchase. 
Mr. President, uh, it's a difficult matter to judge, in my view, because uh, you may be talking not only of the product, uh, but of the manufacturing or agricultural process which led to the uh, product being available in the marketplace. And of course, there's a question of the uh, wrapping or container in which the product is marketed and how is that disposed of. I think there is some difficulty with uh, making environmentally friendly claims, but nevertheless they are made. And I believe it's extremely important that consumers feel confident that such a claim is not misleading or deceptive. And for that reason, Mr President, the Trade Practices Commission has been provided with substantial funds in this budget to first of all, to first of all provide for a uh, guideline to be issued to manufacturers, retailers and so on, by which they can try to avoid the perils of not complying with those sections of the Trade Practices Act which deal with misleading and deceptive advertising. But secondly, resources will be available to ensure that if a matter is brought to the attention of the Trade Practices Commission, which indicates that uh, a product has been marketed as environmentally friendly when in fact it uh, doesn't measure up, then vigorous action will be taken in the courts to ensure that uh, that uh, non-compliance is dealt with and dealt with by way of uh, a court action resulting in substantial fines, up to $20,000 for individuals, $100,000 for corporations. Mr President, I think that uh, all would agree that where you have misleading claims made in relation to these questions where people can exercise their power in the marketplace to, uh, to ensure that their purchasing is in harmony with their uh, desire to undertake an environmentally friendly uh, decision, then I believe that we do need to ensure that the Trade Practices Commission has the power and the capacity to uh, ensure that those claims which are misleading or deceptive are dealt with by the courts. And I ask that further questions be placed on that. Senator Richardson. Uh, Mr President, I asked a question from Senator Campbell on Tuesday regarding funding for the Australian Olympic team in 1992. I said that I'd inquire as to where administration savings could be made by the Sports Commission to make up the additional $1.5 million to be provided to the Australian Olympic team for outfitting and transport. I should refer to one point made by Senator Campbell in his question, that is to the fact that the Sports Commission had rejected the Minister's request to make up this additional funding for transport and outfitting of the team. The Sports Commission did not reject the Minister's request. The normal process of consultation had taken place between the Minister and the Sports Commission, and as a result of this consultation, the Commission made a decision at its 26th of August board meeting to reconsider the matter again at its forthcoming October meeting. As is almost a year before the Olympic team departs, there is no urgency in this matter. I am informed that the Executive Director is looking at the various options which will be put to the next meeting of the Sports Commission Board in mid-October. This is, of course, the proper procedure, and the Board will make the decision in the light of the information available to them. But I stress that the commitment has been made to provide the additional $1.5 million for transport and outfitting of the teams, and that there was never any doubt that this funding would be provided. Senator Short. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, in accordance with the resolutions and orders of the Senate, uh, I ask uh, Senator Button, uh, to whom I've given notice of this, uh, uh, to provide me with a satisfactory explanation of the reasons for his failure to provide answers to the following questions from me, which have been on the notice paper for more than 30 days. Question number, uh, questions number. Uh, 600, 604, 622, 640 and 658, on which notice was given on the 19th of April, and uh, question 1090, on which notice was given on the 31st of July. The Minister, Senator Button. Mr President, Senator Short spoke to me about this matter a minute ago, and I clearly can't give him a satisfactory explanation at this point in time, but I will do so as quickly as possible. Order. Before I put the question for the adjournment, I advise honourable senators that Estimates Committee D will meet in Committee Room 2S3, Estimates Committee E will meet in Committee Room 2S1, and Estimates Committee F will meet in the main committee room at the, at the conclusion of the adjournment debate. Estimates Committee E will be televised on Channel 2, and Estimates Committee F will be televised on Channel 22. Order. Pursuant to the order of the 11th of September, I now put the question that the Senate do now adjourn. Senator Bowen. Mr President, uh, today's appalling youth unemployment figures have generated uh, a new style of creating a creative accounting by uh, Senator Button, who somehow has sought to demonstrate to the Chamber 
that a 29 per cent unemployment rate, the worst uh, recorded in Australia, it may have been worse during the Depression, but uh, we don't know what the figures actually are, is somehow inconsequential because uh, uh, he has uh, established what proportion of the total population that is. Now, if Senator Button applied the same criteria to uh, the unemployment rate uh, of people uh, over 65, uh, he would also get a quaint figure. In other words, uh, the criteria he's using is an absolute nonsense. And I want to demonstrate just how bad the real unemployment figures are, because they are far worse than the 29 per cent that Senator Button pretends doesn't exist. Now, uh, just mention to uh, the Senator Button that his government has instituted a procedure which enables uh, young people uh, aged between 15 and 19 to stay at school. And I must say I commend uh, uh, aspects of that program because it gives many young people an opportunity to uh, Im improve their options. However, a very large proportion of those people are being paid to get out of the dole queues. And when you uh, have a look at the disappearing jobs for young people, you see exactly how many people really are in those unemployment, uh, how many young people really are unemployed around Australia. But let's get a feeling of size about this paying people to stay out of the dole queues. There were 100,000 uh, odd uh, young persons receiving unemployment benefit uh, uh, of one kind or another, that's under the age of 20. Uh, in, uh, in July, about 100,000. The average number between January and May of this year receiving OS study, that's 15 to 19 year olds receiving OS study, was 241,000, two and a half times as many. Now, I will concede that a large number of them are people who would, in fact, have sought OS study anyway, but surely Senator Button must concede that a large proportion of those 241,000 young Australians are back at school because they could not get a job. And the, that's easily demonstrated, that's easily demonstrated, uh, easily demonstrated by the fact that the, uh, the increase, there was in fact an increase in youth employment. There was an increase in youth employment in recent years from the uh, depths of the recession. It went up from about 410,000 to 430,000 a couple of years ago, and then suddenly collapsed. And it's this collapse of the last two years where people who can't find jobs have been paid to go back to school that hides the real impact of youth unemployment. And the figures are there, they're evident, and any nonsense that, uh, that Senator Button comes out with cannot hide the reality. The figures are there. And we can see it because uh, uh, the collapse in the last couple of years of young Australians holding jobs indicates this huge level of hidden unemployment because the job losses have not been offset or not been accounted for by anything like matching increases in unemployment. On the contrary, there's been a loss of 152,000 young jobs, young people's jobs, in the last two years. And this has resulted only in a rise of about one quarter of that in the unemployment level, which has gone up by about 40,000 uh, instead of the 152,000 job losses. Now, where are the other 112,000 young Australians who simply disappeared out of the uh, unemployment figures? There has been a fall in the uh, 15 to 19 year old population of something like 50,000 over that time. But this st still leaves more than 60,000 young Australians unaccounted for, even or particularly by Senator Button's creative accounting. I mean, he's only dealing with people, so maybe Senator Button doesn't take it too seriously. For the bulk, the, the bulk of which of these 62,000 either returned to school funded by Ausstudy as an alternative to joining the unemployment queues or simply withdrew from the workforce because the young people's participation rate has collapsed. It's down to from over 60 per cent to around about 52 or 53 per cent. Now if in fact my analysis is correct, which the numbers clearly indicate it is, then the real full-time youth unemployment level 
is probably around 190,000 in Australia, which gives an appalling unemployment rate of, ju of just under 40 per cent for those seeking full-time work. But on top of this, there's the clear evidence of mounting underemployment as the proportion of total youth workforce made up of full-time employees has slumped over the past decade from 68 per cent to only 41 per cent, while part-time workers have more than doubled from 17 per cent to 37 per cent, as 236,000 full-time youth jobs have disappeared, 70 per cent of these in the last two years, to be only partly replaced by 137,000 extra part-time jobs. The reality is, and nothing Senator Button says can escape this fact, is that there has never been, since the Great Depression, such a bleak outlook for employment for young Australians as part of this engineered recession. And the problem is that this government does not know what the level of youth unemployment is going to reach, what uh, the, the actual total of youth unemployed is going to reach. We have asked over and over again in this chamber what the budget figures, which indicate a 10 and 3 quarter per cent total unemployment rate will be uh, in this budget, it will reach. We have yet to find out what this government is budgeting for in terms of youth unemployment. We presume they know and simply don't want to tell us because the figures would be so horrific, although I suppose there is a prospect that they simply don't know. And I fear that may be the situation because clearly they have yet to work out how to resolve the disastrous uh, recession that they deliberately engineered and the disastrous impact on unemployment, not simply youth unemployment, but total unemployment in Australia, which has now reached once again a dismal record. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I want to speak briefly on the adjournment debate this afternoon to highlight the situation in my state with respect to uh, pe persons unemployed and, and especially young Australians unemployed. And I can do that by reference in the first instance to some job start and new start allowance figures. We already know that Australia-wide the number of recipients of the job search allowances and new start allowances in August increased 1.2% doesn't sound much, but as we frequently have to repeat, repeat in this place, it doesn't matter what the percentage of unemployment is. If you're unemployed, you're 100 per cent unemployed. Um, the, the number of recipients on these allowances increased in August by 1.2 per cent, and to turn that into how many people we're talking about, Minister, it's 8,126 more people needing those allowances. So in, in this instance, I'm not referring to the people who are staying at school because they can't get a job. Not addressing that question at this time, simply that there are 8, 000, over 8,000 more people this month uh, on various allowances who, who no doubt don't want to be and would much rather uh, have a job. All states except Queensland recorded increases in these figures, with Victoria and my state, South Australia, recording the biggest increases. And my state was only pipped at the post for the, for the uh, shameful honour of coming last by Victoria. We had a 1.9 per cent increase, and Victoria, a state managed by a Labor government as well as my state, a 2.1 per cent increase. Interest interestingly, in one of the DSS offices in my state, that is the Murray Bridge office, they increased an 8.5 per cent jump on July's figures. Now, I know that that doesn't take into account seasonal adjust adjustments. It doesn't satisfy a lot of economists. And there are times, at times of the year when a jump from one month to another uh, can create a difficulty. But it does at least tell you, in plain figures, how many people there were one month and how there are uh, this month. And those people are real people out there uh, looking uh, for work and not being able uh, to find it. I understand as well that there are some differences in between, between who would have been considered have, as having been on unemployment benefit last year and who is now considered to be on the job search allowance and the new start allowance. But given those differences, the number of Australians uh, in inverted commas on the dole, if you want to put it in the old-fashioned terminology, has increased by 2, 262,393 people since August last year. 
That is a 58.6 per cent increase in one year. In my state, South Australia, the figure has jumped by 20,179 people from August last year. In my state, South Australia, that represents a 45.9 per cent increase in one year. Let me turn uh, uh, briefly to some figures in relation to um, uh, uh, unemployment and unemployment rates, because they can be instructive too. You can look on the one hand as to who's collecting an allowance for some sort of uh, new start or training, but also uh, a look at the uh, uh, other figures as well. And I see that in August 1990, uh, in my state, uh, there was an unemployment rate of 8 per cent, and I see in August 1991 that unemployment rate is now 10.3 per cent, a shifting to give us 583,000 unemployed last year and 700, must be 73,500 uh, unemployed this year. A shift from 58,300 to 73,500. That's thousands and thousands more people out of work, looking for a job, unable to get a job. It's a disastrous situation. This situation is compounded very dramatically when you look at the situation for young Australians uh, in my state. Aged uh, 15 to 19 is a particular category that deserves uh, a, a recognition. In August 1990, there were 21,500 young Australians in the 15 to 19 ca category uh, looking for full-time work in my state, 21,500 of them. This year, in August 1991, there's 27,800. It's a disastrous situation. Over 6,000 more people, 15 to 19, unemployed and looking for full-time work. Now, I remember, Mr Acting Deputy President, not long after I came into this place, this government said it would fix this problem. It introduced the traineeship scheme. We had the Prime Minister, who I got into enormous trouble calling the silver budgie, on television advertising himself saying in our bicentennial year there would be 75,000 traineeships per annum, per annum, and that's just been forgotten, not only by the media, but, but, but forgotten by people from, from your party, Mr Acting Deputy President, a promise for 75,000 traineeships for young Australians, the people I'm talking about now, 15 to 19-year-olds. And we've shifted from last year 21,500 of them in my state looking for a job, and this year 27,800 looking for a job. And we still have ministers come in here daily and tell us they're pulling the right levers on the economic wheels. It is just an embarrassment. Senator Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I won't delay the Senate for too long because I know we're all very, very keen to return to estimates committees. And um, I just wanted to make some comments about the effects of unemployment in my home state of Western Australia, and some, particularly with some pertinent comments about young Australians. And I see the galleries. They obviously knew that Senator Bowman, Senator Vanstone, and Senator Campbell and Senator Patterson were going to say something today because the galleries are full today of young Australians, and I welcome them all here today. But it must be very, very trite, I guess, for young people and uh, particularly young unemployed to hear politicians going on about the unemployment rate. And of course, oppositions will always. Mr Acting Deputy President, focus on the unemployment rate. And one, I guess, if you, one was cynical, could say that it is a cheap, cynical and political trick, but it's not. Politicians must focus on this national disaster, this one million or nearly one million people unemployed. And as Senator Bohm said before me, we have something like 152,000 young Australians who have just lost. The, uh, even the figures don't show where they've gone. The long-term unemployment problem in Western Australia is my state's biggest problem, and it is clearly the result of some of the policies of this federal government and some of the policies of the Lawrence, Burke and Dowding Labor governments in Western Australia. There are now over 38,000 people in Western Australia who have not worked for more than six months. This is, of course, a very serious problem, because when you're out of work for that long, you start to lose self-esteem, you start to lose confidence and you start to lose any faith in the future and, indeed, any faith in the very fabric of our society. It was only a few weeks ago that I visited a YMCA shelter for street kids down in a, a suburb called Kelmscott, where I spoke to young 
uh, 14, 15, 16-year-olds who spend their days at the shelter playing pool, playing ping-pong and basically keeping out of trouble. But these kids told me about the amphetamine problem in Perth, the fact that people steal videos, they steal cars, they steal television sets, radios, jewellery, purses, whatever they can do to uh, go into Northbridge around the nightclub districts and trade these goods for amphetamines. And they knock themselves out for a day or two at a time and then recover for a day or two. And I asked one of these young chaps, do you want to get a job? What's your ambition in life? And he said, yes, I'd like to be a carpenter. And another one said, yes, I'd like to be a motorbike mechanic. And I said, well, that's great. And what uh, do you want to do? When, you know, what's your longer term ambition once you've sort of got a job? And he said, well, if I got a job, I wouldn't have to go around pinching videos. At least I'd be able to use my money to buy the amphetamines. And I use that terribly sad example of youth in Kelmscott in the Federal Electorate of Canning, just down the road from my office, to show that there is a new culture in Australia when you have a million people unemployed and hundreds of thousands of young unemployed and hundreds of thousands of long-term unemployed, then you build a new culture where people just don't look forward to having a job. They don't know what it means. They don't know what family life means. They don't know what it's like to look forward to owning a house, to settling down and having what most of us are lucky enough to call a relatively normal life. And this is all after eight years of a so-called compassionate Labor government, a government that's supposed to stick up for the rights of the, uh, the less, less well-off in this community. I want to conclude by going through some of the more appalling statistics close to uh, in, in some of the worst areas in Western Australia. There have, in the last 12 months, figures released today show massive increases in unemployment in some specific areas in Western Australia. Albany, a regional town on the south coast of Western Australia, had a 78 per cent increase in its unemployment rate or the number of people registered to receive unemployment benefits in the last 12 months. In Aloo, in the federal electorate of Stirling, represented by Ron Edwards, who won the seat at the last election by some 100 votes, and I wonder how many of those people reckon they really stuffed up when they stuck the, uh, the number one in the box at the last, uh, on the ballot paper only 18 months ago. But in Inaloo, right in the middle of Mr Edwards' seat, there's been a 73 per cent increase in the number of people registered to receive unemployment benefits. And I bet a lot of those people stuck at number one in Mr Edwards' box last time and regretted they did it. In Gosnells, in Gosnells at the unemployment office there, just a couple of miles down the road from my office, Mr George Gears, electorate of Canning, right in the middle of it, a 75 per cent increase in the past 12 months. And as Senator Vanstone said uh, before me, these are all, they're not just plain numbers that politicians like to focus on sometimes be it in uh, elections or be it in uh, bodies on the unemployment scrap heap, but these are all represent people. And as Amanda said, as Senator Vanstone said, when uh, you're unemployed, it doesn't matter whether the rate's 10 per cent, 11 per cent or 12 per cent, when you're unemployed, you're 100 per cent unemployed. This uh, requires the earnest appreciation of politicians on both sides of the political fence. It requires policy measures that clearly this government has shown an inability to implement. It requires courage. It requires focusing on achieving economic growth for Australia so that we can rebuild hope for all of these Australians, and particularly Western Australians, who find themselves in the horrible position of being unemployed with little hope of finding employment. Senator Patterson. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. I wish to rise to speak on this adjournment debate and also not to take up the time of the Senate too much as we all have to get back to estimates, but to uh, support my colleagues in what they have been saying about the unemployment figures and also to address the issues as they particularly affect the state which I represent, the state of Victoria. If we look at the figures overall for Australia, we see that there are nearly a million Australians out of work, that the unemployment rate has risen by about in fact, one third from 7.3 per cent to 9.8 per cent in the last 12 months. And one of the most concerning rises has been the rise from 20 per cent to 29 per cent in youth unemployment. And as Senator uh, Campbell said, the young people who are currently here in the galleries are the ones whose hopes are being dashed as they see their friends who've left school not being able to get jobs. And as that figure rises, there'll be more and more of them who can't get jobs. In uh, August of this year, there were 709,800 people receiving job search allowance or New Start, 
and let the public not be deceived by the dressing up of the dole or unemployment benefits with its new names, what that represents is 709,800 people receiving a benefit because they haven't got a job. This is a record high figure and an 8,100 8, increase on last, last year, month's record high figure. But let me concentrate on Victoria because Victoria is winning the doldrum stakes. We're renowned in Victoria for races, the Caulfield Cup, the Melbourne Cup, and now we've, we're winning the doldrum stakes. And I regret that. I regret that because a Labor government in Victoria and a Labor government federally has brought my state to its knees. Only today in the age I was reading about a small town, Rochester, where people have been thrown out of work by factories closing down as a result of this government's policies. In Victoria, there are 224,300 looking for work, which represents 10.2 per cent of the population. One in ten people are looking for a job. A year ago, in August 1990, there were 147,100 Victorians looking for work. There are 120,000 more Victorians looking for work now than this time last year. And what are we winning the stakes? Unfortunately, in youth unemployment, Victoria heads the, team, heads the, the, the states. Youth unemployment is now over 30 per cent, with 30.4 per cent of young people aged 15 to 19 years looking for full-time work, compared with 19.3 per cent this time last year. Only a few months ago, I was sitting with a group of young people in Shepparton, a group of young, uh, uh, in a, gr a group of young people in a youth organisation. I visited their meeting. I sat with them, and the thing that they were most concerned about was the fact that they would not be able to get a job. There were no jobs for them in Shepparton, and they would, if, even if they left and came to the city, there wouldn't be a job for them. They live, unlike those of us who grew up in the baby boom, where the world was our oyster, they live with this constant threat. When they're studying at school, what, how does that affect their, their ambition and their enthusiasm for, for studying when they think, will I get a job at the end? That's the legacy this government's left for those young people. No hope of a job for one third of them. In uh, August of this year, there were 179,600 people receiving this newly named unemployment benefit job search allowance or New Start. This was an increase of 3,860 on the previous month, the largest increase in any state. So we're leading the stakes in youth unemployment and we're leading the stakes in the increase in number of the people on unemployment benefits. In August 1990, there were 87,000 people in Victoria receiving the dole. This means that the number of Victorian beneficiaries has more than doubled in 12 months. Now, I'm particularly interested, Mr Acting Deputy President, in the southeastern suburbs of Melbourne because that's where I've relocated my office in order to better, uh, so people can better have access to a senator in that area. And it's been very interesting as I've focused my attention on there because it is the unemployment capital of Australia. In 12 months, the number of people on unemployment benefits from the seven social security offices in the southeastern Melbourne offices, which surround my office, have increased from 14,000 to 36,130, or 14,770 to 36,000. In this area, there are two and a half times as many people on the dole this year than there were last year. Two and a half times as many people. For every four people who are unemployed in August last year, there are 10 this year. Let me give you an example. Mr Duffy and the Senator Campbell said those people who put their tick in the box number one for Mr Duffy may have wished they hadn't done this. In July last year, there were 3,500 people registered at the Dandenong Social Security Office. This is about average for a Social Security regional office. By July this year, the number of unemployment beneficiaries had risen to over 9,000, and Dandenong had become the second busiest Social Security office in the country. This month, and I looked at the figures and it had gone down, and I thought, something's happened. Yes, something has happened. They've opened a new social security office in Fountaingate. So the only people getting employment are social security officers. So the best thing for my advice to people in Dandenong is to get themselves into the social security for a job, working there, because it seems that's where the expansion is, in Knox, an area where I spent quite a good deal of time before Mr Peter Nugent won that seat and now ably represents it. In August last year, there were 1,298 people registered at the Knox social security office. By August this year, 3,826 people. 
In the, in the other five other offices, Springvale, Oakley, Frankston, Cheltenham and Caulfield, many of those offices covered by Hotham, and again the people who ticked the box for Mr Crean might regret the fact that they did that, the situation is only marginally better. In all these offices, the number of unemployment benefit recipients has more than doubled, and in the cases of Oakley and Cheltenham, the numbers have virtually tripled over the last 12 months. Now, we can become blasé about these figures and forget that there are real people behind them. Only the other day in my office there was a man who has run his own business for 20 years selling um, commercial washing machines, and his wife, and he employs one person, a solid citizen of Australia, running a small business employing three people. He was in my office in tears because he couldn't pay his telephone bill. And to see a man of integrity and a man who's provided for himself for 20 years in tears because he can't pay his telephone bill and they'd cut it off and this was a lifeblood for his business makes you realise the real tragedy behind unemployment, the real tragedy behind each of those figures. And each one of those numbers represents an individual who has a story to tell about how they're on the scrap heap as a result of this government's policy. This government is downright self-centred and it's been so focused on its leadership uh, squabbles, the Hawke-Keating leadership struggle. It knows full well what sort of uh, problems it's causing and what sort of policy paralysis it's causing. and We can see that even today, in, in this week, in the amount of legislation coming through this place. They're so focused on their leadership struggles, they're not concentrating on legislation and they're not concentrating on doing something about turning Australia around and reducing the unemployment levels that they're producing by the recession we had to have and now the unemployment levels we had to have. Senator Tierney. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy Chairman. The government can't take any joy at all from the figures released today. In my own state of New South Wales, 9.2 per cent of people are unemployed. This happens to be the lowest in, a, for, this happens to be the lowest in Australia. But the Australian figure overall is at 9.8 per cent, which is at an incredibly high level. If we have a look at some of the reasons for this, and if we have a look at particularly the way in which it's changed recently, we can't really take, give much credence to Mr Dawkins for some of the things he said about the rate slowing. Because if we go behind the figures, we'll discover, for example, that in August there was a census collection. 38,000 temporary staff were hired to collect the census. 11,000 of these people didn't have jobs in July and reported that their only employer in August was the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the August the census collector. Thank you. Therefore, there's a distortion of about 11,000 in the unemployment statistics for August. And if you discount these people, you'll find that 850,000 people didn't have a job at the end of August, which is 9.9 per cent of the workforce, not the 9.8 per cent that is claimed by the minister. The number of Australians on the dole in August rose by 8,000 to 709,000, and in my own area in the Hunter, 35,000 people are on the dole, which is a rise of 36 per cent since August last year. I seek leave to incorporate in Hansard a table showing the beneficiaries of unemployment payment in the Hunter region for August 1991 compared to August 1990. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I thank the Senate. In the Hunter in the last year, 17,000 people have lost their jobs. The unemployment rate in the Hunter today has risen from 9.9 per cent a year ago to 11.1 per cent. And if you think that's bad enough, think about the rate for the young people. A year ago, 16,500 were in full-time employment. Today, only 9,500 are in full-time employment. 7,000 of them have lost their jobs. 7,000. But saddest of all, with the with the young is to look at the figures of the participation rates. A year ago, 64.5 per cent of young people were in the workforce. 
and today the figure has dropped to 57 per cent. The great burden of the unemployed visited upon Australia by the recession has fallen on young people and just when productive, wealth-creating working lives are supposed to begin, employers have no choice but to put up the shutters. And what's the government doing about this appalling situation? They say they're worried and concerned, but are they genuinely worried and concerned about 850,000 people out of work? And that, I'd remind the government, is 850,000 votes they could lose at the next election. The Prime Minister claims that the present level of unemployment is totally unacceptable as anything like a permanent feature of our society. He says it is no part of our policy to allow it to continue. Yes, but why did they let it begin? It was this Labor government policy that put 850,000 people out of work by engineering a recession that they said we had to have. Because the government has no answers, the Prime Minister has promised the ACTU that it will consider a union proposal to relieve Australia's high unemployment rate. The ACTU charter aims at creating an extra 125,000 jobs a year. And why has the Prime Minister given an undertaking to the ACTU to look at their employment proposals? The reason is because the ACTU has warned Mr Hawke that to change job policy now or to lose his job. Martin Ferguson, the ACTU president, does not hesitate to blame the government. We do not meekly, he says this, we do not meekly accept the consequences of policies that have produced the current level of unemployment. No section of the community will be more vigilant in ensuring that the federal Labor government keeps its undertakings, that the economy recovers, will restore, sustain growth and secure employment. <coughs> also Bill Kelty, Secretary of the ACTU, Australian workers and their unions could bear no blame for the unemployment problem after making substantial sacrifices under the prices and income accord. The federal government, they say, should adopt a more expansive economic approach, balance growth and continued low inflation. Other comments by Labor supporters who are obviously worried about losing or holding onto their seats or to holding onto the union power that they do have have been made recently. John Halfpenny has said, Labor will be forced out of office if it does not tackle this crisis. A Labor backbencher, Laurie Ferguson, unemployment is finally getting the attention of the ACTU and ministers. I think it's pretty pleasing that Bill Kelty and John Button have come out of their sleepy hollows. It's late in the day, but I'm pleased that they have both come out in support. I don't think there's any argument that over the last few years more help would have been required for employment. This is a Labor government which is not offering any hope to its own members at the, work, at the next election, but worst of all, it's not hope offering any hope to 850,000 people out of work in Australia today. Uh, Senator O'Chee. Senator Acting Deputy President, there may be around the corridors of the Labor Party in Queensland a certain degree of backslapping today, because they may be deluding themselves into believing that the slight improvement in the unemployment situation in Queensland is a cause for celebration. Amongst the unemployed of Queensland, however, the last 12 months on the unemployment treadmill have been no cause for celebration and are in fact a cause for condemnation of this government, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I draw the attention of the Senate today to the 12-month change in unemployment in my home state of Queensland, and it tells a chilling tale of despair and desperation for thousands upon thousands of good, hard-working Australians who, try as they might, are incapable of finding a job in the recession that this government, through its ignorance and folly, has imposed upon them. For example, in Cairns, in, in August last year, at the start of the recession, there were 3,599 people unemployed. What is the figure this year? In August this year, the number of people receiving unemployment benefits in Cairns 
is 4,974. That means, Madam Acting Deputy President, there are another 1,375 people, a 38 per cent increase in the number of people in Cairns receiving unemployment benefits from just 12 months ago. A 38 per cent increase. A 38 per cent increase is a sign of what this government has done. But it's not limited to Cairns. The experience in Cairns is typical of what is happening across many towns in regional Queensland, and that causes me, as I'm sure all honourable senators on this side of the chamber, a great deal of concern. I won't go into the detailed figures, but just the percentage increases in some selected towns gives a good example of how badly this recession is hurting people, real people and real families. In Mackay, unemployment up 43 per cent. Mount Isa up 28 per cent. I was in Mount Isa about a week and a half ago. I was told that the figure would probably be worse but for the fact some 50 to 60 people leave Mount Isa every week and don't come back because there's no work there for them. In Rockhampton up 20 per cent on last year. Townsville up 28 per cent and Toowoomba up 39 per cent on last year's unemployment. Madam Acting Deputy President, this isn't an exercise in numbers and an economic formula and statistics. This is a measurement of a tragedy, a measurement of a tragedy not just for towns, for states, but for this whole nation. And I would like to close by addressing, as many of my colleagues on this side of the chamber have done, the grave tale of unemployment as told amongst the young people of this nation, because it is the people of my generation who suffer most from unemployment. It is the young people who go to leave school this year, like my brother does, who bear most the crooked and twisted tragedy of an unemployment Exactly, Senator Brownhill. They do want a future and they don't have any chance of a future under this government. And so I close, Madam Acting Deputy President, by referring to the, uh, the youth unemployment figures in Queensland. And what we have seen in the 12 months since last year, what we have seen in the 12 months since last year is a massive increase in youth unemployment in Queensland, from 20 per cent in August 1990 to 29 per cent of people aged 15 to 19 in August this year. An increase which means that in many towns in regional Queensland where unemployment is concentrated highest, over one in three young Australians aged 15 to 19 who is looking for a job can't find one. And heaven help us, in January or February next year, when all of those school leavers like my brother start looking for a job, heaven help us what the youth unemployment rate will be then. I can only say that these figures released today show more than anything else the desperate need for this government to change its economic policies and once again give hope and opportunity to young Australians and to Queenslanders in particular. Thank you, Senator Ochi. I call Senator Calvert. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's certainly no pleasure for me to stand in this place today and talk on this very depressing debate. And it is depressing because, uh, as other speakers have said, we've got a situation where we've got 850,000 people unemployed, an unemployment rate seasonally adjusted at 9.8 per cent and a future for the young children of our country that have been here in droves today that uh, at, the least we can, at the best we can say is uncertain. And whilst we stand in this place and talk and talk and talk, the people of Australia are in despair, Madam Acting Deputy President, because they don't know what's going to happen. And whilst the government are spending their time trying to sort out their leadership problems, and whilst they are concerned about who, which faction is winning and which faction is not winning, time is passing and uh, more and more people are becoming unemployed. And if ever, ne ever, ever Australia needed leadership uh, 
Madam Acting Deputy President, is right now. And I believe that uh, the House side of politics does have that leadership and it does have um, the wherewithal and the policies to, to reverse this terrible trend we've got in our country. <clears throat> when I look at my own state of Tasmania, I can understand what happens when you've got leadership that's not uh, pulling together. We've got the situation in Tasmania where we had a, a, great, a green Labor accord. Um, the Greens are keeping the minority Labor government in power at the moment. And in some ways I feel sorry for the Premier down there, Mr Field, because whatever he tries to do, whatever he tries to do, whatever it is, he's always got the spectre of the Greens hanging over his head. And uh, not a day goes past when you pick up our newspaper and, and, and see the, where the Greens are changing their mind on, on uh, resource security legislation. And uh, it must be terribly frustrating for anybody, let alone a minority Labor government, to be able to try to, to give a bit of leadership in our state. Now we have the dubious honour in Tasmania, the dubious honour of having the highest unemployment rate in, in Australia. 11.8% in seasonally adjusted terms. We've got 12.3% of our male workforce unemployed. We've got 11% of our female workforce unemployed. And when you look at our young people, we see today that uh, our age group, 15 to 19 years of age, 30.7% of those poor, unfortunate young people who have been trying to find work uh, just can't get it. We have uh, 25,900 people in Tasmania out of our reasonably small population uh, looking for work, a difference of 2,400 from this time last year. As I said, it's bad enough um, the businesses and the people of Tasmania having to put up with the deliberately engineered recession that the former Treasurer foisted upon us, but I believe the the reason for that extra percentage of um, unemployed in Tasmania, which is far and above any, anything else in Australia, has been caused by the, the failed and, and uh, disruptive effect that the Greens are having in our state. And I'm not the only one that says that. Even today I pick up the, the examiner and uh, um, one of the leading editorial writers um, has said uh, that it's about time uh, he's cri very critical of the Greens and Dr Brown because he keeps on changing the goalposts. And we know that because whenever they get, whatever they look for they get and as soon as they get it they change the goal goalposts and go for locking up more of our resources. And he says here, time and, time and again the Greens, whether by accident or by design, give the impression that development is not only bad but unnecessary. And he goes on to talk about the latest decision they've made. Uh, to back away from supporting the government and, and causing uncertainty in our state once again. And whilst this uncertainty is happening, business, businesses aren't, uh, aren't working. We, we see the, um, the mining, the Tasmanian Chamber of Mines saying uh, that the uh, negative signals given by government and, and, and the Greens are included in that and are the main reason for it happening, that they say that these have combined to make investors feel at best uncertain or at worst unwelcome. It's a tragedy that uh, in my state of Tasmania not only we have, have we have these, do we have these high unemployment f figures, but we have a government, a minority government, that has been continually frustrated by the Green movement. And I just hope, I'm sorry that Senator Bell's not in the House here today, but there's been some talk about the Australian Democrats and the Greens getting together. I just hope, as a Tasmanian who knows what's happening in our state, that he opposes that, because if the Australian Democrats uh, join the Green Movement in, in Tasmania, or well, quite frankly, Mr Deputy President, I think they've got rocks in their head. Senator Brownhill. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. Uh, on the adjournment this afternoon, I don't want to hold the Senate up for any longer than what I have to, but I can't uh, go away from this place in the next few weeks without saying uh, a few words about the problems associated with country New South Wales and our commuter airlines. And, uh, I think honourable senators would be, as the Minister for Aviation is, very aware of my continued interest in this particular subject and the wider issue of Kingsford Smith uh, Airport. 
I have given some seven notices of motion on the subject and have raised this matter in no less than 13 times in the past three years. I have also issued several media releases on the subject and have given countless radio interviews. Indeed, this session alone I have asked two questions of the minister regarding the problems associated with the third runway at, at Kingsford Smith Airport, peak period uh, landing charges and the problems that that has caused to commuter services in New South Wales. I have also presented more petitions on the question of peak period surcharges and the third runway for Mascot than any other senator. And the tens of thousands of signatories to those petitions representing the majority country people who absolutely depend on flights to Sydney to conduct business, provided access to specialist health services and to visit uh, families in the, in the city. And for two years now, the debate as to whether Sydney Airport needs a third runway has dragged on, and the genuine needs of air travellers have been overridden by sordid little factional squabbles in an effort to save Labor Party seats around, uh, around Mascot. And to keep the uh, story brief, uh, Mr Deputy President, uh, I have been hounding the minister over the third runway issue and also the question of peak period surcharges. I was concerned then and remain concerned now that the viability of commuter aircraft and the viability of country centres they service was at risk if inefficiencies uh, were not, or efficiency were not, or the inefficiencies remained at, at uh, Kingsford Smith Airport and inefficiency, uh, the efficiencies were not put in place uh, there uh, because uh, such efficiency, of course, include the third runway as a matter of urgency. And that's what I said I've been absolutely been pushing for that for some time. I was assured when I raised the matter in February and again in April of this year that the review of the three-month trial period for peak scheduling would be completed by the end of May. But he assured me at that time, the minister, uh, it was not designed as a revenue raiser but merely as a regulator. Well, it has certainly been an effective uh, traffic regulator because uh, last week Hazelden Services, Hazelden Airlines announced it would cease services to 14 country centres of New South Wales. And it cited the peak period surcharge as one of the reasons that those routes had become unviable. Now, not surprisingly, uh, the minister would not concede that the charges had uh, caused uh, bigger problems than already had been there or caused any more difficulties. He did accept, however, that Hazelden this year alone would have to pay $4.2 million in government imposts, uh, and that for an airline the size of Hazelden's, uh, I believe, believe, is an excessive amount of money to be absorbed and passed on in charges. Now, the charges, and this I take the minister up on one of the answers he gave to me the other day, uh, when he said that there was only something like $1.34, I think were the exact figures that he mentioned, uh, per passenger extra because of the uh, government imposed charges, uh, I would like to tell him that in the morning the Hazeldens had to put on $25 extra per ticket and in the afternoon something like $22 extra per ticket at night, working on a 60 odd percent, percent loading. So obviously his figures were a little bit. Uh, wrong and out of kilter to the problem it was causing to the airline. The, uh, they've increased over the last five years, of course, to such a degree that uh, in uh, 1986 government charges represented something like 2 per cent of an average passenger ticket, and today they're representing 17.6 per cent uh, or more of an average passenger ticket. So I ask my uh, colleagues here in this place and anywhere in Australia, how can a business cope with increases of that magnitude and still give the services that Hazelden has? And might I just uh, divert a moment, uh, Mr. Deputy President, and say Hazelden have been one of the top country airlines in Australia. They have been a privately owned airline that's gradually built their way up, and I think that now to think that they've had to move away from those 14 airports where they were servicing, albeit they've been replaced in some of them by other people. I think is a great uh, discredit to this government. And the peak period surcharge, uh, I believe, has been one of the big problems. It's been inequitable. And Hazelden's, of course, using their eight to 16-seater plane, pay the same 
peak period surcharge as a jumbo jet with 300 passengers. And obviously that must have some bearing on their viability, and for the minister to suggest otherwise, I believe is absolutely absurd. The federal government demonstrates regularly that it cares uh, little for rural Australia and is not prepared to give any sympathetic consideration to the special needs of country commuters. And uh, I think, uh, uh, Mr Parliamentary Secretary, I think that that's something I would like to you in your common sense way to tell your government uh, some of the problems that you are causing to uh, country people. And obviously any country town that, uh, that can boast direct daily flights to Sydney can attract companies looking for decentralisation opportunities or indeed governments and other public instrumentalities wanting to locate a particular regional headquarters or a service in that country town. And if you haven't got regular services going down in the morning and coming home at night, there's not much value in an air service. Now, I know in my particular area, for example, it's been replaced by services that just don't work out because you'll have to spend overnight in Sydney, for example. Now, if you have to spend overnight in Sydney, it's going to cost you something like another maybe $150 to go on your trip to Sydney, whether it be for health reasons or to visit your family. And uh, the decision that's been taken by Hazelden has resulted not in the loss in that we've been debating here in the last hour, the problems with job losses in, uh, in Australia. And of course, Hazelden's alone, because of these government imposed imposts, have uh, lost some 60 jobs uh, within their operations. And that, of course, affected in those country towns has a much bigger effect than what it has in the Brisbane's or the Sydney's or the Melbourne's, where there's a bigger proportion of people to be absorbed. And it affects all the other little mother plier that goes on as far as that and has a devastating uh, effect on the people in those country towns. Now, I've for two years, Mr Deputy President, been trying to warn the government, your government, at what cost their procrastination on mascot, mascot would be. I've been fobbed off time and time again on issues of EIS processes, reviews, reports and submissions. It's all really something that astounds me in a country like ours that we have to go through so many uh, uh, little bits of things to get a result, which will be the result that we'll need it. And I think the minister really realises he needs it, but it's going to be too late for airlines such as Sir Hazelton. And now we've had the ultimate furphy this week in the suggestions that airlines should levy $5 per surcharge on tickets to pay for the insulation of houses around the mascot area. I think really that is the biggest furphy of the world, because if anyone flies into mascot, they'll find that in the new proposal for the third runway, you don't fly over any more houses than what you fly over now. You fly over a lot of uh, buildings, which are factories, before you come to the airport. And you'll be taking off and landing, of course, over, over the bay, over water, and that's going to make it a lot better for, for the people who live in those areas. And all those warnings that I've given over the years about uh, the air, airport and the need for the third runway have fallen on deaf ears. And now it seems irrelevant because what I said would happen has, and, uh, and that I think uh, has made me feel, feel very sad. Rural New South Wales is suffering. Country towns are drying up and forced, with, forced withdrawal of services by Hazeldens, caused by the federal government's procrastinating, is just assisting this drying up process. But this is not the end of the issue. When more time permits, I intend to raise the matter again. And I will continue to raise it until either common sense prevails in the Cabinet and a third runway gets built, or we have the next election in the Labor government, along with those members around Mascot who have caused this mess, are thrown out of office. Senator Reid. Um, Mr Deputy President, I too wish to refer to the employment figures or the unemployment figures that were released today, as has been done by other senators. Um, the national figures are, I think, quite significant for many thousands of Australians. And when you refer to them in percentages, you tend to forget the number of people that are actually referred to in it. And I think partly what prompted me to speak today was the way the ABC presented the news at 12 o'clock today um, in a way that was supposed to be good news, that it's only 9.8 per cent and hasn't risen from that. To those who still have jobs, of course it's good news that they still have jobs. 
For those who don't have jobs, there is no good news in it at all, some 9.8 per cent, and that is many thousands approaching one million Australians. But it is particularly the number of young people unemployed that I think causes great, a great deal of concern. The figures in the ACT are not as high in some other places. I'm grateful for that. It is a figure of 5.8 per cent unemployed in August of this year, um, but the figure at last year was 5.2 per cent. And I think that gives, uh, no, the, that's the number of people, 5,800 unemployed is against 5,200 last year. It is still a lot of people looking for work. And the number of young people in Canberra amounting to just on 23 per cent unemployed, many of them not ever having been able to obtain employment. In Canberra, we live in an area where there is a very high retention rate of students attending school and they have done so in the belief that it will be better for them to stay to year 12 and that their pros prospects in the future will be much better. And it is, I think, doubly disillusioning for them then to find that there is no prospect of them obtaining employment. In Canberra as well, the situation is aggravated by considerable delays in getting underway building projects which in fact could be proceeded with if the ACT government got on with the job that they should be doing. And it's not only the ACT government. I refer to the federal government's attitude to the York Park project. Mr Deputy President, you'll no doubt remember that last year in the budget, the commencement of the York Park project and the funding to enable it to proceed was something that was much trumpeted as a worthwhile project and an important building project for Canberra, given that the other large projects had, had been completed. This year it was with considerable amazement that I looked at the budget papers to find that York Park wasn't even mentioned. And when I raised the matter with the minister at the Estimates Committee, he confirmed that it is not going ahead. That is a real blow for the building industry in Canberra, which, as you know, is a very significant part of the industry. It is a place where young people do get the opportunity to learn skills. As I said, in addition, there is York Park and a number of other smaller ACT projects which the ACT government has not assisted to get underway. I would ask the Minister what is happening to the um, Customs Computer Centre and the Tax Computer Centre, both of which they are not proceeding with much speed. They have both been approved by the Public Works Committee. The last time I had a look there was very little happening. They are projects that ought to be well ahead and ought to be providing jobs in Canberra. So, Without taking up undue time at this hour, I want to place on the record that 22.8 per cent youth unemployment in Canberra, when there is not much going on in the building industry, when the public service is not recruiting, is a pretty grim outlook for young people in Canberra. 5,800 looking for full-time work and 3,600 looking for part-time work. Many of them are breadwinners. Many of them are in the older category, where the prospects of getting jobs are in the ACT limited. I hope the government will take notice of these facts and that the ACT government too will move more speedily with the projects that it can assist with. Senator Lewis. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I also uh, wish to speak about the tragic unemployment uh, figures re released today for this country. You, you know, Mr Deputy President, this all arises out of the, what's left of the Labor Party socialist philosophy, which what is left is a philosophy of control, regulation, taxation, uh, the taking away of initiative, the destruction of initiative and enterprise. And uh, that arose when this government was in opposition when in February 1983 it adopted the accord between the Australian Labor Party and the Australian Council of Trade Unions regarding economic policy. That, uh, that document, I said at the time, would prove to be a tragedy for this country, and that's the way it has proven to be, because it's, 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 it's the following through of that document, that agreement with the ACTU, 
that has led to the tragic unemployment figures that we see here today. I do not deny that back in 1982 the unemployment figures were extraordinarily high, the percentages probably as high as they are at the present moment. I don't deny that, but there was a clear reason for that. There had been a massive breakout in wages uh, during uh, the last 18 months or two years of the Fraser government's term in office. And I say to you, Mr Deputy President, in fact I accuse certain members of the Australian Labor Party, including then Senator Don Grimes, who admitted it in effect in this chamber, and other members of the Australian Labor Party who were urging people in the ACTU and various trade union movements to carry out a war of attrition against the Fraser government, uh, claiming wage increases and going out on strike at, for no reason whatsoever other than the ultimate objective of getting the Australian Labor Party into office. And the result of that tragedy was, which, as I say, was pushed by various members uh, of the Australian Labor Party, who then became ministers in government, to think that they set about the destruction of the economy of this country was a disgrace, and, uh, and they pushed that situation until ultimately the unemployment figures were as they were and the strike rate was as it was and uh, in due course the people chose the Hawke government. Now, what then happened was that uh, the strike rate immediately fell uh, enormously, of course, in accordance with the prior arrangements. But also there were a number of other factors which had affected the Fraser government. There was a world recession, which shortly after Mr Hawke came to office broke, and there was an Australian-wide drought, the like of which we hadn't seen for over a hundred years, which, because it extended so wide around Australia. And, uh, and shortly after Mr Hawke came into office, that drought broke. So that the uh, the wages breakout was now uh, the, the unions had achieved their object. They'd got rid of the Fraser government. They had achieved their enormous wages increases, so there was no need for further wage increases applicable. And what had happened is, in the last year of his office, Mr. Fraser introduced a wage freeze. And the benefit of that wage freeze flowed through into 1984 and created an excellent situation for the, the economic recovery of this country. And that's a short history of, why, of how it was that in 1984-1985 unemployment fell enormously. Nothing to do with any of the uh, policies introduced by the Hawke government, uh, but as a result of the factors which I've mentioned, the Fraser wage freeze, the world recovery from the uh, uh, recession, worldwide recession, the breaking of the drought, and, uh, and the, uh, the uh, fact that uh, the monies were flowing through from the wage freeze into the business economy. Now, at the time, the Australia, or just prior to that election, the Australian Labor Party had entered into this accord. And let me just draw your attention on the first page of the accord document. It says the party's prime objective is full employment. So in February 1983, the Labor Party and the ACTU entered into an agreement. The prime objective of was full employment. And what do we have in 1991? 10% unemployed, practically. In fact, uh, if you look at uh, the figures uh, of those who are really seeking to get work, probably much, much higher than that. About a million people unemployed. And the prime objective, eight years ago and after eight years in government in office, this sort of massive unemployment, when these people set down an agreement to achieve uh, the objective was full employment. Clearly, the accord and those philosophies have failed—failed failed miserably. 
Though that agreement talks about interventionist policies, criticises the Fraser government for its policies, talks about interventionist policies. And yet uh, this document has clearly failed. And what happened during 1986-87, and Mr Hawke confessed it the other day, was that the government tried to uh, do something about the unemployment situation by pump priming. And Mr Hawke made the comment something along the lines of uh, that what we did was we borrowed our way out of our difficulties. And uh, of course, Mr Kerrin has now acknowledged that it is necessary for there, be, for there to be a deregulation of the uh, wage fixing structure. And even Mr Hawke has finally confessed the failure of the accord by his statement at the ACTU Congress yesterday, in which he said that, and I quote, or this I'm quoting from the Australian report of it. Um, in the move to a more flexible wages system, it was essential to safeguard workers unable to take part in enterprise bargaining immediately. And what Mr Hawke was now putting to the ACTU was that there would be an across-the-board wage rise. After all the disaster of the across-the-board wage rises that have occurred under this government, Mr Hawke is now back to the situation where he's saying there will be another across the board wage rise and then in addition there will be some sort of flexible bargaining system over and above the, uh, uh, the general wage rise. So there will be some flexible bargaining system. That is not what we are interested in, Senator Sherry, not what we are talking about at all because Senator what Mr Sherry, Hawke is talking problem, about is some sort of flexible bargaining system between the unions and the employers. We are talking about flexible bargaining system between employees at the workplace and their employers. The sort of thing that's worked with the SBC, not the sort of nonsense that you people go on with. But let me say this to you. This is the thing which I find absolutely appalling. Mr Hawke went on, and he's quoted in the newspaper, so one can presume that these were the precise words he used. But one thing is clear now. We cannot and will not allow the living standards of one section of the community to fall while others rise. I'll say it again. I mean, it's, it's like back to when he said, no child will live in poverty. This is a nonsense. Here we have 10 per cent unemployment. What is happening to the living standard of the 2,000 people who lost their jobs in the last month? What has happened to their living standard? Clearly their living standard's fallen. Here is the Prime Minister of Australia saying, we will not allow the living standards of one section of the community to fall while others rise. We will give another wage rise to those who are in employment. I mean, it is a nonsense. Here he is saying, you fewer and fewer people who are left in full-time employment, you can have a wage rise. And that will be across the board. Every one of you who remain in employment, even though it's a few smaller group, you will get an across the board wage rise because we're not going to let one section of you who are in employment get less than the other section of you who are in employment. Forget the unemployed. No regard for productivity. No regard for, productivity, no regard for the unemployed of Australia. The million people who are unemployed are to be totally ignored, totally ignored, because of this foolish statement by this Prime Minister, confronted with his part with the ACTU, confronted with the body that he was associated with when they were trying to destroy the Fraser government. He went on to say the government would not, and I quote from the newspaper, quote, allow people to fall away and behind and have standards lowered because of their industrial weakness. What, what industrial strengths do the unemployed have? How can they go on strike? How can they demand some wage rise? Mr Deputy President, I find that this is one of the most extraordinary statements I have read 
by this Prime Minister, and he has made some extraordinary statements over his uh, period in office and uh, when he was president of the ACTU. To think he, he, all he is doing when he is talking to the ACTU is saying to them, we will protect those of you who remain in employment. That's what we'll look after. We will make sure that if you have a job, your wages will not fall in real, level, in real levels at all. We will maintain the standard of your wages so long as you've got a job. The fact that his policies are continuing uh, to maintain an unemployment rate of uh, about 10 per cent for the next 12 months or so is, of course, just completely ignored. What chance have these people got of getting back into work? I was told recently of a, a young lass who graduated uh, from an institution with uh, qualification in, uh, in uh, interior decoration. And as I understand it, there were 400 people around Australia who graduated with a similar qualification last year, and there were five jobs available for those 400 young people. Five jobs in that particular sort of uh, work. And that's the sort of nonsense that this government is going on, on with. Under its educational policy system, it's pushing people into doing courses at institutions. When, when, when they graduate in those courses, the poor kids discover that there are no jobs available. They've spent four years of their lives uh, trying to get a qualification, uh, and, and there are no jobs in that industry when they qualify. And what this government desperately needs to do is to address its mind to the unemployment problems of the nation and find some reasonable solution to those problems. Senator McMillan. Uh, Mr Deputy President, I wasn't sure whether I'd uh, respond to this uh, uh, manufactured display of concern uh, around the opposition benches, but uh, Senator Lewis, uh, for two reasons, has uh, persuaded me to do so. One was the very gracious thing he said about me yesterday for doing so, and the other was the speech he made yesterday, so today, with which I entirely disagree. The thing which some of the uh, opposition senators have said, uh, with which I do agree, is that uh, one person unemployed is one too many. Those people who spoke about the uh, concern that, irrespective of the rate of unemployment for those individuals who are unemployed, they are 100 per cent unemployed. That's not exactly an original line. I think it goes back to Harold Wilson in 1964 or 1963, but is nonetheless accurate for being somewhat antiquated. And it is uh, a matter that we all need to remember, even when we have much better unemployment figures, uh, as we did uh, as the, in the years in which the government's economic policy was uh, uh, the undoubted success that it was for the first uh, six and a half to seven years when the one, one and a half million jobs were created and unemployment fell substantially, it didn't make the pain any the less for the individuals who were unemployed. But it is a little difficult to sit quietly and hear people come in one after the other and express uh, attitudes of outrage that uh, we have uh, a, a high rate of unemployment when they also sit calmly behind a leader and an opposition that advocates policies that would destroy jobs and cut the benefits to the unemployed. It is the same uh, concern that uh, annoys one when you hear people come in from time to time, say the government needs to tighten its fiscal policy, cut government spending, but they also come in and seek increased expenditure in various areas of activity, as we've heard on several occasions today. Now, you can't have it both ways. We really do have here the... Oh. That we shouldn't give any help to the drought-affected No, I'm talking about somebody else's contribution, actually, but yours is also accurate. You, you, if you want to admit that some expenditure increases are justified and some of the others to which I'm alluding were also justified proposals, you can't reduce the total level of expenditure and increase every bit of it. We have... The, uh, the circumstance of the old Conservative policy of solving unemployment by getting rid of jobs, of solving the inflation problem by jacking up prices and improving workers' living standards by cutting their wages. Now, you can't have all those things. That is exactly what we've had. We've got the GST to put up prices. We've got the, the cutting of $4.7 billion from outlays, which will cost 46,000 jobs and we have got the continuing concern that the 7.5 million people who are in employment might get an increase in wages. I think 
The trends for the recovery are apparent. They are all too painfully slow for those individuals who are unemployed, and the human concern that's been expressed is shared by everybody. But as we find the increase in jobs reflected in this, in this month's figures, the improvements in housing, the improvements in business expectations, the improvement in retail sales, there isn't any doubt that the signs of the recovery are on the wall. It, 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 we all wish it would come more quickly, but what we need now are not policies to cut government spending by $4.7 billion and abolish 46,000 jobs, not introducing the GST to put up prices, not an attack on the wages system, but policies to sustain and maintain that recovery which is underway. I don't wish to conclude, however, without acknowledging the validity of the, uh, the, the somewhat separate point raised by Senator Brownhill. I don't agree with his views on that, but I respect the, uh, the uh, consistency with which he has advocated that position. Uh, I won't need, I'm sure, to draw it to the minister's attention. I'm sure he'll be well aware of it, but nevertheless I acknowledge that he has made that point on a continuing basis. But I, I couldn't allow uh, that series of uh, speeches that, so, that fly directly in the face of the positions that it's uh, that those advocating it uh, express in their policies to go unremarked. The question is that the Senate do now adjourn. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order the Senate stands adjourned until Tuesday, the 8th of October, 1991, at 2 p.m. <laughs>